Welcome, benvenuti alla Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimò della New York University. Siamo molto felici di avervi qua con noi per questi tre giorni dedicati alla poesia contemporanea, alla poesia che voi scrivete, che voi leggete, che voi studiate. E eh, forse saprete che l'idea di questo convegno nasce da un altro convegno che si svolse 33 anni fa, in questo stesso posto, con la stessa direzione di Luigi Ballerini, ed era stata la nostra idea chiave per le celebrazioni del nostro trentesimo anniversario di fondazione della Casa Italiana. Poi c'è stato in mezzo il Covid e tutto il resto, le regole di noi inflessibili, e come sapete bene questo fagiano che doveva riapparire ha fatto in tempo a fare tre o quattro volte il giro del globo. E l'idea era stata quella di eh, chiedere a Luigi, che nel frattempo era andato in pensione da UCLA, di rimettere in piedi una kermesse come quella importantissima, straordinaria, uh, The Disappearing Pheasant. E come sapete non si può fare il regalo migliore a un milanese che metterlo a lavorare, <ride> e Luigi in particolare. E lui a sua volta, essendo milanese, mette a lavorare il mondo. E questa è veramente per me un'occasione per uh, ringraziarlo per la sua generosità intellettuale, per la passione che mette nelle cose che fa, per il suo ruolo di intellettuale pubblico, che sta diventando sempre più unico, ma non dovrebbe, e per essere un vero maestro. Luigi è stato il primo direttore, e quando lo vedo lo chiamo sempre il mio venerato predecessore, come fanno i papi. Un po' gli piace. Però è stato, veramente, è stato ed è un maestro perché non è mai da solo in quello che fa. E anche in questa iniziativa è riuscito a coinvolgere non solo tutti voi, ma anche un gruppo di studiosi più giovani, eh, dalle traduzioni alla bibliografia alle altre iniziative, veramente crea un team attorno a sé, per cui c'è la solitudine del poeta e dello studioso che crea da solo nel suo studio e poi c'è la dimensione corale che lui alimenta col suo talento di maestro. Voi mi permetterete di dire che questo convegno è anche una celebrazione della carriera straordinaria del talento di Luigi Ballerini, a cui vi chiedo di rivolgere un applauso. Perché la poesia? Eh, ci sarà una domanda credo, alla quale cercheremo anche di rispondere in questo periodo, però direi che nei momenti in cui sembra che le, le altre occupazioni mondane più pratiche prevalgano su di tutto, la poesia fa avvertire un bisogno di sé e voi state anche rispondendo a questo bisogno. E la cosa più importante direi è riconoscere e rivedere la potenza della parola. Voi usate un'arma un potente che è la parola, ci giocate, la modificate, la tirate e alla fine risulta comunque questo grande potere della parola. Io non voglio fare nessuna conclusione perché sono molto molto curioso di ascoltarvi, di ascoltare il dialogo che avrete tra di voi. Um, come vi dicevo Luigi poi vi spiegherà anche meglio alcune delle cose che si sono fatte a contorno, ma vi assicuro che questi non sono tre giorni e basta. Sono stati preceduti da due lezioni bellissime di Luigi che sono disponibili sul nostro canale della Casa Italiana, come due introduzioni sulla poesia contemporanea. Um, C'è stato un corso graduate che Luigi ha tenuto qua per un gruppo di nostri studenti di dottorato. Siamo nel, si può dire, nel, nel progest, progetto di realizzare questa Wunderkammer della poesia contemporanea con un gruppo brillante di eh, professionisti di Pisa, eh, ovviamente anche quello sotto la supervisione di Luigi, che stanno creando questo spazio, eh, che sarà uno spazio online ovviamente, che ricostruirà come una specie di casa, di palazzo della poesia contemporanea. Quello che abbiamo visto finora è straordinario sia dal punto di vista della grafica, dell'animazione, della varietà eh, delle fonti che sono state incorporate per creare questa panoramica. Per cui non è ancora tutto pronto e finito, ci si sta lavorando, ma anche quello rimarrà. È stata preparata una bibliografia monumentale da Federica, dove la vedo, ecco, grazie mille, sulla poesia contemporanea, anche quello sotto la supervisione di Luigi, ma Federica ha fatto veramente un lavoro grandioso e qualunque studioso in futuro si occuperà di poesia contemporanea, avrà questa risorsa già preparata, ordinata e fatta con grande intelligenza e precisione. Per cui non è soltanto il fagiano che riappare per tre giorni, ma riapparendo per tre giorni questo fagiano ha creato un gran scompiglio, eh? sia prima che dopo. Io vi auguro buon lavoro qui, oggi, domani all'istituto, poi ci, si ritorna qui, si farà un giro per andare a vedere i poeti della Big Generation. È un programma molto ricco, l'abbiamo pensato con grande 
passione per farvi star bene, per farvi godere anche questi tre giorni in cui sarete qua con noi a New York. Ancora benvenuti e per favore date un applauso di accoglienza al professor Luigi Ballerini. Eh sì, I'm afraid it's going to be downhill from here. You don't get an introduction like that every day, you know, just... Uh... Dear all, cari tutti, as I was saying 20 years ago, announced Gaetano Salvemini re resuming his course on Machiavelli, which he had interrupted in 1925, when given the fascist perspective on Italian history imposed by the regime, he had resigned from teaching at the University of Florence. He had so many people listening to him that they had to put loudspeakers in Piazza San Marco, and he picked up exactly where he had left 20 years before. And he said, as I was saying 20 years ago, and he continued with his lecture. Now, si parva licet componere manis, of course, if it is allowable to compare small things with great ones, Virgil. 32 years ago, upon leaving NYU, for UCLA, I had hoped the pheasant would come back to the Casa Italiana where it had first disappeared in the fall of 1990. The founder of the Casa, Baronessa Mariuccia Zerilli Marimo, and I, whom she kindly referred to as my first, though unofficial, director, greeted on that occasion and for two days listened to poets and critics who have in the meantime become legendary. Elio Pagliarani, Amelia Rosselli. I remember that Stefan at one point found a photograph of Amelia Rosselli in the garden of the casa and said, I know this place. And he was right there. And uh, Giancarlo Maiorino, Paolo Volponi, Filippo Bettini. And I'm glad that Filippo is unfortunately gone, but we have his hair, uh, uh, Professor Cecilia Bello, who was a student and now a colleague of uh, Bettini with us. And of course we had um, Gianni Sassi, the great designer, Barbara Guest, Jerome Rothenberg, together with Charles Bernstein, who's also here today, Bruce Andrews, Rebecca West, not to speak of Marjorie Perloff, who was of course younger and just as legendary then as she is today. I cannot think of a kinder, more devoted, and more qualified person to open our conference, which you will do in a little while. A great and generous friend. Once hidden in the brush, pheasants don't reappear easily. Our own, in particular, would not have agreed to come back without the invitation and uh, the perseverance of Dr. Stefano Albertini, who assured me of his support and actually came through with it. <laughs> That's a very strange Italian situation, you know. <laughs> and a long way that, thanks to COVID-19, has turned out to be very long indeed. Many people contributed substantially to its return. Their names are listed in the program. Chiara Basso, Nick Benson, Beppe Cavatorta, Sandro De Tomasis, Costia Costic, Yuri Moscardi, Federica Parodi, Gianluca Rizzo, Federica Santini. I have leaned heavily on each of them. They graciously responded to my frequent request for help and never wavered in their enthusiasm, even when my request transcended by much the calls of duty. You know, calling 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, so on. A very special debt of gratitude we all, and I in particular, owe Julian Sachs, program and media coordinator of the CASA, the wizard of online technology, a most subtle translator of Pavese, among others, and frequent consoler of my afflictions. He offered his expertise 
to both in-house and extramural sections of the pheasant's reappearance. I also want to mention Mila Tenaglia, who joined us too late to be in the program, written program, and of which, anyhow, she has been a fully and reliable member. Fong Bui, publisher of the Brooklyn Rail, and Charlie Schultz, his managing editor, have publicized the reappearing fashion in the April and November issue of their essential publication, The Brooklyn Rail, which, by the way, you can take a copy of it there on the table upstairs in the lobby. To both of them, I will uh, express my heartfelt thank you. The list of friends who put their shoulder to the wheel would not be complete without the name of and a world in the world of thanks for Charles Bernstein, from whose generous advice I largely profited during the now well seasoned friendship since the years of language with a double distinction in between the vowels and the syllable and, and, and the letters. And Giovanni Bonoldi of Associazione di Poesia, a more recent but equally affectionate and productive acquaintance who has galvanized a number of Italian cultural institutions and arranged for the coverage of our activities. Casa della Poesia Milano, Biblioteca Pagliarani Roma, Radio Popolare, etc., etc. In perfect disharmony with my own disappearance in the fall of 1990, when I expect, unexpectedly left NYU for the distant, but certainly for me at the time, much more welcoming shores of UCLA, but in perfect harmony with the ominous implication of its own moniker, the disappearing pheasant left no trace, except for a gorgeous poster created by the irreplaceable poetry producer and insuperable designer Gianni Sassi, and a few photographs, including the one that Stefano found for Amelia Rosselli. Actually, there may be a tape of the keynote address delivered by Professor Luciano Anceschi from RAI TV Studios in Bologna. It was very funny because the voice came through clearly, but we could not see his face because he kept the sheets from which he was reading <laughs> so close to his eyes. And it was very funny because the man in the uh, uh, regia kept signaling people in Bologna asking Luciano to move away from the ship, but he never, he never cooperated on that one. <laughs> well, this silence, I do not expect to be the case after the reappearing of the pheasant. Barbara Anceschi and Alessandro Giammai will devote to our proceeding an issue of Il Verri, lots of translations in sight, beware, while Yuri Moscardi and others will procure an English and not necessarily mirror-like ed edition of the same. The volume will be published under the auspices of Casa Italiana by Agincourt Press, whose editors, Beppe Cavatorda, Gianluca Rizzo, and Federica Santini, have shared for quite some time the surprises and the inconvenience of my difficult but ultimately pleasurable editorial life. I take this opportunity to also recognize my debt of gratitude to Agincourt's president, Mr. Berardo Paradiso, whose friendship is for me a source of continuous delight, is also here with us, and whose generosity and farsightedness is well known to all those who have attempted to sustain and spread Italian language and culture in the United States. Two more items um, will give the reappeared pheasant a long and healthy life. Maria Grazia Calandrone will collect the fruit of our readings, lectures, debates, and produce a mini series, audio series for RAI 3. Under the aegis of uh, Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimon, Fabrizio Bondi, and Valerio Lobello of Net7, as Stefano was announcing before, we produce an interactive wonder camera of Italian poetry of the Secondo Novecento. Fabrizio will tell us more about this project later this afternoon, so I'll skip it. It started out as a genealogical tree, then it became the Casa della Poesia, then it became the Wunderkammer, and now it's going to be a Wunderkammer. I hope that these three days of proximity and hopefully interaction might become the beginning 
of a long friendship, as Humphrey Bogart, as is well known, wishes for himself and Captain Louis Renault in the last scene of Casablanca. <laughs> Actually, the friendship and the work that one needs to go with it has already begun. Nuova Poesia Americana, edited by myself and Gianluca Rizzo and others, a series of volumes mapping the United States after the poetry of the Beat Generation is appearing in bilingual editions in Italy with Nino Aragno Editore after Mondadori unfortunately dropped the project. But as I said, Nino Aragno picked it up. The volume of uh, Chicago and the Prairie Towns is already out there. And we are now approaching the end of Los Angeles and the Far West. Then we'll continue with San Francisco and the Bay Area, New York. Then we'll have Washington, North and South. And then finally, uh, something like uh, Oklahoma City. It says, why Oklahoma City? Um, well, actually, I'm sorry, Kansas City. Well, I tell you why Kansas City. Because Kansas City was the most famous town in Italy after the war. And Alberto Sordi, in a very well-known film called Un Americano a Roma, wanted to be an American. He was driving a Harley Davidson, wearing a Davy Crockett hat in Rome. And finally, when uh, he became very well-known, the mayor of Kansas City offered him an honorary key to the city. But a friend of mine, who is unfortunately in the fourth dimension right now, once was driving his Lambretta in Rome. And uh, he had a very special license plate called EE, Escursionisti Esteri. A Roman driver comes up to him, also driving a Lambretta, looks at him and says, Americano. And Larry says, yes, Kansas City. <laughs> now, Larry is from Kansas City. And for years, he said, how could he possibly know? Until I met him, I said, look, just go see this movie and you'll understand, you know. Just the... Then we also have those from, from afar look like flies, an anthology, of two, a two-volume anthology. The first one is published by the University of Toronto Press. The second one is nearing completion. We've been saying that for the last 15 years. But it's, you know, a major work of 2,500 pages, bilingual poetry, essays, biographies, no acknowledgments, etc., etc., and uh, so that will also presumably give us an idea of what has happened in uh, poetry in Italy in the last uh, 60 years or so. Naturally, uh, not all poets will be included because we have a tendency to be ecumenical but biased, and. <laughs> It's very difficult to be both, but we managed. We said, we include all those who in a variety of different ways go for poetry, work for poetry. They understand that poetry is made of language, and we exclude those who understand lyricism as confessionalism. It's as simple as that. If your pain and strong emotions don't bend the language, you're not in the anthology. To all those who have this morning crossed for the first time the threshold of Casa Italiana, and to all those who have done so many times before, poets, critics, readers, well, let me say, don't be shy. What is becoming rare and derelict sometimes in the groves of academia is growing fast, even dangerously fast, outside of it. Now, the Casa Italiana is a very special place because it's both in and out. And hopefully, poetry will grow fast, not dangerously, in this abode. Let us continue. Thank you very much again for your love and courage, as my friend Fong Boy would say. Buon lavoro. Grazie. Yes. Thank you. And now we come to Marjorie Perloff from Los Angeles. Marjorie, good morning. I know it's a pretty early morning for you, and thank you so much for being so generous as usual. Now, I will not say much about Marjorie Perloff because most of us know 
who she is, as I said before, she's, she has been legendary for a long, long time. And, uh, but I do have to say one thing, that uh, I have rarely met someone with the competence uh, of Marjorie Perloff who also taught how to read poetry. Her book, Differentials, was to me a complete revelation because, in fact, you can make sense by looking at the poem and paying attention to the book, to the word that she calls on the page and also those off the page. Now, she has worked in a number of uh, different directions. Most recently, she has produced a jewel, that is to say, the translation into English for the first time of Wittgenstein's notebooks. I have de devoured that book, gave you a, an incredible perspective on one of the greatest philosophers of, of the 20th century. And also I would like to recommend, if you have a chance, and if you haven't read, so read it already, her biography called The Vienna Paradox, which should be translated into Italian. If anyone is interested, we know where to go for looking for translators. And uh, after this, I think I will leave the microphone to uh, Marjorie, and I understand that there will be some readings uh, of texts. So uh, she will read those texts in English, and I will do so whenever the case in Italian. Am I correct? I hope yeah. I am. Okay. A great welcome to Marjorie Perlo. Thank you. Thank you. Can everybody hear? I, I feel badly I can't see anybody since you're not on, on Zoom. Um, I can see Luigi, but no one else. But anyway, I'm very happy to be here, and I certainly wish I were there in person uh, so we could all chat afterwards and I could be with you, but <clears throat> not possible at the moment. Um, <clears throat> but um, it's a wonderful opportunity to come back to the reappearing pheasant. Okay, uh, we're going to go share screen. Um, yeah, is it on? Let's see. Okay. And sharing screen. Yeah, everybody can see. The screen? Good. I'm going to begin, and I'm going to read this in English, although he's here, Marco Gio Giovanale, but this one is, it's a prose poem, I don't, and I think it can be read in English, too. Um, wait a minute. I'm back. Yeah. And this is a piece called They Were in Danger. Um, well, you'll see. But Marco Giovanale, let me start with that. Nearly everyone by now goes through a nose job. Nearly everyone speaks when the argument is hot. Nearly everyone takes up residence abroad. Nearly everyone becomes poor again. Nearly all the rich are at rock bottom. Nearly all the poor wage war among the poor. Nearly all the sick are dying. But nearly all the nearly dead sometimes come back to life. Nearly all the poised assholes they fall miserably or do not fall not miserably. Nearly all the common denominators divide in the thick of it, a wisdom of sorts. Nearly all the dividends had vanished from the balance sheet way before then. Nearly everyone in principle. Nearly everything had happened way before then. Nearly everything was already finished when you arrived. Nearly everything in principle. Nearly everyone notices one thing. Nearly everyone challenges it even before opening it up for discussion. At this point, nearly everyone shows a preference for Africa. Nearly everyone has their luggage ready at hand. Nearly everyone prefers to ship it. Nearly everyone nourishes some mistrust. Nearly everyone is depressed. And nearly everyone is an enemy of nearly everyone else. Nearly everyone has an enemy at home. You know nearly all of them. Nearly everyone was here when you arrived. Nearly everyone emphasizes difference. Nearly everyone finds it hard to obtain a mortgage. Nearly everyone gets it. Nearly everyone is a criminal. Nearly everyone is a war criminal. 
Nearly everyone has decided. Nearly everyone has reached a decisive decision. Nearly everyone keeps their word. Nearly everyone, no, but nearly everyone can sense it. Nearly everyone is distracted. Nearly everyone does not see the difference. Nearly everyone, on the contrary, sees it. Nearly everyone is like this. Nearly everyone is at random. Nearly everyone is caught up in sociology. Nearly everyone has their schedule. Nearly everyone salutes with their right hand. Nearly everyone thinks of pulling it off. Nearly everyone needs to have some word repeated to them. Not everyone, nearly everyone. Nearly everyone. It is the discourse whispered in our ears every day by the social media, the absurd level of generation that the TikTok crowd recognizes and believes in. Hearing the, that authoritative, nearly everyone, we are terrified of being out of step. If nearly everyone salutes with his right hand, I'm safe, aren't I, as long as I do that. Nothing different about me. And in any case, nearly everyone is a criminal. So why worry? We all recognize the absurdity, but also the familiarity of these Gertrude Steinian repetitions and variations, perhaps produced by the Google grinder, as Giovanale calls it. Algorithms and statistics rule our day, never mind how they've been manufactured or arrived at. And that in that wonderful punchline at the end, the speaker protects himself with the disclaimer, not everyone. What a great way of covering our tracks, of making sure we cannot be accused of anything. And in a special irony, nearly everyone emphasizes difference, which is to say they, we are in fact exactly alike, doing the same thing, and terrified that they will somehow be excluded from the pack. Yes, as the title tells us, they were in danger. And this, this poem seems to be so applicable right now when we've just had the election. And when you hear all the discussions of who won and why and why not, and you get this kind of nearly everyone note, it, it could not be more apropos. Okay, if this poem brings to mind a comparable American poem, it might well, well be won by Charles Bernstein. For example, Errata in Topsy Turvy. Charles, would you like to read that? Sure. Okay. Right on the screen so you can see it. I hope. For red, read, I should not have done it. Should have left it alone. I don't know what came over me or why. I could not try as I might overcome it. For oceanic, read, leeward, as when the ball dribbles its way to the center of the earth and the heart barely hears its own beat but never fails to heed yours. For lard, read, a studied casualness that disguises genuine casualness. For incandescent, read, drowned in love's opposite fortunes, leering at gashes in the gust of a fragrance. For crustacean, read, crustacean. For you be my gracious refuge now, song. Read, why do you rouse my soul and stir up the past? Be merciful, desist, desist. Let the embers of my joy be. For demonic dispossession, read, season of mist and mellow fruitfulness. Thank you, Charles. I, I, I hope the Italians also recognize, and I think the Americans, but that the last season of mist and mellow fruitfulness is the opening line of Keats's Ode to Autumn. So that wonderful things in here. At the back of both these poems, as of Tommaso Ottonieri and Alexandro Brogi, we can always hear the winged chariot, to quote Marvell, Andrew Marvell, of the social media where input is likely to produce the most bizarre output, as I discovered the other day when I found on Facebook the imperative stand tall and realized from the context that the reference was one to my favorite novelist, Stendhal. But you know, when you read about 
That's how it came out. I couldn't figure out what they were talking about. It said stand tall. And it was some kind of discussion. And then I just realized you just sounded out at stand tall. And that happens, of course, in the internet all the time. Giovanale and Bernstein in the age of the internet, I think this symposium will show, our two poetries, Italian and American, have come closer together. They even overlap. And we will see that, I think, and of course, that they're now very symbiotic. But it was not always thus. In 1991, some 30 years ago, when Luigi Ballerini organized the Disappearing Pheasant, you said 20, but it's really 30, right? <laughs> yeah, I hate to tell you, it's 30. The two poetries were in a very different place. In Italy, the personal lyrics still predominated, although there were poets like Biagio Cepalario and Miligrafi who were experimenting with street slang, dialect, and especially the vernacular. In the, in the US, it was the moment of language poetry, at least in the case of the poets Luigi invited, Bruce Andrews, Charles Bernstein, Lynn Higinian, and from the earlier generation, Barbara Guest, who was still alive, Jackson McClough, and Jerome Rothenberg. Among the Americans and their students in the audience, Marx's theory, central to the first phase of language poetry, was very much in evidence. And because Marxism was one of the differentiae between language poetry and its enemy, official verse culture, as Charles calls it, made up, so it was felt of, the enemy was felt of countless trivial lyric epiphanies, the American contingent was perhaps sub subconsciously a bit condescending to the Italians, implying that the latter were quite hip enough or theoretical enough to know that the love sonnet or meditative nature poet poem was passe. But then something remarkable happened. The second morning, Tom Harrison, then at Penn, now at UCLA, stood up and gave a stinging rebuke to the U.S. team. Don't lecture us about Marxism, I recall Tom telling the group. We know all about Marxism long before you people even started writing poetry. And of course, that was true. In the decades after World War II, in the days of Euro-communism strong in Italy, the left set the literary tone. To be an intellectual or artist was almost ipso facto in Italy to be on the left. Poets may not have cited Derrida or Althusser, but they read Gramsci and more important Marx himself. So when Tom, himself the son of an American father, an Italian mother, and brought up in Rome before he came to study at Sarah Lawrence, and CUNY made his little speech, a hush fell over the audience that was never quite resolved. The accused poets felt alternately guilty and angry at being called naive. And accordingly, there wasn't very much exchange between the two parties. In 2022, the situation is very different. In the US, the current stress on racial as well as gender identity has displaced the strong case made by the language writers for a poetry in which, to quote Charles Bernstein, there is no natural look or sound to a poem. Every element is intended, chosen. The situation is now much more eclectic and fluid. Subject matter has come to dominate in ways we haven't seen since the 1930s, when much poetry, now largely forgotten, was a versified political statement and manifesto. And the calling into question of universal truth and the transcendental ego that characterized the age of theory has been replaced in popular poetry by often vitriolic discourse about discrimination and oppression, as if to say, yes, we do have the answers. We do know the truth, or at least we should. When poetry as poetry is defended today, it is often as a kind of at a kind of greeting card level. Poetry, generically speaking, is good for you, rather like a therapy or yoga. Indeed, poetry in a formulation already put forward in the Victorian age by Matthew Arnold is what has replaced religion. And you remember Matthew Arnold called it spilt, called poetry spilt religion. Recently, a book came across my desk published by our most, one of our most distinguished presses, Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, called The Wonder Paradox, embracing the weirdness of existence and the poetry of our lives. This just I just got this a few weeks ago, two weeks ago or so, by Jennifer Michael Hecht. Poetry, writes Hecht, may well be the best art to organize our hearts in the absence of religion because of its shared traits with prayer and meditation. 
It slots right into established habits. It's the right kiss of awakening, our sleeping beauty, because poetry is, and then she makes this list, language so it can relate a message or story, free to break rules and not make sense, clear sense, short, I love short. If you're gonna print poetry and get people to read it, it better be short. Short, so we can have a moment's encounter with it over and over. Metrical, a trance-inducing percussion instrument. Deep, made with creative intensity, expected to reward rereading. Intimate, a whispered secret. Common at celebrations. That seems to be a kind of contradiction. If it's so intimate, how can it be common at celebrations? Mem memorable due to rhyme, meter, and form. And what I like in that formulation is rhyme, meter, and form as if those aren't form. I don't know what form is then, but anyway, something. And finally, sublime. We call any work of art a poem to say it is perfect, balanced, and true. And there's a 300-page book that then goes through that and tries to convince people that they could really like poetry. And I cite this because it's always been one of my bugbears that, you know, poetry, and Michelle Obama said um, a couple of years ago, you know, she was in the White House, I used to write poetry. So there's the notion that poetry is something you do when you're a teenager, get over it, become an engineer, do something useful. I used to write poetry. And that I think is very much the popular view in many ways today. Uh, and therefore it is something that the poets we have with us today attack and very rightly so, because it needs to be counted, and Luigi already brought this up about confessional poetry. Now take Mariano Baino's scraps, Vrenzole, cleverly translated by Luigi Bonafini, which opens with the stanza. Can you read it, Luigi? Yes. Uh, there we go. Well, you should read it himself, but... Uh, Is he here? Best. Yes, I'll do my best. Usable nguacchiata, grigge, giorno, velini e paesi sotto, falso, lettore mio, suoci a me, frate mio, velinia, che fa filocio, d'ogni porta bannera. Thank you. In English, usable, greasy, gray days, egg white in which to drown my hypocrite reader, my brother, egg white that scrambles, every standard bearer. Now the playfulness of Baina's scraps with its witty allusions and appropriations reminds me of our New York school, especially such Frank O'Hara poems as Naphtha, I am ashamed of my century, but I have to smile, or is it dirty? The usable greasy gray days in which the scene occurs and the English nicely conveys the alliteration and assonance of the original sets the stage for the poet's perception that he is drowning in egg white, a wonderfully absurd idea, since raw egg white is a sticky substance that allows no easy passage through its whitish jelly. The address to my hypocrite reader, my brother, comes, of course, from Baudelaire's Fleur du Mal, hypocrite lecteur, mon semblable, mon frère, but Bino does not dwell on that apostrophe, his bitterly ironic intent, moving on instead to the notion of the egg white scrambling so as to destroy every standard bearer, the guardian of the flag or keeper of the flame. And further, the reference to drowning recalls another poet who cites Baudelaire's famous hypocrite line, namely the T.S. Eliot of the Wasteland. Then too, the phrase egg white in which to drown recalls another Eliot poem, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, whose famous last line is, till the human voices wake us and we drown. Indeed, Scraps delineates a kind of wasteland, though a comic one. It's elusive, carefully constructed surface, full of references to such things as being jaundiced like other parrots. But the most intriguing device in the quoted stanza above is the colon in line two that precedes egg white, bilinia. In standard prose, colons follow clauses or phrases. They throw the meaning forward to the next section. But here the colon is oddly used at the beginning of a new phrase where it serves to announce the making of the omelet that complicates the relation to, of my brother to the egg white that scrambles. Indeed, the language throughout Bina's poem is one of self-deprecating humor and studied colloquialism. As O'Hara put it in his pseudo manifesto, personism, you just go on your nerve, a prescription that sounds easy, 
but it's really very hard work. For a poet like Pino, the eye is no longer subject, but an object along with other objects, something to be dissected from an external perspective as the ego dissolves. Much of our own recent poetry is built on the same premise. The romantic lyric openly opposed in the US by poets from John Ashbery to the language and conceptual poems, poets has made a surprising comeback, but a comeback with a difference. Craig Dworkin puts it dif the that difference very well in his essay, The Fate of Echo. And he says, despite the genuinely contrarian and oppositional stance of contemporary uncreative writing and its open rejection of some of the fundamental characteristics of poetry, the resulting texts frequently evince far more conservative and traditional poetic values than most of what passes for mainstream poetry. The formalist artifice of measure and rhyme, if not in the form of received metrics and pattern end rhymes, classical rhetorical tropes of anaphora, apostrophe, and irony, the evidentiary disclosure of the writer's most private activities, if not in the melodramatic style of the psychological confession, and more than a few passages of unexpectedly, heartbreakingly raw emotion, undiluted by even a trace of sentiment. In addition, if these poems are not referential in the sense of any conventionally realistic diegesis, they point more directly to the archival record of popular culture and colloquial speech than any avant pop pop boiler or Wordsworthian ballad ever dreamed. And that's a very good way of putting it, I think. Now, consider in this regard the use of anaphora and appropriation in the lyric of Peter Gizzi. The remarkable poem Revival, for example. Peter, can you read that opening? I wish we could do the whole thing. Is Peter here? Here he is. Hi, Peter. Good morning, Marjorie. It's early for you. It's early for me. Okay. <laughs> it's good to be dead in America with the movies, curtains, and drift the Muzak in the theater. It's good to be in a theater waiting for the best years of our lives to begin. I wish we could read the whole thing, but I'm gonna talk about more of it, thank you. Revival was conceived as an elegy for Gregory Corso, the famous beat poet who died of cancer in 2001. In its original small press version, the poem has an epigraph from Corso's own elegy Elegiac Feelings American for Jack Kerouac. What happened to you, old friend, happened to America. But for the volume, Some Values of Landscape and Weather, which is where this poem appears, Gizzy removed the line, no doubt, because it seemed to shade sentimental, histrionic. His own lyric quickly leaves Corso aside, indeed quickly leaves elegy as we know it aside, in order to take up the cultural phenomena that both shape and mirror the poet's inner but hidden self. His first line, repeated throughout as a refrain, inverts the expected cheery, it's good to be alive in America, morning in America, defining the poet's consciousness at a time when, as the poem puts it, all the codes have been compromised. And indeed, the poet's inner life is presented not according to the Wordsworthian formula of the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings or even emotion recollected in tranquility, but as a documentary catalog of the films, poems, music, and artwork that the poet takes as central to his being. The cited titles are themselves ironic. The first, The Best Years of Our Lives, is one of the finest post-war films about return to civilian life after World War II. I see it whenever it comes on. I love the best years of my life. The three principals having given the best years of their lives to the years of conflict in the war and now struggling to survive. Or are the best years in the end, the ones we witness in the film itself? How in any case can it be good to be lost among pillars of grass, an allusion not only to Whitman, but to the line to be lost among 1300 pillars of grass and John Ashbery's They Dream Only of America. Memory in this new lyric refers not to past incidents, events, or emotions. The poet tells us little about his own private life, but is made up of echoes of one's film viewing and one's reading and the music one listens to. How come, the poet asks, all the best thoughts are images? How come all the best images are uncanny? 
how this pseudo elegy asked, does the poet now express his deepest feelings? And the answer, as Gizzy puts it, echoing Wallace Stevens, who's meant the man on the dump he has quoted earlier in the poem, is, quote, to collect rubble at the perimeter, hoping to build a house, part snow, part victory. The wise man, as Stevens had put it in the last, last long of the light decorations, avenges by building his city in snow. The wise man avenges by building his city in snow. Just so Gizzy Speaker finds himself stitching frames to improvise a document all this American life. The poet is what he has seen and read. And since all the codes are compromised, confusion, chaos, and contingency reign. At the same time, the recitation of names and phrases gives the poet the strength to go on, to construct his own cities in snow. It is an equivocal victory. In Italian poetry of the new millennium, Gizzi's cities of snow find their counterpart in poems like Antonella Aneda's long and elegiac winter residences, in which prose sections alternate with stark hallucinatory images of war, bodily damage, and pain. In her Paris Review interview with Susan Stewart, Aneda comments on the role her native Sardinia has played in her poetry. Geology has made me aware of the insignificance of human presence, of the absence of an intelligent design. The landscape of La Maddalena and Sardinia is harsh and barren and windswept. The vegetation is sparse, but also often enough scarred by arson, for humans have wounded the landscape as well. Since the early 18th century, when Sardinia was ruled by the House of Savoy, systematic deforestation was the policy. At the same time, I fully understand what Andrea Santotto means when he writes, no, you never betrayed me, landscape crossed out. His work registers an invocation that becomes painful when the landscape is wounded by greed and speculation. The strike through suggests how landscape has been scarred. I'm not talking about Arcadia or the world of idols, but instead about the landscape that surrounds us and reminds us that we are not the masters of the natural world. It is an ethical condition. What is happening to the landscape in Sardinia and elsewhere is deeply worrying. Landscape has a relation, a spatial relation to poetry. Now here the reference to Sanzotto who recently died, so it seems so ironic, that strike through of landscape is especially interesting. Like Sanzotto, Aneda is ambivalent about the landscape, the natural world. By putting aside my eyes, she remarks, observing not as myself, but the world around me, I have learned to believe precisely in living. And so her 1991, whose title refers to the dissolution of the USSR after 1989 and the future of the Baltic Republics, a subject eerily apropos today, the fear of the future is always that of a we, not an I. Luigi, do you want to read the Italian? In a soon tempo? Yeah. Okay. I'm getting the microphone. I don't know what you think I can see. No, no, of course. Yeah. Two or three minutes. <laughs> okay. Oh, you did it? Okay. It's very short. In nessun tempo c'è bisogno di noi, le notte verticali e il viale dei tigli la lepre trasparente nel cespuglio, la schiena ombra di chi allora sostava. Hey. At no time is there need for us. The vertical nights in the linden tree-lined walkway, the hair transparent in the bush, the back shadow of those who were waiting then. Now here the English translation nicely mirrors the effect of Adena's intricate sound structure, verticale, viale del tigli, lepre, Cepulio rendered as vertical linden lined walkway, focusing on the way geographical locale defines emotion. Poetic distance, suggests here, is essential. Ezra Pound called his cantos a poem including history. Adena might have called her sequences poems including geography or ecology. And geography has become a big thing, I think, now in poetry. The language, in any case, is never directly transparent. In a related vein, Luigi Ballerini, 
whose Cephalonia, incidentally, is an important poem including history, has also derived inspiration from his seemingly other activity, namely sports. His sequence track cycling and road cycling has 10 sections that use intricate sound structures to capture the feel of racing, whether bike or motor car racing, or for that matter, running. Here's section six, which is an unrhymed sonnet. Can you read the Italian yeah. movies? Chilometro Cors lanciato, da lanciare, che lancia in resta, lanceremo, che lanceremo in cielo, in terra, in mare, che slanceranno questa parola in disordine, imbeccata, e che sarà bramosa e sugosa e brulicante, un rigoglio di adeguate sussistenze, coi cani al guinzaglio, con vene terse, una pioggia d'estate barocca, un'amnistia che viene di traverso, che aprirà col violino la prigione dei fuochi produttivi, degli amori incalliti, contagiosi, una sabbia prudente, difettiva, ma in vena di scherzi, di origini, di defezioni omologhe, o quattro quattro e sganciato, che sgancia e presta, che sganceranno sopra li quattro mal tirati stracci. Thank you, I'll read the English. Okay, you've done so much. Okay, let's go back to the English one minute. Whoops. Um, kilometer to launch for launching with lance in rest we will launch and be launched in air land and sea we will launch out this spoon fed disordered word that will also be yearnful juicy and teeming a lushness of actual adequate victuals a dog on a leash with sour and fiendish veins a baroque summer rain an amnesty go down the wrong way opening with violins a jailhouse of productive fires, hardening contagious loves, a disruptive, cautious, but playful sand in the mood for dancing for defections, hushed and unhooked, unhooking and landing and twirling to be unhooked from spinning upon some four ill-timed rags. Now the translator, who is the translator? I'm sorry, I'm missing, I'm missing that. Is Jeremy the translator Parson. here? What? Jeremy Parson. And is he here? No, he's in... Somewhere right, in Texas. Well, congratulate him anyway. <laughs> He's done wonders in rendering ballerini sound play and punning. Launch, launching gives way to lance. In Italian, the word lancia noun and lancia third person singular verb are the same. And then to more cognates of launch. So as to make the actual speed of motion concrete. They follow a sequence of metaphors for the feel of making one's way in the race of bikes around the track. A dog on a leash with sour and fiendish veins, a baroque summer rain, and so on, until the defections hushed and unhooked, unhooking and landing and twirl to be twirling to be unhooked takes place. The reader participates in the onomatopoeic soundscape, quattro escancio, cascancia, presta, so I'm so glad Luigi read it, racing along with the poet. Ballerini's poem is an interesting public lyric, in a way, identity defined vis a vis physical sensation and action, rather like in Boccioni's futures compositions of racing cars and trains. It's a bravura, bravura exercise in sounding the self. One of the most interesting poems from the New Millennium section of the Moshe Anthology, and this anthology is so big and so fat, but there's the section on the New Millennium is the one I wanted to concentrate on today, is Alba Donati's elegy for the children killed in the Bessian school siege, which began on September 1st, 2004, and lasted three days, involving the imprisonment of over a thousand people, two-thirds of them children, as hostages, many of whom were killed. The siege in question began when a group of armed Chechen separatists occupied school number one in the town of Bessian in North Ossetia, which is an autonomous republic in the Caucasus. On the third day of the standoff, Russian security forces stormed the building with tanks and rockets and ended the attempted coup. Needless to say, Donati's poem anticipates what is now going on in Ukraine. It's almost eerie written some time ago how this is what's happening right now. In a note at the end of her poem, Donati tells us that she conceived her Bessian poem as a reworking of an anonymous, anonymous Russian text, an epic story of the invasion, the Mongol Golden Heart, heirs of Genghis Khan, that destroyed Riazan in 1237. 
but she also thanks Giampaolo Vicetti, correspondent for La Repubblica, whose reports from Beslan impressed her with their absence of rhetoric, their straightforward reportage. These two pretexts, she notes, have given me support, helping me to write what is already written without the annoying and culpable risk of inventing and poeticizing. Now, Donati's words here recall Craig Dworkin's fate of echo, but we might stop to consider what a curious view of the poetic function this really is. Aren't poets by definition creators? Don't we want our poets to invent, to poeticize? In the digital age, perhaps not. Conceptual poets like Dworkin and Kenneth Goldsmith have argued that invention is no longer the goal, given the glut of information available to all of us with a single click or two on the computer. In Donati's case, the aim is not to invent lyric language, but to frame existing language from the newspapers or other sources photo and photographs so as to create a new way of looking at familiar data. Context in this instance is all. Donati takes the reader step by step through a series of numbered sections detailing the particular slaughter of the innocents that is her subject. I'll just read a short one here. Grief on the destruction of Beslan, a catalog poem, a seemingly neutral listing of what happened. He who returned, that choice, that boy holding flowers in the online photo. He who's gone, she who sings before going on, going in, sorry. The celebration for the whole town, he inside. He who left with his dead father's clothes, he who pushed them, she who blows herself up with children in her arms, unheard of, done. Now here the sequence of simple declarative sentences or phrases recall film stills, where we see X and then Y and then Z. But she intersperses in her reportage such lines as the following. I'd learn Russian if only just because it was the language of Lenin, Vladimir Mayakovsky, reminding us of the original hopes of Russia's great avant-garde poet for the future of the revolution, hopes long since ground to dust. The 42 short sections of the elegy work to produce a sense of the cyclical. It happened in the days of Genghis Khan. It happened in 2004. No doubt it will happen again. All we can do is celebrate and mourn the dead. Who will not despair, we read, for so many dead? Donati has produced a striking elegy, but in conclusion, I can't help feeling a bit uneasy about this new poetry made largely from the arrest already existing language of news reports by those who are, after all, experiencing the events in question at second hand. Can't documentary film to take a different art form record such disasters more fully and convincingly? Think of a film like The Battle of Algiers, or to take a fictional example, the French TV series about DGSA intelligence operations, Le Bureau, or the remarkable Israeli video, video series, Fauda, which presents us with horrifying, but often absurdly funny images of the Israeli defense force at work and then the comparable Palestinian forces. In this climate, what can poetry as the language art do better than video or film? And what will future poetic movements look like? Will others follow Marco Giovanale, who is now, I read, composing primarily acemic poetry, as is the Polish-Danish poet Gregor Robileski, who's done some very interesting work. The pheasant, in any case, is reappearing, providing us with answers to these questions and to raise new ones. It's an exciting threshold moment for both our poetry, and since we're lucky to be here, so I welcome you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marjorie, for this exceptionally interesting essay on, uh, and, and I, I particularly thank you for having uh, called attention to the difference of the situations uh, when, the when, the when the pheasant disappeared 
and we were at each other's throat <laughs> in this very room and uh, uh, the completely situation nowadays I think that poetry has got a, a lot of work to do uh, whether it uh, uh, draws directly from uh, other documents such as uh, journalism after all I mean even uh, Melville used to cannibalize <laughs> Uh, newspaper articles and turn them into Benito Sereno and Moby Dick and so on, but sometimes it doesn't happen. The uh, point is that the, the, the usage of, of language is, and, and the modification must be, in the end, in my opinion, the end result of, of all poetry. Uh, it's a question of galvanizing and, and show uh, what uh, Dante says, uh, Mostro ciò che poteva la lingua nostra. He showed what language could do, you know, and uh, maybe the, the pheasant will be another stimulation in, 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 in push forward in that direction. Are there questions for Marjorie? I think you, uh, are, up, are you up to it, if there are any? Or, and of course, I, I want you to know that we're going to uh, publish the proceedings, and I assume... If you want to, uh, some of the text will be given bilingually and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, it, it would be, uh, um, but it will it takes some time because we, we have to recover from two and a half years of preparation. So it, will, it won't be tomorrow. I will not be on the phone tomorrow afternoon saying, hey, where's the essay? Okay. <laughs> so is, are there questions for Marjorie? I, uh, Oh, I'm sorry, Jermaine, yes. Thank you, I have a million questions, this was amazing, and I'm very grateful for this case on Italian poetry and between America and Italy, and for the memories about the previous pheasant. But among all the questions that I have in my mind, I would like to ask you specifically about, you started very heavily on the role of social media and, and social networks in changing the rules of uh, the relationship with semantics and with uh, significance and with invention. And I wanted to ask you if you think it is an actually new thing, uh, if, if social networks do stuff to language and to the relationship between uh, stand tall and stand tall that could not have happened in the 90s, for instance, before social networks didn't exist, if there is a rupture, if there is a discontinuity between postmodern and post post postmodern um, language. I can't quite, there's an echo. Can somebody just summarize very briefly any of that? I couldn't, can't quite hear. Did you speak to venire qua perché c'è un po' di eco? That there's continuity, the question is about continuity, the talk is about continuity. Yes, the question is about continuity, but specifically about the role of... I realized myself, I don't think I'd realized myself how much difference the internet, after all, when we had the meeting in 91, there was no internet yet. The cell phones were just beginning, and it was a very different situation. And now, I mean, the internet, of course, has both good and bad effects. The bad effect, as Giovanale and Trump, you know, the kind of absurd discourse that we all get all the time, and it's getting worse. I find that in terms of politics, I mean, there's just no discussion. There's no real debate. Maybe there's an Italy, but certainly none here. And, um, you know, it's just something is said. And once it's said, every, everyone does this. Or does that, or, or what words mean, it is accepted. So um, that's the downside. But of course, the upside is that, that it is so much more possible now to have exchange and to read each other's work. And you can go on the internet and find, you know, all the poetries in translation. It makes it much more possible to, um, to have exchanges, and that's the good side. Everything has good sides and bad sides. That certainly has been a good effect, and it's amazing how much it has changed. Now, some people will say, it just means now the world is so uniform. Isn't that awful? Everybody's doing the same thing. And they are doing very similar things and influenced by each other. But on the other hand, 
It's very different from the situation we had in 91, where the Italian contingent were treated sort of as strangers who were doing old fashioned things or whatever. And right, Luigi, and there was that whole problem. And it was partly just a problem of a linguistic problem. But um, I think things are much better today in that regard. Thank you very much again, Marjorie. Thank you. I'll be, I'll be watching, listening to you all. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Well, the pheasant continues to reappear. I guess there are a few people still flocking in, but uh, maybe it's time to start. Otherwise, it'll be too late tonight. So uh, this is the, we are getting into the nitty-gritty moment of uh, this reappearance and uh, I am very happy and honored to introduce to you our first speaker, Andrea Cortellessa, to many of you a household name, to others a good friend, a very dear friend. We share a few loves and a few hates and uh, also some betweens. Uh, but certainly we uh, have for many, many years shared our love for poets such as one poet in particular, Elio Pagliarani. And uh, I'm very happy to say that Elio was here during the first, uh, when, the, when the pheasant disappeared, and that Andrea is uh, now back with us when the pheasant is reappearing. I won't make a long list of his publication because it will take me the afternoon to run through it, but there's one book that uh, just uh, came out, which uh, I am uh, looking forward to reading myself. That's a monumental work on Andrea Zanzotto. And uh, uh, I have had the privilege of uh, sharing with Andrea a number of uh, ideas. I thank him very much for his contribution to my education in contemporary Italian poetry. Andrea Cortellessa, who will speak to us in English, or as he prefers to say, pigeon English. Thank you, Luigi, for invitation. Uh, thank you, Luigi, for your words. Uh, thank you to you to listen this um, awful English, but uh, I thank uh, Tom Peterson for his uh, help in rendering this English less pidgin of possible. Uh, to the work entitled of the organizers, The Legacy of the Neo-Avant-Garde, I gave a twist, I hope, not too tendentious, the nightmare of Novissimi. Not properly the legacy, but uh, l'incubo dei novissimi. Uh, I am not the first to use it because um, this was the title of a performance. Let's get the first images. A performance made in the spring of 1977 by Gregorio Scalise. That one in the center with Dario Bellezza on the right. Uh, Gregorio Scalise, a poet from Calabria, but of the Bologna milieu, who died a couple of years ago, during a series of readings created by Franco Cordelli at Bit 72, Bit 72, a historic cave of the Roman theatrical avant-garde. In the early 60s, Carmelo Bene was its rising star. The readings took place just as upstairs spring 1977, upstairs on the streets of the city, some of the most impressive clashes of that violent season took place. Poetry sank into an uh, aside of history, in a way perhaps not so different from how, in the aftermath of the 68, Corrado Costa, Giulia Nicolai and Adriano Spatola had done at Mulino di Bazzano. In those late 70s, however, the presence and body posture of the poet were textualized and the theater 
seemed the most appropriate place for poetry after a decade, the 60s, rightly or wrongly considered all intellect, tutti testa, tutto testa. It is no coincidence that the patron saint and martyr of this attitude in the aftermath of his tragic end was unanimously elected then Pierpaolo Pasolini. At mid-72, the poet was staged as an object, almost an objet trouvé, in fact, by the sadistic Cordelli. Cordelli is the name of a, a character in a novel by Marquise de Sade. <laughs> Scalise's performance, like the others of those weeks, including those of Dario Bellezza, Maurizio Cucchi, Gino Scartagliande, Cesare Viviani, and Valentino Zaiken, is documented by, documented by the photos of the Agnese de Donato and Giorgio Piredda that next year will be included in a very odd book published by Cordelli with an emblematic, emblematic title, Il Poeta Postumo, The Postumus Poet. Those catacomba readings were a surprise dialectical premise to the season of maximum jouissance and mass success of Italian poetry culminated in, Jan in June of 79 with the incredible three evenings on the Lazio beach of Castel Porziano. Also from this uh, inter international poets festival, which he curated together with uh, Ulisse Benedetti and the late uh, Simone Carella, who was a dear friend of mine, uh, Cordelli will draw a book as bitter and inward looking as Il Poeta Postumo had been euphoric and crackling, starting with the title stolen from Vladimir Nabokov, Proprietà Perduta, Lost Property. Of Scalise's performance, this was the one, which was held on May 7 of that 77, recalls Cordelli in Il Poeta Postumo, first of all, the proxemics, modeled on that of the Last Supper. Was it then the transmission of an apostolate or the stage of a betrayal? But would that betrayal also be remembered as the necessary premise for a transfiguration? Il poeta Postumo asks, who was Judas, Scalise or Cordelli? One can also wonder who in that scene, interpreted the figure of Christ. Was it perhaps the logos embodied by the covers with the unmistakable graphics of Feltrinelli's series materiali scattered on the table of that Last Supper? The fact is that, continues Cordelli, I quote from Il Poeta Postumo, the wine as always went to the head, the audience took over, Scalise gave his guests some verses from the collection I Novissimi to read, to read. Presti Giacomo, Bellezza, Perlini, Serrao, Poetesse, feminists, elderly actors, young aspirants, uh, Rossella Orr, Rossella Orr was the muse of that cub, Bit 72, read them. Before, everyone read according to their turn, some naturalistically, some parodistically. Then a guest, Giulio Ferroni, got up from the table and began to walk and declaim like an old processor, an old trombone. Finally, the word was taken from his mouth. Bellezza snatched it from Ferroni as Presti Giacomo did from Bellezza, and Rossella from Presti Giacomo, and the actor from the actress. It was the babble of languages, the loss of semanticity, as would have been said 15 years ago. Wasn't the linguistic babel a theoretical presupposition of the Novissimi? The situation, which gets out of control subverting the canonical separation between the reader and the listener, anticipates the chaos of two years later on the beach of Castel Porziano. But above all, it denies the assumption of the performance to overturn the sense of the genitive in the title, The Nightmare of Novissimi. The nightmare first was them, then it became us, this is how Cordelli intended to celebrate the liberation from the 60s of his generation. Seen today, instead, these images tells, tell us exactly the opposite. 
by dramatizing a theoretical principle that formulated a few years earlier is not cited by Cordelli, but whose spirit circulates in his books since their titles, Il Poeta Postumo and Proprietà Perduta. I'm talking about the anxiety of influence, theorized in 73 by Harold Bloom. Uh, curiously, the, the, the day before yesterday, I found in Boston the translator, Mario Diacono, of that book, who salutes uh, you all for this conference. The Novissimi had uh, exerci exercised their influence above all, of course, on poets and critics of the next generation, such as Calise, born in 1939, and Cordelli, born in 1943. Precisely from the extent of the adverse reactions is measured, in fact, the institutional size of the event novissimi on our literary culture. It never ceases to surprise me how all those who are eager to hatchet them even today don't understand such an elementary mechanism, thus giving the best contribution to the continuation of their actuality. When I use this term, institutional, I don't make my own one of the most pusillanimous criticisms among those addressed to the neo-avant-garde, that is, of having associated itself in order to achieve some literary and cultural power. Rather, I make use of the concept of Luciano Anceschi, who, in a phenomenological sense, defined institutions of poetry those literary novelties that establish a before and an after. That's, Alfredo Giuliani will say in the preface to the 65 edition of Inovissimi, the constitution of a literary language that makes epoch and from which there is no turning back. Uh, reasoning with a bit of dialectical malice, it is precisely the restoration that followed, that followed it that marked the size of the decisive watershed that, uh, however we want to judge it, represented the revolution of the Novissimi. Paraphrasing a cynical joke by Giulio Andreotti, cultural hegemony logo chi non ce l'ha, we are south of those who don't have it. It is taught once again today by the right government in Italy that has remained last in our county to remember a leftist hegemony that long time ago. One is not surprised, therefore, at the violence of the reaction that in following two or three decades has tried to restore postures and tonalities of poetry from a time well before the revolution. And that, in fact, literatures that uh, have not known that revolution haven't even dreamed of readmitting in their texts. It's certainly not the case of Scalise, good poet, but it's enough to think um, of the neo d'annunzio poses of Giuseppe Conte, uh, not the former premier, to get an idea of the reverse backlash that the Big Bang of Inovissimi produced on our poetic scene and the last continues to produce. This is also true in another sense. The influence of Inovissimi on what Gilda Policastro called the last poetry is vast and profound. I believe Cecilia Bello will talk about that. But in addition to in negative, as those who opposed the Novissimi in an unlikely poetic Vendée, also, positively, the post-novissimi neo-neo-avant-garde, which in the second 80s gave itself an eloquent name as Gruppo 93, saw its energy coursed precisely by the comparison with the totem of 63, uh, with respect to which uh, symmetrical reversals, such as the expiration instead of the foundation date uh, in the name of the group, or the apostrophe to be readmitted before the date, to which it's entitled, show a conceptual subordination difficult to deny. It's likely that in a context very different from the mediatic one to which Gruppo 93 aspired, today's so-called poesia di ricerca has more room for maneuver by virtue of the limitations imposed by the publishing establishment. Limitation that poesia di ricerca doesn't cease to complain with tones now in turn a bit of repertoire. 
But about this paradox will speak after me, I imagine, Marco Giovenale. By the way, in Novissimi weren't anonymous in supporting their disciples. For an, for an Antonio Porta, whose phenomenological nom de plume was an auspice, and for an Annibal Estrini with his unflagging poetic, poetic activism, or for an Elio Pagliarani with his pedagogic muse and his effective poetry writing laboratories, I distinctly remember Eduardo Sanguinetti in Bologna in 2003 pronounced this death sentence, after us, the deluge. No less paradoxically, however, the anxiety of the influence exerted by Novissimi was also retroactive. This is the theme on which I would like to focus today. As in the famous paradox formulated by Borges about Kafka, Novissimi have invented, that is concretely influenced, even their own predecessors. Apart from old masters like Ungaretti and Palazzeschi, whom Novissimi venerated, and who from that enthusiasm felt entitled to a happy return to disorder, as predicated by Sanguinetti, emblematic among all is the case of Montale, the influence of whose poetic of objects on the system in re of some Novissimi in his time had been difficult to circumvent. His scatological as well as eschatological attitude Although divined in him by Andrea Zanzotto already in 1953, is only realized with Satura, a book of 71, with a vision of a wasteland, desolata or devastata, as you may prefer to translate, in whose exploration the Sanguinetti of Paulus Putredinis had been a pioneer. More generally, teaches Enrico Testa in Dopo la Lirica, the full 60s saw all the major authors of the generation before Inovissimi radically change their language. Mario Luzzi's magmatic turn, coeval with Vittorio Sereni's phenomenological one, Roberto Roversi's concrete registrazione di eventi, or even the causal rather than objectual turn of a neglected master like Bartolo Cattafi. More oblique, but not imperceptible, the, reaction, the reactions of poets such, such as Caproni, Giudici, Fortini, and even Bertolucci. Even Emilio Villa, whose trajectory also precedes, albeit slightly, the first Novissimi flashes, knows in those years a maximum of material abstraction and multilingual extremism. Perhaps only Amelia Rosselli, who for biographical reasons had the contact with the originals of the historic avant-garde before them, disregarded her novissimi peers, the multilingual texts of her beginnings and the extraordinary variazioni belliche, war variations published in 64 under the aegis of one of their archinemies, like Pasolini, had the genesis independent for, of the institution of the Neo Vanguardia. The case of Andrea Zanzotto, who is the major author of the immediately pre-Novissimi pre generation, is paradigmatic, although, as we shall see, completely idiosyncratic. If I can outline it here, it is thanks to the recent archival ex excavations of a young and formidable scholar from Gen Genoa, Chiara Portesine, who documented the withdrawals to the limit of plagiarism from Sanguinetti's Laborintus and surroundings in the elaboration of the lunar poem by Zanzotto, Gli Sguardi Fatti e Segnal, of the autumn of 69, and more generally, the turning point represented by La Beltà the year before in the attempt to respond eff effectively to the neo avant garde provocation passing from words, essays, to facts, versification. Portesine alludes to the reaction that the release of Novissimi in the spring of 61 had roused in Zanzotto, the public one of the famous Stroncatura released a bit cold the following year on Comunità, the, the magazine uh, of Adriano Olivetti. But above all, the private and very hot of the letters written to his friend, writer, and editor Carlo Della Corte and to to the same Anceschi, who was the main sponsor of the anthology, 
then to poet and translator Cesare Vivaldi. Letters too full of references to private matters, or almost, as Zanzotto confesses to Anceschi, who forbid him, as the director of Il Berri would have wished, to deliver to the magazine three pages on I Novissimi. The real critical abreaction caused in Zanzotto by I Novissimi derives, above all, from the convivial joke escaped him during a certain cursed dinner in Rome and badly reported by the totally diff Francesco Leonetti, as Zanzotto defines him, on an issue of Officina of five, uh, 557, the one on the nervous exhaustion that only in his eyes could excuse the excesses of Inovissimi, uh, of Labyrinthus, uh, released the year before. Sanguinetti had offended, and in one note of Inovissimi replied that it was rather a matter of historical exhaustion. But neither he nor Anceschi could imagine that the misunderstanding generated by that joke touched the hyperreactive nerves of, the, of a Zanzotto who had always been a great neurotic and repeatedly visited, visited uh, by the risk and phobia of psychosis. Uh, it's no coincidence, that, no coincidence that Zanzotto evokes the anti-model of Henri Michou, who nourishes for nervous breakdown a respect that perhaps is still trembling and quoting Zanzotto, um, but it's also circumscription, circumspection by trauma experts. The real sin of Sanguinetti, according to Zanzotto, is a, a lack of respect, not so much to healed and exorcised, but not fully infected. The anxiety of the influence of Inovissimi, but I would say in this case specifically of Sanguinetti, therefore derives precisely outside of Bloom's metaphor from the problem of anxiety, or anguish rather. A short circuit with the value of, a, of apologue. What's certain is that the overwhelming course of Zanzotto's poetry in following years between La Beltà and Pasque fully demonstrates Bloom's assumption according to which a strong poet is one who doesn't escape the agon, but overcomes his anguishing antagonists by descending on their field. This is what tries to do, in the last glimpse of his tragically amputated trajectory, the one who in the field against the Novissimi had always battled openly, Pierpaolo Pasolini. Apart from the deliberate recourse to informal ways in his penultimate poetic collection, Trasumanar e Organizzar, published in the same 71 of Satura, in which a net of numbered episodes, in my opinion, is an eloquent example of how the last Pasolini, wrote his major interpreter, Walter City, tended to a poetry that wants to be ugly. In this intent succeeding, I believe, even beyond his intentions. It's in, in his final, unfinished, and instead extraordinary narrative season, or rather meta-narrative, that the Aegon come to light with the neo-avant-garde, always opposed by him. Finally, publishing one of the unfinished papers um, he cared most for, the writing of Dante's Inferno, to which he had given the title La Divina Mimesis, began just around the 63, but soon abandoned and resumed only on the eve of the sudden publication at the end of November of 75, Pasolini propounds a brief note in which he argues with those he calls his enemies, for once in subtly ironic tones, instead of, as usual, in coarse and angry ones. I quote Pasolini. The divine mimesis. I print these pages today as a document, but also to spite my enemies. In fact, by offering them one more reason to despise me, I offer them one more reason to go to hell. <laughs> Yellow iconography. These pages want to have the logic, better than of an illustration, of a, a however very legible visual poetry. 
And the pseudo-philological manner in which this text, La Divina Mimos, is, is organized, one of the notes gives the news of the author's death, specifying that he was killed with a stick in Palermo last year. The note is dated uh, 1966 or 67, and mentioning the location of the affair clearly alludes to the enemies of Gruppo 63, and whose uh, inaugural meeting was held precisely in Palermo in October 1963, and that in the same city returned to meet in September of 65 for a conference on the experiment, experimental novel, during which there was no lack of stick shots on Pasolini. In his uh, visual poetry, that is in the series of photographs he added in extremis to the layout, we can see four of, one, four of them, Pasolini points his enemies out to the public ridicule, portraying in the right one some of the Gruppo 63. We recognize Balestrini, Sanguinetti, and Giuliani. And on the, on the left here, early 60s fascists, both yellowed like phantoms of the past. These two images are not mounted facing each other. The enemies of the neo-avanguardia are placed in mirror of the frontispiece of Poesia and Forma di Rosa, the poetic collection published by Pasolini in April of 64, while in front of the fascists is another group photo taken at Tin Ninfeo in Valle Giulia, the traditional seat of the Strega Prize. <clears throat> In a poisonous note of 66, then in Empirismo Eretico, so Pasolini had evoked the conference on the novel held in Palermo the year before. There will still be some conference in which young cretins and petulants will talk about anti-novel as if they were talking about Parmaham. Then the end, and those who have some quality can continue, while on the others the well-deserved silence will fall, as on the yellowed groups of photographs, take the photographs, <laughs> of the hermetic poets at the cafe, or of squadristi. That's exactly how it is. The parallel between the squadristi and young anti-novelists anticipates the succession of yellowed images in La Divina Mimesis. But he cannot fail to strike the circumstance for which, in this text of his, in which the guerrilla he conducted against the avant-garde is more bitter, in fact, and it's surprising to me how tons of Pasolini and bibliography have never emphasized it, Pasolini has openly borrowed, borrowed a typical modus operandi of the opponents, and even the brand they used to define it. The yellowed iconography is really a poesia visiva, in fact, as defined by the members of the Florentine Gruppo 70. Please take the photo again. Lamberto Pignotti and Eugenio Miccini. Thank you. We are divided by a rivalry from those of Gruppo 63, but with whom the exchanges were continuous. Just in that 63, in which the rival Gruppo 70 was founded in addition to the homonymous group, the first organic collection by Balestrini was released. Come si agisce ends with verbal collage that Balestrini called chronograms. In the uh, library of Pasolini is present, that book by Balestrini. They were also visual poetry also very different from the one that 12 years later, claiming its leg legibility, Pasolini will lay out. The one of legibility, legibility and illegibility was a bitter controversy that in 1967, uh, pardon, has opposed Giorgio Manganelli and Alberto Moravia. But even more resounding is the circumstance for which Pasolini certainly doesn't speak of anti-novel, as he doesn't speak of Parma Ham, but he writes effectively one anti-novel, La Divina Mimesis itself, and one, even more macroscopic, he plans as its sequel, Petrolio, 
then interrupted by death and released posthumous only in 1992. Petrolio shares the pseudo-philological structure of the previous text and above all the idea, unrealized for reasons or rights, also by the new edition published this year with Maria Careri by Walter Citi, who however described in detail its uh, presumed order, to include a figural integration, a further visual poetry, precisely. In his last years of convulsive activity, in short, Pasolini adheres to an expanded poetry, as he liked to define it, uh, borrowing an expression used for the cinema of those years by Jean Youngblood, which his enemies had codified for time. Even before, against uh, the ideology of the avant-garde, Pasolini had shown in many cases an attitude that's difficult to define otherwise than an avant-garde one taking side in battle against his enemies, communicated methods and concrete textual solutions very similar to theirs. Just think of that collection of 64, Poesia in Forma di Rosa, whose uh, naked and uh, defenseless frontispiece uh, in the yellow the iconography of, of La Divina Mimesis will contrast with, this, with the squadrismo of Inovissimi. Not only the collection take its title from the poems then, expe then expe um, excerpted by the author of the section Il Libro delle Croci, the Book of Crosses. Again, visual poems, although in the more traditional form of the calligram. But if you co we compare the decoupage of the poem masterpiece Una Disperata Vitalità, Explicitly, uh, explicitly modeled on the swirling one of Jean-Luc Godard's Abu de Souffle, with the sumptuous but heavy panoramas in pseudo and decasyllables of uh, Le Ceneri di Gramsci, seven years earlier, it seemed to read two different poets, different or perhaps enemies among themselves. Once again, in La Divina Mimesis, Pasolini exposes his own anxiety of influence, hiding it in full light, placing as a mirror of his epical collection the enemies transfigured into images. That's precisely what those enemies had encouraged him to experiment. I certainly don't want to suggest that Inovissimi and their opponents were the same thing. Readers of poetry will continue to be divided between those who prefer the originals of the Neo Vanguardia and those who appreciate more the compromise training, in Freudian terms, of their enemies. But I think it's time to recognize that the real schism produced 60 years ago in the field of Italian poetry, starting a faida that still drags on today without any historical reason today, it was also at that time, above all, a colossal misunderstanding. A bit like the one that arose between Zanzotto and Sanguinetti with the help of the differness, literally or not, of a malicious intermediary, Francesco Leonetti. It's up to us today to sharpen our ears and also our eyes, and thus to recognize both among ones and the others, those who can continue to accompany us in this new century. We have already wasted the large fifth part of it, so I don't think we should linger any longer. Thank you. As you mentioned, some of the aftermath of this controversy will be enlightened later during the conference by Cecilia. But it's, as far as I always learn when, when Andrea speaks. So I have to say that uh, I found that uh, 
idea of connecting La Divina Mimesis with Petrolio, a brilliant intuition. And uh, I have uh, learned a few things that support a feeling that uh, I've had all along. That is to say that uh, there's a great deal of misunderstanding in the controversy. There's also a great deal of uh, unconscious contradiction in Pasolini's work. And uh, perhaps in this country we are all too often accustomed to consider Pasolini as the number one Italian intellectual poet, uh, filmmaker, essayist, etc. Uh, and, and to a point that it has obscured uh, another a great number of uh, thinkers and literary theorists. Um, so this um, perspective that uh, Andrea has proposed should uh, give us a chance to look again at uh, Pasolini's, uh, late Pasolini especially, um, and, and to find him <laughs> in, in contradiction with himself. I do remember that, despite the fact that the, the crowd that Andrea showed us in front of the Nymphaeo at Valle Giulia, uh, Pasolini also wrote a letter to Luciano Anceschi when he published Ragazzi di Vita and asked for a vote to the Premier, to the Strega Prize. <laughs> so there we go. Sometime heroes fall down. Uh, but in any case, um, thank you again, Andrea. I don't know if there are questions or if we can... Uh, move to the poetry reading uh, this afternoon. But let me see if I, I, don't, I don't see very well because there's some reverberation, uh, if not. And of course, all this will be, is being recorded and will be published. And oh yes, uh, Tommaso has a question. Yes, please. Uh, do we have a microphone someplace? Oh, it's coming, yeah. It's over there. Yes, I don't know if I, I'm able to speak English uh, so fluently. You but, will uh, do. But anyway, no, it's, uh, I, uh, I <clears throat> appreciate very, very much the wonderful uh, exposition by Andrea. And also, it's, I think, uh, it's uh, particularly uh, strong and uh, uh, definitive in a certain sense. The, um, uh, <clears throat> the attribute of a pusillanime that he used about uh, this uh, usual uh, um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, of uh, aggression uh, against... Uh, <laughs> Enthusiasm. <laughs> pusillanime, as, uh, you know, the, in, uh, concerning the uh, term of institution, institutionalization, and uh, it's uh, very enlightening also this... Uh, mm, uh, this uh, uh, <coughs> precision, no. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the only presi another precision I have to do, uh, I was <coughs> uh, speaking uh, about with uh, Andrea at, uh, tomorrow at breakfast, is that, uh, you know, Grupo 93 is a strange uh, kind of beast because uh, it was born, in, uh, it was born as a point of uh, connection uh, between generations of poets, and uh, at the moment of the foundation, we were, uh, which was uh, uh, strongly uh, wanted, uh, wished by uh, Filippo Bettini uh, this morning, uh, uh, nominated by you, uh, if I remember, uh, it was a, a point of, you know, of a conference between a uh, generation of, of novissimi and uh, we uh, was. Uh, all at the uh, moment of foundation, and new poets as uh, me, Mariano Baino, uh, Lelo Voce, uh, in the first time also Gabriele Frasca, Marcello Frizione. It was a uh, Biagio Tevolaro. It was uh, uh, so, in a certain sense, we, um, uh, this uh, moment was uh, very, um, uh, was suddenly broken, but by the um, decision by, by, uh, by the novissimi to, uh, uh, to let uh, the new poets have 
having an, another kind of space uh, all uh, own uh, and own spaces uh, uh, their, their own. But uh, you know, with that, uh, um, with that um, sigla, come si dice? That uh, eti etiquette. Uh, it yeah, was very label. Very, label. It was very very uh, label. Yeah, it was very very difficult to. Uh, have a really uh, a real uh, dialectic with mm -hmm. this uh, uh, mm, generation of, yeah. uh, uh, of poets. So it's uh, no, the I, I question. The, 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 the no, thing I'm, is I'm very very difficult to. Yes, you know, I'm glad you you mentioned moment. that because we'll have, I think both uh, Cecilia and uh, Giorgio Patrizzi will eventually address yeah. exactly. This issue, uh, the Gruppo 93. Oh, by the way, when we had the Fazer the first time here, Lelo, uh, not Lelo, uh, Biagio Cipollaro was, so the, was here. Now, today we a, have Tommaso, we have or Mariano it was Baino. It was of, uh, you know, ancient of uh, uh, influence, but uh, received in, in a certain sense, uh, we, um, uh, you know, noi uh, subimmo, no? We, um, uh, it was imposed, no? Yes. This anx uh, anxiety of uh, influence, not uh, right. by, by... I have to say that uh, for our American friends yeah. that uh, this Gruppo 93, yeah. that is obviously models of Gruppo 63, mm -hmm. 30 years later, uh, and, and was so uh, a movement that, as Tommaso Torrieri just told us, is a sort of a focal point, a legacy, uh, the inheritance of... And, and the explosion of the new uh, combined together. But as I said, this is certainly a moment in the uh, trajectory that, uh, that Andrea has uh, uh, described and, and will be addressed more particularly. Uh, in, and so the, the, the features, the ingredients of Gruppo 93 will be brought forth. Stay, uh, 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 stay with us and, and we'll, we'll, we'll cover that base, okay? Yes, Fabrizio. I, I got a question for Andrea Cortellessa. Uh, do you think that uh, maybe a bridge between the um, Novissimi, for example, uh, uh, between uh, Edoardo Sanguinetti and uh, the last Pasolini, the Pasolini of Divina Mimesis and Petrolio, uh, can be Petronio, for example? Because uh, you know how was the importance of Petronio, it, the interpret the hour back interpretation of Petronio for both Pasolini and Sanguinetti. So, um, in your opinion, is a, a possible a possible bridge? We, we're, we're talking, of course, Petronio's arbiter. Okay. The no, idea, no, it's okay. Yes, the idea of Petrolio title was modeled on the Petronio arbitro, uh, Petronius arbiter. Uh, it's, um, was, uh, was expressed by a critic, I don't remember who, but very, very, uh, Marco Bazzocchi. Marco Bazzocchi has, has uh, idea that uh, the title Petrolio was on the, on the model because the structure of Petrolio is very similar to, to, to the Satiricon uh, by, by Petronio. And then there is perhaps I don't know, alien with the, with the Laborintus, but uh, with the Westland. The region of this the myth of Petronio. I meant more uh, Capriccio Italiano. Yes, Capriccio Italiano, pardon. Uh, uh, but at the shoulders of Sanguinetti and Pasolini was Elliot, I think. And uh, it's bizarre, but uh, the influence of Elliot is so vast and profound uh, in the avant-garde is not so uh, precisely defined. So I think uh, we have to continue to explore in which terms a lot of poems, a lot of poets in, in 50s and, and 60s had explored Elliot as a possible model, not only for the form poem, but for for the form uh, theater in verses, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a field of work to, to, be, uh, to be explored again. Thank you, Fabrizio. Thank you very much. I think we, uh, yes, I think we move on now with the poetry reading. And uh, our first guest is uh, Charles Bernstein. Do I see him anywhere? Charles? 
Are you anywhere in the house? <laughs> Charles and Marco are going to do some uh, play some trick on us. Uh, so um, I will just leave the microphone to them and see what they have up their sleeve, okay? Okay, yeah, so Marco, Marco we're gonna start, I'm going to start with that. Um, it's great to be here. And uh, a pleasure also that uh, Barbara Anceski is here who published this uh, new book of mine. There are copies upstairs. So we did it as a flip book, Echo and Echo, so that it reads with the English and Italian, but not facing pages. And I'll talk a little bit more about this book and the context of the earlier conference uh, tomorrow. So today I'm just going to read a set of poems uh, translated from the book, um, because I'm so happy to have this in hand and to be here. Um, so we can start with the slides. Uh, so th this poem I'm not going to read, but I'll just show you that it, it begins um, with the translation here of, uh, Carlo, of, of Carla Boranello, uh, and uh, who I was so delighted to meet. I haven't met her yet, but I will meet her next week when I'm in Italy, uh, who put this book together and, and uh, did a lot of the translation. So we start with this early poem of mine as if the trees by their roots had hold of us. So perhaps to think of that early pheasant, strange to remember a visit really not so long ago, which seems now finally past. Always it's a kind of obvious thing, I guess, amazed by that cycle, that first you anticipate a thing and it seems Far off, the distance has a weight you can feel hanging on you, and then it's there, that point, whatever, which now, while it's happening, seems to be constantly slipping away, like the sand through your fingers in an old movie, until you can only look back on it, and yet you're still there, staring at your thoughts in the window of the fire you find yourself before, etc. Um, if you want to read the rest of that poem, you can get the book. Um, and, uh, but what I want to do now, this is a much earlier in my, uh, in my life, I uh, translated, uh, um, Marco translated uh, Contradiction Turns to Rivalry, and I got it now, while well, I have it marked, sorry, I have to nonetheless, well, page 109. For any of you who have the, the book, uh, well, you're going to have your Italian projected. So what we thought to do with this, um, but we'll share the microphone one one to one. Um, in the interest of time, but I mean, I I I very much more interested in this poem in read in Italian than in the English. So it's all taken from what was kind of like my Bible in the 1950s TV guide had all of these synopses of um, all the television shows. And so I compiled this uh, poem uh, based on that. So it is um, found language. Um, and uh, in fact, of course, the title is not the same as the first line, Contradiction Turns to Rivalry. So Marco translated that some time ago. And so you're first up oh, yes. here to say I, hello. I, I read. First, the, the Italian translation, then I, you, or, or so we So what, what I'm suggesting one line, one we line. do is, yeah, I'm going to read one, and then he'll read uh, the, the next. So you can follow what's missing in, in his translation, but you'll not hear the original English mm -hmm. of my... Let me translate that <laughs> into uh, <English>. Brooklyn. <laughs> you know, we're going to do the best we can <laughs> to make it kind of quick and fast and... So I'm going to read the, my one stands in English, and then you read the next. Um, the next in Italian. In Italian, and so we read on. Right. Second. So the first is camaraderie turns to rivalry when twelve medical students learn that only seven of them will be admitted to the hospital. A un agente della CIA è ordinato di fingere un crollo nervoso, incastrare una spia in un ospedale psichiatrico. A field study of Zululand's mosquitoes 
and velvet monkeys reveals them to be carriers of viral diseases that cause high fever and bone racking pain. Ecco la sconfitta a battersi sul conquistatore nazista, la sequenza filmata illustra il bombardamento di febbraio su Dresda, l'attraversamento del Reno e l'avanzata nella Ruhr fin dentro il cuore della Germania e da est i russi che accerchiano Berlino. A brilliant doctor's erratic behavior causes concern at the hospital. Soggetti presi dalla strada offrono versioni frammentarie. Un vetro a specchio offre delle riflessioni inattese. Un paio di cabine telefoniche all'esterno e due conversazioni confuse finiscono col disorientare. A, back, a backstage view is interwoven with a tragic story. Un detective è catturato da un gangster che ha in mente di farlo di eroina e poi eh, rifiutargli la dose finché non rivela dove abita la sua ex fidanzata, di cui il criminale è geloso. The English is so beautiful here. I'm going to, to read it in this case. A detective is captured by a mobster who plans to hook him on heroin and then deny him a fix until he reveals the whereabouts of the jealous hood's former girlfriend. It could have happened to you. <laughs> a retarded young man witnesses a murder, but is not articulate enough to tell his story to the police. Un marito viene tradito nel Giappone medievale, dove l'adulterio è punibile con la morte. Julie grows attached to an abandoned baby. A Malta si intrecciano una losca operazione di contrabbando e un hippie morto. Here again I have to give you the English. A grim smuggling operation and a dead hippie lead to intrigue in Malta. See, and people say my work is not autobiographical. <laughs> Boxed candy includes frogged filled chocolates. Una ragazza viene a trovarsi fra il mondo dei vivi e quello dei morti. Henrietta Hippo believes she can predict the future by reading the letters in her alphabet soup. Il corpo di un uomo rinsecchisce dopo essere stato esposto a una strana nebbia. Conspiracy of silence hampers look into fatal beating of teenage thug. Tutti gli scapoli restano a bocca aperta davanti alla ragazza che arriva in città. This is because of the reference to the Latin in this. I'm going to read the English. Bachelors are all agape over a new girl in town. This is another one uh, from the, by the way, from the uh, uh, Mary Tyler Moore show, or actually not the, the previous one, the Dick Van Dyke show. Rob sees red when Laura goes blonde. <laughs> I mean, when you grow up with something like that, it's really, you figure, you, you, you can't do better than that. Rob sees red when Laura goes blonde. Very good episode. Genocidio, un filmato con animazioni descrive la persecuzione e lo sterminio della popolazione ebraica in Germania e nei paesi occupati da Hitler. Do you notice by coincidence he's getting all that kind of heavy lines in the Italian, which is good, because we consider that European. You know, in America, that was over there. We don't have those problems of fascism and uh, racism and This is a, really, it, it, to me, it's, a, it's an Italian and European problem. Yeah. A mental patient returns home to a cold mother and a domineering husband. Uno spensierato agente della squadra narcotici e la vedova vendicativa di un tossico collaborano per scovare un ignoto capobanda. Everyone chips in to help Henrietta Hippo bake enough pies for the country fair. 
per Roger è il canile quando Gini lo trasforma in barboncino. Nelly has the most lines in the school play, but the player to get the most out of the project is a girl who uses the play to bring her reclusive widowed mother back into society. Un asso dell'aviazione pensa di poter condurre una guerra in Corea tutto da solo. A woman tries to keep her individuality after marriage. Bilko studia febbrilmente la maniera di scampare all'afa estiva. Lucy makes an impression on her first day at her new job when she breaks the water cooler and floods the office. Minuscole creature emergono dal centro della terra. An emotionally unstable woman unconsciously blots out all memory of seeing her date murdered by her closest friend. La corrosività dell'invidia e della gelosia è cosa dimostrata. A blind girl is terrorized by persons unknown at a country estate. Strani segnali da un'isola vicina. A young woman's horror of leprosy plagues her. So, you know, that's a poem from the 1970s. But this one, also from quite a long time ago, but not that long ago, maybe 20 years ago, was translated by Luigi Ballerini, and he wrote an essay on this, which was published in uh, Boundary 2. Editor Paul Beauvais here today with us. Uh, opening, Paul said, you know, let's open that whole issue with with Luigi's translation and uh, with his commentary on the poem, which is fascinating. And uh, uh, the, um, the poem is, is for Gabrielle Mintz. Gabrielle Mintz is the birth name of our keynote speaker today, Marjorie Perloff. And the uh, title is called Gertrude and Ludwig's Bogus Adventure. Uh, which is, despite her incredible range of knowledge, you certainly knew Gertrude and Ludwig, but you didn't know Bill and Ted's bogus adventure, a uh, comedy of that time. So I had to explain to her the, uh, the title. <laughs> As Billy goes higher, all the balloons get marooned on the other side of the lunar landscape. The modules broke, it seems like for an eternity, but who's counting? And Sally's joined the Munis, and Sally's joined the Moonies, so we don't see so much of her anyhow. Notorious novelty, I'd settle for a good cup of chase and sand born, though when the strings are broken on the guitar, you can always use it as a coffee table. Vienna was cold at that time of year. The soccer tort tasted sweet, but the memory burned in the colon. Get a grip, get a grip, before the grip gets you. Glad to see the picture of ink, the pitcher that pours before throwing the ball, with never a catch in sight. Never a catch, but sometimes, never a catcher, but sometimes a catch or a clinch, or a clutch, or a spoon. Never a catcher, but plenty a flack, till we meet on this side of the tune. This uh, poem is uh, an odd one to read in this context, and that's why I, I picked it. It was an idea of Carla, you know, CB, Carla and, and I have the same initial, same first name, um, and it is a famous one, Catullus V. And uh, so we, we, we translated that 
she had the idea that I could translate it, and then she translated it into Italian, so it's a funny circuit. So here is my Catullus V. Let's live and love my lesbia. Forget those tired rumbles of the old. Who could care less? Day's light rises and falls till it sets once and for all on our never-ending sleep. Give me a thousand kisses, then hundreds, one thousand and a hundred more. Forever add thousands to hundreds. And when we get beyond count, we'll lose track of numbers. Forget them all, so that no one who'd harm us will ever know how many times we kissed. This is uh, another poem uh, translated by Carla. Covidity. The COVID gonna get me. If not now, it will. The COVID gonna kill me. Find me where I live. Buried under covers. Sheltered in the hall. Trading goodbyes to all my friends through goddamn 15-foot walls. The COVID will get me. Get me bad. My lungs are weak, and I am much misunderstood. I practice social distance, even got an oversized mask. Feel like the Lone Ranger just before he got the clap. The COVID gonna find me, if not today, in time. The COVID after me, find exactly where I am. Call it social distance. I call it pain in the soul. You say I can handle it, but it's too heavy a load. The COVID round the corner will thrash me till I blue. But that's not my worry. Terrified for you. You've always been distant, but not for me. Now I feel you drifting like you're far out at sea. The COVID gonna get me. If not now, any day. The COVID got my number, knows just where I stay. You say I'll manage social distance, that I can make it work. But if I'm distant from you, I'm sunk before I swum. The COVID gonna get me. If not now, soon. The COVID has me up all night fighting against all the gloom. Too much death surrounding. I darn near given up. Keep calling on the telephone, but you're hung up on Skype. The COVID coming, sure to get us good. Our lungs are weak, and we are much misunderstood. Um, and so the, uh, the final also translated by Luigi. Uh, so these were translated for the anthology that he mentioned, uh, which came out uh, originally some several years ago of New York poetry. And all the poems in this are really picked by the translators, not, not by, by me, which is delightful. So this is called Rivulets of the Dead Jew. Fill my plate with boudon war, boudon war, boudon war. Fill my plate with hi, hey, ho, and a rumble I will go. Don't dance with me till I cut my tie, cut my tie, cut my tie. Don't fancy me till the rivers run dry. And a hey, and a hi, and a ho. I've got a date with a bumblebee, bumblebee. I've got a date with a wee, bonnie, wee, and a hurtling, we will go.
reasons that have remained unknown to me, and I'd uh, prefer not to be seen and ask me to read her poems instead. So I'll uh, do what I can. She was part of uh, the panorama mentioned and described by Marjorie Pearl of this morning. Okay. Elena Bonocore, by the way, is a student or now a colleague at Calvary University in Canada. And she was a student of mine at Yale a few years back. And of course, I immediately exploited her, as I do with all my students, into translating Italian poetry into English or vice versa. Ora tutto si quieta, tutto raggiunge il buio. Non parlavo che al cappotto disteso, al cestino con ancora una mela, ai miti oggetti legati a un abbandono fuori di noi. Eppure con noi, dentro la notte, inascoltati. Now, the next poem is a rather long one. I will read some sections from actually two sort of narrative poems. One is uh, from a book called Altari di Riposo. Accogli, Ascoltando, scostando l'osso che ti sbarra il cuore, questo angolo di pietra. Qui matura l'amarezza, l'accampamento fioco degli angeli, l'ombra delle tuniche a cono, fredde sulla sabbia, i corpi verticali e duri. Devastati da immagini di polene, raddoppiati in uccelli, noi siamo come loro senza viso e senza sangue. Come loro, componiamo le nostre geometrie fugacemente, nella velocità del crollo, nelle grida lungo i tetti, nei pugni delle mani alate. Era questo. La sabbia sollevata in dune, gli scogli senza fiori, la terra che non ha stagione, l'erba mossa dentro le vasche sottili sulla riga dei muri e la stanza calda, quasi fosse abitata, vampa di ramo e candela, luce minima, lume di cera davanti al sasso dei morti, aria selvatica, osso affilato, tu senza incanto, a te, in sere di fuochi e fari, nei vetri scagliati dal vento sui pontili, devo certezze. Né ritorno, né unione, nessun conforto, rancore per la tua grigia bellezza di annegata. Ancora è crollo, fitto di noci, passi, dove i relitti sono ormai radici. Fiato di copie nei vani dei traghetti, non cortili di mare, ma ballatoi, ferri che annullano la quiete. Da loro imparo a non riporre oggetti, a spalancare ceste fino a fare del corpo un altro spazio. Con calma, ora che tra le zolle sono un'orma leggera d'animale, più in basso della notte dove il buio è lavoro. Chiudo d'acqua le crepe, i grandi vasi. E now from residenze invernali that I believe Marjorie spoke about this morning. Section 4. Col cuore pieno di freddezza, con la cautela della talpa, che trotta sul pavimento invernale, desolati, nonostante il sollievo di essere in piedi. Siamo scesi fino alla cappella dell'ospedale, stretti nelle vestaglie, senza scarpe, i piedi avvolti come soldati in ritirata. 
sfioravamo i letti senza guardare i malati. Gli occhi fissi allo scintillio dei vetri e a tutti gli oggetti che recano il segno di una cosa lontana. Oltre la porta delle cucine, un piatto cadeva nell'acqua, nel fumo e nel vapore, nel fuoco che cingeva le pentole e nell'azzurro del lume contro i muri. In tutto era pace terrena, in canto di grotta. Ma noi andavamo col passo dei sopravvissuti, pietra dopo pietra, sotto la volta delle scale fino al cielo notturno della cupola. Reggevamo tra le braccia un agnello cucito in corsia, il muso di ovatta, gli occhi di bottoni, il corpo tessuto dei nostri pigiami. E l'infermiera spalancò la vetrata, così nelle città spagnole spalancano le chiese. Colme di vento notturno, le cattedrali madrilene, tremore di fuochi tra le pietre, vento di neve sulla punta delle candele, sui piedi delle statue, sulla curva delle grate. L'agnello schermava i ceri, il suo grosso corpo offuscava l'altare. Abbiamo sollevato il mento, lampade, legno e vuoto, gambe intorpidite dai letti, miseria, non musco bianco, non luce d'acqua fra i cespugli. Muro sbarrato, dal gomito alzato dell'angelo e tempo slittante di febbre. Dalle cucine scendeva l'odore del brodo. Qualcuno in lontananza recideva una siepe. L'aria era ferma tra le navate e calda di tramosifoni fra i letti. Il tempo di nuovo senza inizio né fine. Quale gloria nel suo lieto di campagna contro sasso di torre. Quale pace nei rami d'olivo sotto il legno dei crocifissi. Pasqua precoce di marzo, cinta di giovani pini la collina del Policlinico, chiusa d'ombra come le mura di Geser, verde tomba tra palazzi appuntiti. Il centurione sollevò la lancia e prese a piovere sulla pelle nuda dei corpi. L'acqua rintoccava sull'orlo dei vasi, nei cortili si impastavano fango e foglie, i lampi battevano in alto senza tuoni, senza tempo di schiarire le stanze. Non più buia di altre notti, passava la notte. Solo videro all'alba il vuoto di un antro senza corpo, il luccichio di un lenzuolo, ombra e non carne, passi senza orme, aria cava e mattino. La luce cade sul tavolo di pietra, sul pane e sul vino che cola dal mento degli uomini. Smarriti si chiamavano con tristi sconosciute parole nella miseria della solitudine, fino al silenzioso scalpiccio della colomba sulla paglia del tetto, fino al volo di un manto. Come spettri torneremo in questo giardino d'ospedale dove ora vagano i parenti dei morti, e la vergogna si unisce ad altre vergogne. L'erba cresce davanti al sepolcro, ma noi conosciamo solo il sonno pesante del soldato. Chi vorrà chinarsi a riprendere il corpo? Lascia che il cuore si raffreddi come pelle sul marmo di una cucina, che le ossa si schiudano, storditi dalla nostalgia confusi dai sogni, con i teli da bagno pieni di vento, con rapida e incompleta visione di una casa al mattino. Laggiù, nell'aria, il ronzio dell'aspirapolvere sui tappeti e i tonfi dei tappeti contro i muri. Nelle lunghe ore di un temporale di aprile, prima che vengano a voltarci di fianco e che spalanchino le vetrate alle visite, allora Cambiano luci e rumori, restano il muro sbiancato dall'acqua, l'alto soffitto sopra le teste, i passi cauti nei corridoi.
da 1991 in nessun luogo c'è bisogno di noi tra un mese l'anno avrà una cifra baltica bianca 1991 dove il mille indietreggia fino a secoli steppe e l'uno cavo tintinna nessuno ci ha chiamato erano voci d'orto fischi per scacciare gli uccelli la poca pioggia che cola da tubi della casa deserta come carta ci sono solo i fiati e il bacile appannato e le noci che dicono autunno moltiplicato sopra i tavoli pietre sui posti vuoti in nessun tempo c'è bisogno di noi le notti verticali e il viale dei tigli la lepre trasparente nel cespuglio, la schiena ombra di chi allora sostava, ora soffiano stanchi sulla tempia del secolo. C'è un cibo serale, lampi sulle foto scoscese, e noi beviamo tra le forchette brune i volti stretti al bicchiere, per la lena paura che si incide sul gomito che alza una ghirlanda. Nessun tempo ha bisogno di noi, nessuno dice il numero dei colpi, l'esatta cifra dell'erba, né come l'aria, sferzandoci, ci farà dura la pelle, scoiattoli, lo slittare di foglie, la lontananza delle costellazioni. Non ho parole cupe e non cupe abbastanza. Il pino si infossa nella notte, a fatica decifro la memoria. Di lato c'era come un recinto e lì duravano le cose. Antonella Nedda, grazie. Our next guest, if I can find it, Sorry, it's a very little print. Uh, uh, Peter Gizzi, where are you? I was very happy to have been part of the translation that you'll be reading. And uh, here is Peter, okay. Thank you, Luigi. <clears throat> Charles, I'm uh, grateful to be a part of this um, weekend celebration, and um, thank you so much for including me. And it was lovely to hear uh, the work we just heard. So I'm not going to read everything that's on this, so don't worry. I'm going to, uh, just for the sake of time, and also it's been a lot of language. So OK. The first poem is, can you hear me, it's good, yeah? Okay. Fine spot unknown. Thus far we have spoken only the codes, a litany of survival. Thus spoke the silvered asphodel next to the factory ruin. Sound carries on water. My subject is the wind. To take umbrage at what a tree can do, watching one single birch become lightning, stunning the sky. Landscape is a made thing, to see the mind seeing itself, to see thought, a wing and night, the long brooding. Take it, listen, the night is orchestral when the power's on, everything disporting, a furred wand upon nothingness. I get it. It was good to leave the world, to find myself in thou. There's a lot to be said for seeing in the dark, and more to the light when there's nothing to see. If I write about the moon, it's because it's there. I am landlocked, surrounded by rivers and lakes, pills and leaves. I saw a better life. It was far off, sun on moss next to a friend. The softening air, the dandelion fluff, it was kinda real. 
and kind of not, can't see it today. And out of nothing, breath, a beast-like shadow in the glass. If I brought back every feeling I had, where would I put them? What could they mean to this world on the floor? It was best to let the moon unravel and focus the truth of the music. It was best to let the music unravel and focus the truth of night, like when I found you in the back of my mind. I am talking about people and the night, people inside the night, the night and what we are made of, the things and the people, the signal and its noise. These next two poems are from my last book, or recent book, called Now It's Dark, uh, which I began, or tried to begin. It happened around the ascendancy of the Trump debacle and kind of where we are now, which is just lost. I consider America the fourth world, right? It's an undeveloping nation. Um, <laughs> it's really, really depressing. Um, so I wasn't writing because I couldn't deal with what was happening was happening to the language um, and then I don't know I kind of thought I was done and then I wrote this poem and I was like okay maybe I'm starting again speech acts for a dying world a field sparrow is at my window tapping at its reflection a tired antique god trying to communicate it's getting to me as I set out to sing the nimbus of flora under a partly mottled sky. As I look at the end and sing, so what? Sing, live now, thinking, why not? I'm listening and receiving now, and it feeds me. I'm always hungry. When the beautiful is too much to carry inside my winter. When my library is full of loss, full of wonder. As the polis is breaking and casts a shadow over all of me, thinking of it. When the shadows fall in ripples, when the medium I work in is deathless, and I'm living inside one great example of stubbornness as my head is stove in by a glance. As the day's silver tip buds sway in union, waving to the corporate sky, when I said work and meant lyric. When I thought I was done with a poem as a vehicle to understand violence, I thought I was done with a high-toned, shitty world, done with a voice and its constituent pap. Call down the inherited phenomenal world when it's raining in the book, lost to the world in an abundance of world, like listening to a violin when a figure isn't native but the emotion is. When everything is snow and what lies ahead is a mesmer's twirling locket. I thought I was done with the marvel of ephemeral shadow play, the great design and all that. I thought I was done with time, its theatricality, glamour and guff. Gusting cloud, I see you. I become you in my solitary thinging here in partial light. When I said voice, I meant the whole unholy grain of it. It felt like paradise. Meaning rises and sets, now a hunter overhead, now a bear at the pole, and the sound of names, the parade of names. I can see that I'm depressing the shit out of all of you. Um, hey, welcome to my world. Um, so this next, all right, so the next Nonatuck Avenue is just a street near where I live, and I live in this educational corridor in western Massachusetts, and uh, on either side of us are two Air Force bases, which is really strange, because there's always this, always these things flying in the sky, which is not exactly what this poem is about, I'm just telling you what it's like when I walk. Um, we, we, yeah, this thing keeps flipping, is it happening now, right, is it moving okay? to keep looking over, okay. I feel like I'm having an eye exam, all right. <laughs> that I saw the light on Nonatuck Avenue. That every musical note is a flame native in its own tongue. That between bread and ash, there is fire. 
that the day swells in crests, that I found myself born into it with sirens and trucks going by out here in a poem, that there are other things that go into poems, like the pigeon, cobalt, dirty windows, sun, that I have seen skin in marble, I in stone, that the information I carry is mostly bacterial, that I am a host, that the ghost of the text is unknown, that I live near an Air Force base, and the sound in the sky is death, that sound like old poetry can kill us, that there are small things in the poem, paper clips, gauze, tater tots, knives, that there can also be emptiness fanning out into breakfast rolls, macadam, stars, that I am hungry, that I seek knowledge of the ancient sycamore that also lives in the valley where I live, that I call to it, that there are airships overhead, that I live alone in my head out here in a poem near a magical tree, that I saw the light on Nanatuck Avenue and heard the cry of a dove recede into a rustle, that its cry was quiet light falling into a coffin, that it altered me, that today the river is a camera obscura bending trees, that I sing this of metallic shimmer, sing the sky, the song, all of it, and wonder if I am dying, would you come back for me? Let's go up to, to I'm going to, I'm skipping, right? Okay, so uh, this world is not conclusion. What is the, no, no, I don't know it. What, no, no, I'm not doing this poem. Who's doing this? I thought, Luigi, you asked me to send you in a, a document. I did. Um, this world is not conclusion. Is that, who's, hello? Oh, so sorry. All right. Okay. So I said I live, um, I live in western Massachusetts, which is, uh, I, live, I teach in Amherst where Emily Dickinson lived. And uh, I was asked to, that was called by the, they were letting poets spend an hour in her bedroom. And I thought that was a really, I thought that was a really creepy ask. So I said, no, I'm okay. And, um, and then they called again. I said, no, I'm really busy. I'm really sorry. I can't do this. And then um, I hadn't been writing, so I was like, okay, I'll go. But why can't I find the poem? Hang on. Shit. Uh, okay. Okay. So this, you'll see, maybe you won't see. It uses a lot of diction of Dickinson's. Um, this world is not conclusion. When I look out your window, I see another window. I see a wedding in my brain, a stylus and a groove, a voice waving there. When I look out your window, I see another window. These trees are not real. They grow out of air. They fell like dust. They fell. So singing is seeing, and vision is music. I saw diadems and crowns, daisies and bees, ribbons, robins, and discs of snow, sprung effects in pencil light. When I look out your window, I see another window. I see a fire and a girl, crimson hair and hazel eyes, a public in the sky. When the world comes back, it will be recorded sound. That cooing shrub will be known as Dickinson. The syllabic, fricative, percussive, emphatic will tear open out your window. I see another window. I see a funeral in the air. I see alabaster space. I read circumference there. Um... Can you guys find the very short poem called Archaeophonics? Huh. Uh. I'm like 
pass out here. Okay. All right, no worries. I thought, okay. Ah, okay. Archaeophonics simply means the retrieval of lost and buried sound. And for me, it's a kind of ars poetica. Archaeophonics. I'm just visiting this voice. I'm just visiting the molecular structures that say what I am saying. I am just visiting the world at this moment. And it's on fire. It's always been on fire. I'm saying this, and it's saying me. That's how it works, seesaw-like. The archive in the mouth, and the archive is on fire. That's the story. The sun and the body, and the body and the sun. It was like this, just like this. The world that's coming toward me, and the world around me. Around me are words saying this saying fire, saying something, or all of it. That's good. Thanks. Saturday or Sunday, we'll also hear him as a theory, as a critic, okay? So yes. we have a complete Marco Giovinale <laughs> package for you guys. Almost okay. complete Thank works. <laughs> okay, thanks Luigi and thanks the Casa Italiana for, for hosting me, for hosting us. Okay, you heard it uh, read by um, Marjorie Perloff, whom I thank a lot for having read this text from da erano in pericolo il libro uh, che contiene erano in pericolo si intitola proprio come questo testo quasi tutti quasi tutti ormai fanno la rinoplastica quasi tutti intervengono nel vivo quasi tutti si spostano all'estero quasi tutti ridiventano poveri quasi tutti ricchi sono la frutta quasi tutti i poveri fanno la guerra tra poveri quasi tutti i malati muoiono ma quasi tutti i quasi morti qualche volta risorgono quasi tutte le merde in bilico cadono miseramente o cadono non miseramente quasi tutti i denominatori comuni dividono sul più bello quasi tutti lo sanno quasi tutti hanno delle conoscenze quasi della sapienza quasi tutti i dividendi sono spariti dal bilancio molto prima quasi tutti in linea di massima Quasi tutto è successo molto prima, quasi tutto era già finito quando sei arrivato, quasi tutto in linea di massima, quasi tutti constatano una cosa, quasi tutti la contestano prima di passarla alla discussione, quasi tutti ormai preferiscono l'Africa, quasi tutti hanno pronto il bagaglio, quasi tutti preferiscono spedirlo, quasi tutti si fidano poco, quasi tutti sono depressi e quasi tutti lo sanno, quasi tutti lo saranno, è questione di minuti, quasi tutti sono nemici di quasi tutti, quasi tutti hanno il nemico in casa, quasi tutti li conosci, quasi tutti erano qui quando sei arrivato, quasi tutti insistono sulla differenza, quasi tutti non è facile che prendano il mutuo, quasi tutti lo prendono. Quasi tutti sono criminali, quasi tutti di guerra, quasi tutti hanno deciso, quasi tutti hanno preso la decisione decisiva, quasi tutti sono di parola, quasi tutti no, ma quasi tutti lo intuiscono, quasi tutti sono distratti, quasi tutti non notano la differenza, quasi tutti invece sì, quasi tutti sono così, quasi sempre sono senza ordine, quasi tutti sono nella sociologia, quasi tutti hanno i loro orari, quasi tutti salutano con la destra, quasi tutti pensano di farcela, quasi tutti devono farsi ripetere alcune parole, non tutti, quasi. Um, th this text comes from um, uh, a book that has not yet been published. It will um, come out in, in, in I think, uh, the fall of 2023. And the title is Choches. Um, Oggettistica in italiano. Facilitazione. 
Perché la gente non si ammazzi, lì ci mettono le transenne, ci mettono le barriere, delle barriere, fanno in modo che non si buttino, che, non ci, che ci pensino, è difficile scavalcarle, scavalcare i muri, fanno anche dei muri, dei muretti bassi eh, per le galline, per i movimenti degli animali piccoli, ma sono deterrenti, come dicono, per chi vuole buttarsi, per la gente, se volesse casomai ammazzarci, sì. non è detto che non ci riesca, comunque, allora mettono delle reti, delle reti solide, quelle della conigliera, poi per gli animali più grandi, un gibbone, due gibboni, mettono quelle che possono, alte, alzano, alzano le reti in modo che siano alte, fanno degli sforzi in modo che ci sia anche una distanza da dove si cade, uno spazio come un gioco, un lasco, una specie di fossato che scavano, o possono non scavarlo, magari c'era già prima e loro ne approfittano, allora vanno molto indietro e allineano delle punte respingenti, altrimenti del filo spinato o elettrificato, oppure sia spinato sia elettrificato entrambi, in modo che la gente non possa ammazzarsi, che se vuole buttarsi si giù si prende la corrente, la scossa, salta in aria, frigge, lì brucia, non si butta, non può buttarsi, viene respinta, si attacca, come la pelle del pollo al tegame, mettono un militare, mettono un militare ogni 7-10 metri, con la baionetta, il fucile, la mitraglietta, la beretta, fa la staffetta per fare la guardia, perché spari, se loro si provano, se provano ad avvicinarsi, i piantoni gli sparano, gli sparano perché non si ammazzi, non si ammazzino, questi e quelli, uno non si butti giù, non ci pensi, per fare... Smettere la gente, smettere di pensare queste cose, bisognerebbe entrarle nel cervello per risparmiare tutti i muri, ringhiere, grate, i cordoni, i fili, i soldati, sarebbe più facile, forse è più facile. Sul distrarsi in sala, dei disturbi zen, come in sequenza, la proiezione è disturbata, ma non importa, c'è come un disinteresse, come disinteressandosi, io sono disinteressato, come disturbato, venendo disturbati dal rumore, dal chiasso zen del montaggio, della pellicola che sfratta la pellicola, fluttua, gluttua, fa il flickering, fa concorrenza al sonoro del film, se ne disinteressa del film, si interessa allo sfalfallio, allo sfrattio della pellicola disturbata, non viene toccato, non gli interessa, guarda in aria, ascolta, tutto quello che gli interessa è vedere il film, del film in sé non gli importa molto, è distratto, vuole essere distratto, c'è il film, vi accadono delle cose, I don't know piangono sullo schermo, ricordano un episodio lontano, ma non troppo lontano, lo ricordano n volte, si lamentano n più x volte, se si divide n per x si ottiene un altro numero, a volte un numero con parecchi decimali o alcuni decimali, i decimali non contano, la consuetudine vuole che si parli con la cittadinanza considerando solo gli interi, solo i numeri prima della virgola, sono meno disturbati, sono integri i numeri interi. La legge invece, dovendo prevedere tutto in astratto, nelle sue registrazioni include anche i decimali. È certa di fare testo in questo modo e di fare film anche. Anche perché se ci si pensa, ma è legale anche non pensarci, la pellicola intera non è lunga un tot di metri, ma sempre un tot virgola un altro impredicabile tot. L'asso nella manica della legge è predicare anche il secondo tot, sconosciuto ai più, predicare l'impredicabile con una calma zen, facendo un forte rumore che non si fa disturbare dal corso della pellicola, e che dal canto suo ha i suoi metri da svolgere, del tempo dato e non può stare a retta tutto. I montatori alzano le pareti, forano il cartongesso, staccano i chiodi senza pensare troppo al chiasso che fanno cadendo, inclusi gli stop, è tutto nel conto, analogamente davanti a questo spettacolo è del tutto disinteressato, dire del tutto significa che non solo la sua mente e gli sguardi sono distratti, ma il suo tallone sinistro, il destro, i femori, le parti molli, i quattro umori, l'ipofesi e la bile, i suoi capelli, le sopracciglia, distese e non inarcate, i gomiti, le dita, tutto, o quasi tutto, di lui non si esageri. Si distrae, per fortuna si distrae seguendo una qualche concentrazione, non disordinatamente, si avrebbe altrimenti un corpo disordinatamente distratto, con polpacci a est, piedi a est, del tutto stravolgendo ogni interpretazione perfino junghiana. Tutto un formicolio radiale di molecole, una nana bianca, sì, impazzita figurata, egizia, faccia a profilo da sbloccare a corpi di estintore come scappando dal finestrino dell'abbaino o dalla casa infestata. Invece la sua è una distrazione concertata, concentrata, è molto attento, certo in modo disattento, distratto, alla coerenza totale della sua distrazione, non lascia resti, particelli, residui, non lascia decimali. Thank you. Ok. Andata, ritorno, sequenza degli intellettuali. Vimeo è molto pulito, Vimeo è molto più pulito, anche se i crampi e l'intermittenza, ma queste sono cose del corpo che c'entra. Bisogna scommettere il giusto e sulla tecnica giusta. Un trucco è guardare i contorni. Se non sfarfallano è meglio. Heidegger andava in Grecia, si sedeva composto, mangiava un panino, gli dava sicurezza. Si annuvola. Mettono le plastiche sulle telecamere, rischierebbero altrimenti di bagnarsi, non è una buona idea, manderanno comunque in onda, in onda il servizio, è un servizio in diretta, è stato lungamente annunciato, piove, 
Il servizio è già in odore di Pulitzer, il titolo del servizio. Piove. Ah, quando c'era Pasolini, che rimpianto. Pasolini, gli intellettuali. Gli intellettuali Pasolini permangono degli intellettuali e si vedono o fanno dei film su Pasolini. Una soluzione come un'altra. Una soluzione tira l'altra all'annoso problema che ogni stagione si ripresenta puntuale. Prendiamo, prendiamo un caffè, dicono, prendiamo un caffè con più slancio. Andiamo al caffè, prendono un'aranciata, due tranci di torte, lemon soda, andiamo subito, così andiamo. E grandi sorprese. Prendiamo un caffè negli anni 60, c'è Moravia, c'è Pasolini, entriamo nel vivo del dibattito, usiamo degli aggettivi, a volte terminano con istico, entriamo nella, che dura di più, televisione, per criticarla da dentro. È per certo un intellettuale, piazza di Spagna, piazza del popolo, gli vanno e vengono, come si vede, mettiamo che un pomeriggio, come riservando, come a fiocco, uno abitava al 20 o di rimpetto al 19, Moravia ha una piccola rendita, nelle biografie Pasolini fa il film, per fortuna gli anni 70, tuttora una sta, e insomma uno sta attento a capire bene, c'è che una strada poi tutti, e ci passano un po' tutti, si stenta a capire. La situazione si è complicata dopo la tragica scomparsa degli intellettuali. Prima c'erano, poi improvvisamente, allora la prima cosa che ebbero pensato tutti è stata saranno scesi un momento, mo' ritornano, non ritornavano. Le persone erano molto preoccupate, erano complicate, delle situazioni senza interpretazione, alcuni si domandavano come faremo, come faremo, l'ascensore era fermo al piano, saranno andati a comprare il latte, i cerini, tipo una tabaccheria aveva finito, cerchiamone un'altra. Allora adesso li rivedremo, manca molto poco, invece no, anche chiamando i carabinieri ridevano sotto i baffi, dove saranno finiti, sono passati giorni e mesi, anni, ormai tutti si sono abituati alla scomparsa, ma all'inizio è stato difficile, si andava al lavoro la mattina con della angoscia, che dire... Che fare? Non si sapeva come sfilare i bulloni dai cerchi, aprire le scale, le scale vendere il merluzzo. Era tutto bloccato, un'intera nazione allo sbando. Quasi la guerra civile, facevano delle multe. Per fortuna esce Berlinguer, nel televisore anche due mattine, tre, cinque minuti, dice state calmi, è tutto sotto controllo, andrà tutto bene. Alla fine degli anni 70 sono entrati tutti, poi non è entrato nessuno. Non era vietato, ma non entravano più. È un po' anche colpa degli intellettuali. Quando gli intellettuali hanno capito, sono andati in gruppo. Prima in tv non c'era nessuno, due o tre presentatori, al massimo cinque. Poi hanno capito che potevano andare, sono andati. Prima la telecamera non li riusciva a prendere. All'improvviso sono entrati nell'inquadratura, all'improvviso non escono. Dove saranno, dove saranno? Che disperazione. Guarda bene. Un giorno gli intellettuali torneranno. Sarà tutto diverso. Essi non venderanno più le penne come si racconta, erano indicibili orrori, facevano specie, la specie umana. Loro però torneranno, uscendo dalla tasca il loro ruolo, finalmente lo avranno, riavranno, come società, la società tira un sospiro, essa sorride, va in giro, in gita, sui denti, ridenti, motoveicoli, si va al mare, a Ostia, a Fregene, tutte le mamme ai balconi, coi bimbi, ridete, nel mentre la primavera guariscono per sempre dalla rinite. Altrimenti dopo gli va in crack l'agenda, per allora sbagliano tasto, niente gita, o essi vorrebbero tornare alla ribalta con un'invincibile rivalsa e si risarciscono, o il sole arride loro, vogliono riaversi e fare la vendetta delle ingiustizie subite durante ciò, interpretare la voce del popolo anche in sua assenza. Quadro, quadro, esclamano, c'è un attimo da aspettare che torni il tecnico, poi accadrà questo documentario, è di grande interesse. Vedono un documentario sugli assiri, spiega come manufacevano i manufatti, andavano svelti anche sui diritti umani, c'era una superficialità, morivano come le mosche. Ok. Ok, the following ones are really short, so. Uh, esterno. Noi siamo d'accordo, non ci sono ragioni di disaccordo, fabbricano anche un sacchetto. Non litigheremo per questo, non protesteremo, siamo d'accordo. Dopo ci sono dei biscotti con questo nome. Sono tutti gentili, professionalità e hanno premure, ci accompagnano e non possiamo lamentarci. Fuori ci danno un sacchetto, ce lo hanno dato ora, dopo la coda, siamo in tanti qui. Siamo tutti in attesa in coda, siamo d'accordo, abbiamo il sacchetto. Sul gioco, and this is the last one. È tutto molto chiaro, si tratta di frasi, faccio delle frasi, in letteratura spesso non ci sono frasi ma idee, e le frasi sono pervase di idee. Io non ho idee. Thank you. Grazie.
Eh, no, puoi salire di qua? Io evito di salire perché non ce la faccio male. Allora, questa è la lettura della prima mandata del Poetry Reading, ne abbiamo poi domani e anche domenica. Ci abbiamo un break dopo la performance di Tommaso che ricordo è stato uno delle colonne del gruppo 93 di cui abbiamo variamente parlato e di cui continueremo a parlare soprattutto in risposta a una domanda di Zanzotto che dice cosa ha trovato l'avanguardia alla fine del millennio che non ha trovato il gruppo 93 e dopo dicevo c'è un piccolo break e poi torniamo per eh, le Finali. e poi basta per oggi spero che vi siate comunque appagati eh, e niente come me imparate un sacco di cose grazie allora sto molto grazie grazie so much I get a look to the clock so I uh, try to explain something in, in, in English with my uh, English not so good anyway Uh, one of the first acts of my foundation of my writing at, uh, you know, 50 years, no, 50, 45 years ago, uh, was the exercise of uh, pseudo-etymologists, uh, and um, some of them are in the first book of uh, mine, whose name is uh, Dalle Memorie di un Piccolo Ipertrofico, which is a book uh, in prose, not, uh, not in uh, poems, uh, uh, not in uh, poetry. Um, uh, 20 years ago, I came back to this way for a uh, lyrics um, dedicated one of the series of the way series of the sequence dedicated to the, the idea of alchemy. Alchemy. So I uh, read this um, at first, which is not translated, but uh, I think it's not so difficult to. Uh, to understand, and another one I tried to also the, to, um, uh, the uh, same sequence, I tried to uh, translate, uh, not so um, well, but uh, anyway, you'll uh, be claiming Als come sale, chimeia come fusione, ma che imeia è succo, è umore, e cheuma ciò che cola, quel che fluisce e scorre. Permuta le forme per la luce, tu penetra metalli con l'albore, liquefa fa ogni cosa volatile, cava lo sperma che in fondo a sé reca ogni cosa, quasi lo sciogliersi d'ogni deflusso in pneuma. This lyrics contains also, uh, you know, uh, I think Luigi perceived it very well, the uh, homage to Elio Pagliarani. The second one I, I read from the same, same uh, sequence. In questo speco saturo di sillabe, su da ogni vena muovono parole, sali in fusione d'opaco splendore, s'allargano allo specchio delle teche, come la lingua dal battito di tenebra distilla verbi schiude luce d'ombre, onde di frange l'oscuro raggio penetra brucia il superfluo libera fecce scorie. Il lume di natura per la voce, se suona al guscio chiuso della pietra, scivola dalla capsula del cuore, sillabe e raggi, su dalle cripte semina. Ecco, adesso provo la traduzione. Un momento. Scusate. In this cave saturated by with syllables up from every vein moving words souls in fusion of opaque splendor they widen in the mirror of the showcases as the tongue from the beat of darkness distills verbs etch light of shadows diffuses waves the dark ray penetrates borns the superfluous freeze scum and dross. Nature's light through the voice, if it sounds to the closed shell of stone, slips from the capsule of the earth, 
syllables and raise up from the cribs it sows. Uh, leggo uh, adesso uno dei uh, testi tradotti che sono, dovrebbero apparire al mio, alle mie spalle. Sì, non, non li leggerò tutti, comunque sia, questi che sono stati tradotti che appaiono nell'antologia, adesso in bozza, insomma, di uh, Disappearant Fisant. Uh, in apostrofo, tra le sinapsi, un angelo indietreggia, come una goccia fora i miei contatti, filtra i, con i passi, l'attimo corrode, io questo battito. The second one is uh, the, I read uh, is named Laudanio, Laudania, which is uh, a translation, uh, appropriation, uh, a violation by Coleridge, from Coleridge. So this is a translation at, uh, at the second, a second degree of the translation, uh, the one you read on the screen. In fondo all'ombra accesa del battello, draghe di mare scodavano le onde, sinuose sulle scie bianco lucenti, arquavano le schiene in una luce delfi, luce caduta in scaglie che al vapore fonde. Io, dentro l'ombra chiusa del battello, ruotando alla spirale dei contorni, neri velluti, blu-verdi risplendono, io le guardavo torcersi alle schiume, e ogni scia era un flash d'oro incandescente, squama che dritta all'iride si affondi. Um, Un'altra, the se, uh, second one I read uh, from this uh, series um, translated by the pool, the, um, uh, of, um, the disappearance of is um, uh, a very, is, uh, is a, a Uh, a, a kind of uh, novel in, uh, uh, in, in verses, Autour de la Gare, uh, a kind of uh, noir, a noir, yes. Notte, passi, nebbia scura, roco ad intender liscia mia paura, tardi io sordo come si smaglia il fato, danzi, mi stridimi, in vicolo sangottardo numero zona stazione ero scuro peso uso ad astro eroso star sospeso il sesso seme pulsa sterile sui seni fino al termine del buio un seno sibila ritorno nella notte quando non so dove trovarsi e trovarmi ansanti non era no non era stessa ansia stesso cielo alle quattro del mattino avanti che filomela sue braccia stende al nero che si inoltra velo del sé che tesse da sé lontano si lacri d'odio un panettone al cioccolato cela nella sua pasta un grumo che è soluto se il mondo che si specchia alle sue latte cova latrine e sonni ora ripieghi, ora ripieghi su calde estasi di gorgo caff caffè e latte Uh, the, the next one uh, is named, I read it, named Kitchen, Cucina a New Haven. I wrote it effectively, effectively in New Haven uh, 23, no, 30, 30 years ago, yes, in the 99, this, uh, this be, no, the 90, yeah. Um, it, Uh, it's a, also an homage to Walt Stevens in a certain way. And, and yet, and yet, and yet. Tu, rovinosa, quiete, quotidiana, scoscesa in palpebra, l'orbita spalanca lo sbattere di ciglia sulla tronca, frana delle attese, e l'ora allarga, allaga, dalla quiete sospesa dell'istante, di questa quiete, ombra tu ti stagli, distracca, quiete, lunga, meridiana, la casa si spalanca, la palpebra è deserto, delle insonnie deglutite in un boccone, delle ansie vomitate nel tepore, d'un mezzo pollo crudo a ricavarne, cavarne fuori, spazi, vertigini di spazi, e visceri vertigini già pronte alla cottura, inforna queste fami nella dura, quiete, vorace, uscio del tuo cedere cedere al polso del televisore, 
battito cuore in gola in un boccone, cedere spazio, fame nel pallore, cuore di panna dentro cui t'assorbe lo spazio, non la sola sua memoria, la sete, non la sola algida sfera che ti assale la sera se sei solo, e tu disarbi il cibo, il cibo, lo spazio, la fame, il cibo di fame, il boccone ingoiato e sputato e via, io dove qui a disfarmi, sfarmi, al trangugiarmi il pregno delle immagini, argini, cuore di panna, fame delle immagini e la soda, sprizzata, e poi il clangore di Pluto, Freddy, Mickey, Splat, la notte, il cosciamar, le cocce schizze, il cono, il corno della notte rizzo sul margine, questo margine di margine di succuba, incuba, di incubata notte, la notte di soda, si muore da soli, si soda, si muore di televisore, buio. Buio tubo a picco, a bocconi, bulbo, stramazza ombre dal buio, dal tubo, dal cibo, dal limo, dal fondo del tubo e dal sonno e dagli occhi del sonno e dalla mente esausta che stramazza, viscere, versa di fuori, collassa, incubi, orofagi, dal soda, al cono, al tubo, buco, bulbo, falbo, da cui si sversa, si sfarina il suono, la luce, la mente, allora il bulbo, dico la buca, la quiete, buio, dico buio, Tubo, dico bu, tubo, buco la mente dal bulbo alle valvole, alle bernate fughe, dico buie, succose, superghiotte, ai romitaggi frigoriferi. Allora, quasi... Grazie. Grazie. Allora, il tempo fugge velocemente, leggo un testo, anche questo è una sorta di una traduzione, di cui leggerete un'ulteriore una ritraduzione di un testo famosissimo tratto da un grande racconto appunto di un autore della, di questa costa, Edgar Allan Poe, Laigia, Laigia, ossia The Conqueror Worm, tradotto come El Conquistador, The Poem. Ecco, è già notte di gala degli ultimi anni soli, ressa d'angeli ornati, rissa soffice d'ali, dai veli che grondano affanni, dall'ima platea per applaudire, la piesse di paura e desire. Se orchestra di suoi spasmi e spira celeste armonica di sfera, oh, musica di mille lire, mimi, maschere del Dio nell'alto, abbiasciando la chioccia voce bassa, Svolacchiano, entropica, mobile, massa, non più che fantocci che vengono e vanno, derive di vaste, di informi, deforme cose, la scena trasmutando da un lato e dall'altro, inconsolate, erose, scotendo l'orale di condor cospargono pene invisibili a scoso affanno, pinte, accozzate, teatrali pose. Melocangiante, nulla sarà per voi scordato, il fantasma fantoccio che la folla rincorre senza mica afferrarlo al mezzo d'un cerchio che sempre ritorna allo stesso centro del sé e la follia che è molta, ancor più è il peccato, e orrore che anima, muta la fola, e orrore che smuove la mota, che traccia la rotta, che sfolla dal cerchio, che sfalsa i contorni, Orrore dei fondali adorni, orrore dei miei cupi giorni, del sole nero, dell'eterno rullo. Mira, nel mezzo di mimica rissa e lubrica, una forma si intrude che striscia e si lombrica. Sanguisuga la cosa che si dimena e insinua sul deserto sconcerto della vuota scena, si torce e contorce di morte gli spasimi, Fatti suo pasto i mimi e dalle zanne bestie si inghiozzano i serafini, pregne di sangue agrumi, globuli a bocconcini. A litri l'infiasca tra spire ritorte, si intrude alla tresca di forme già morte. Si spengono le luci, s'accendono le fauci, e sul brivido di una forma casca il sipario, funebre trama e funesta che tomba, insomma, Già rombo di tempesta, che rumba, che affonda, che gli angeli pallidi esausti, che gli angeli rauchi, levandosi, esponendosi alla persa vista, annunciano che uomo, a nome la tragica farsa, e verme è il suo eroe, il verme, sì, il verme, è il verme che conquista.
termino quasi, perché forse se ce la faccio c'è una brevissima coda, con un omaggio a Elio Pagliani, quindi torniamo di nuovo a un ulteriore omaggio che è tradotto, Marcetta per Rudi, per, che scrissi per un dono a Elio per i suoi 75 anni, e in realtà è composta, è davvero una cannibalizzazione di testi, di micro uh, sequenze, di micro versi, di micro formule, eh, pagliaraniane che sono però ricombinate appunto eh, con un ritmo diverso eh, nella curra de, del sonno il corpo umano esplode gravità è questa forza presa l'ultimo gioco che non si apre nel lancio l'ansietà delle masse scruta il suo corpo nero il ritmo che si strappa sarebbe come dire per otto ore al giorno nel tempo fra due lampi immobili a guardare senza ali lo spirito, a San Siro la Siemens, prova tutte le strade e il mondo orizzontale, dalla sabbia supino, non ci sono colori, la vertigine astrale ha bisogno di piombo, che si pone zavorra e polvere da sparo, più bisogno di piombo, di sentire i rumori, sarebbe come dire la scienza della merce e diamante sul vetro, a un separé da motta, che uno che non ci sta, che non gli tocca niente, all'uscita dall'astor, prova tutte le strade, All'incrocio in via Meda non bastava la droga. La pioggia radioattiva, i contatori di Geiger, le H sul Pacifico, i contatori Geiger, il ritmatore asincrono, il sesso gonfio il cuore. Sarebbe come dire saldar fili a migliaia, questo è il taglio dei tempi, per le cose che passano, la stile di sudore, l'energia negativa, le pulsioni omicide, la ragione apparente. Sarebbe come dire fare finta di niente, a sentire i rumori, sollidendo dal palco, si distacca dall'orbita, il mondo orizzontale, l'inerzio e la carne, lo sgomento che è il corpo, alle tempie, le vene, saldarfili a migliaia, le cipolle a fettine, questo è il taglio dei tempi, cordone umbilicale, trascinato sensali nel futuro che passa, la forza che si strappa, sopra i corpi mansueti, la polvere da sparo, strida il vetro e il diamante nel profondo del sonno, il diamante, il sudore, questa polvere, di piombo, l'inerzia, cordone, il corpo orizzontale, il vetro, lo sgomento, merce supina, i fili che dissaldano. Incidi il vetro, il corpo, prendi appunti, stacca il contatto, l'ombelico è in ansia, nella scienza del piombo, gravitando, taglio sottile nel ritmo che ristagna. Grazie. Volevo forse, sì, proprio terminando, se lo ritrovo, ecco, un breve testo che eh, scrissi anche per ringraziare Fabrizio Boni, che è qui, che mi diede l'occasione di scrivere, un testo che è un omaggio stavolta a Marino, alla beltà crudele, insomma, di, eh, di Giovan Battista Marini. No, il, il, the, this is an homage, an homage to Baroque uh, writer, poet, uh, Giovan Battista Marino. Uh, the uh, cruel beauty and the um, this is a, a um, uh, <coughs> lyrics uh, that uh, has this uh, um, uh, the title variazioni su un tema di belta crudele a variation of it on a theme of cruel beauty i have uh, i don't have the english translation but uh, i think uh, uh, it's possible to understand anyway yeah so they are the uh, topoi of uh, baroque lyrics anyway per rubini o zaffiri miei ghiacciati sospiri per le tue dure labbra per l'orbita in cui allampi si incastona la tua crudezza selvaggia per la manda alabastro che il volante regge del mio cuore fuori fase, legge del mio motore che va fuso, quando il ferode è niente, la materia svalvola. Per la manche di velle, la tua mano che stringe d'acciaio questa corda di chitarra. Per il pompar ferrigno dei circuiti, per cui il mio ottone ovunque si distona, un melodiaro sesso spinge la mia mente di te il bagliore d'ametista, mi scorona. Per il diamante del tuo cuor che incide il cristallo che crolli del mio cielo e squassi e franga questo tenue velo che mi tiene per il diamante acerbo che al colmo qui si incista e tutto fende, è perciò che in te mardi, di sparsi pezzi, fatta di pietre, domina dei marmi, fuoco di pietra che in te scenerisca, fulmine. Grazie.
So as I was saying, now I can hear myself too. The uh, this is uh, I called it a, I call the pheasant a ramified bird because we are really branching, spreading our wings as far as we can, and one of our wings has touched the uh, program called. I don't know whether it's a program or an institution, a related uh, something to the University of Pennsylvania, but everything that you want to know about Penn Sound will be told you in a matter of minutes by Chris Mostaza, who's here with us and is in charge of this archive of poetry read by poets. And I was just told that they are about to uh, include T.S. Eliot's own recordings of his own poetry. So, but I'm sure Chris will tell us much more in details what I pretend to know. And uh, after that, we'll have uh, uh, Fabrizio Bondi, from, uh, formerly from the Scuola, Nazio for, uh, Scuola Normale, and now uh, from Suor Ursula Benincasa, which unfortunately spells out S-O-B. Uh, you can choose whether it's a son of a bitch or sob, 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 as we read in the comic strips. Both is okay, okay. And uh, in any case, he will tell us of an of a incipient project that we call the Wunderkammer, uh, namely a interactive program featuring some of the most important events of uh, 20th century, well, actually, second half of the Novecento poetry in Italy. But without any further ado, since we've been very, very good with time and everything else, I'd like to, you to welcome Chris Mustaza of Penn Sound. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and for inviting me, Luigi. This is, this is, by the way, this is just a little bit of an aside. It's neither here nor there. But I just want to tell you that my parents were so excited when I told them that you invited me because they met at a Baruch College, not at Baruch College, at Lehman College, and you had come to give a lecture there. And they said, you know Luigi Ballerini? I was like, I do. I mean, they see him speak. So, so they were very excited about this. Um, well, hi, everyone. Um, so as Luigi said, um, I'm a co-director of Penn Sound along with Charles Bernstein and Al Filaris. And um, today, I'm going to try to go through relatively quickly because I'd love to be able to have like a conversation with you guys if you have any questions about it to talk about it. But I want to talk a little bit about what Penn Sound is and how people use it and how it kind of forms an intervention into specifically Italian poetry today um, and to talk through that. So um, here's the URL if you have, by, by the way, this is not so much a, of a talk as an ad, it's an advertisement to get you to go to, go to Penn Sound. Your, your talk will commence, will start after this ad. So um, we've, got the, uh, we've got the URL over here. So Penn Sound is the world's largest archive of recordings uh, read by the poets themselves. And it spans all the way currently back to 1913 with recordings of Guillaume Apollinaire. Um, I know a lot about these recordings. Let me know if you want to talk about them. They were recorded in a French speech lab that was interested in dialect. Um, it's a very interesting story. And um, all the way through things that were recorded just the other day at the University of Pennsylvania, elsewhere. This is an ever-growing -grow archive. It's not a static collection. It's not something that, that just kind of sits there, but it, it consistently gets bigger. And just to give you a sense of its size, we're seeing uh, 2.5 million downloads per year uh, from a million unique users. There are, this, these stats are probably a little bit old. We probably have more than this, um, more than 55,000 audio files of poets reading and 6,000 hours of audio. And um, that 6,000 hours of audio is very interesting to me because some of the work that I do is on machine listening and using uh, computational methods to listen to large amounts of poetry and think about what kind of literary uh, theses we could draw from that. We could talk more about that if you want to. But here's just gives you a sense of like the kind of the global access of uh, to Penn Sound. And by the way, our top priority is to get more listeners from Greenland Blue. Um, so if any of you know anyone in Greenland, please tell them to come to the website. And you can see I, I, pulled, uh, I pulled out uh, Italy here so you could take a look. You can see where most of the hits come from. Um, not too surprising. You see the big dots on the big cities and so forth. So in terms of how people use Penn Sound, um, let's start with, um, with close listening. You'll, you'll be familiar with this term from Charles's work. Um, and this is this idea that when we listen to poems, on uh, Penn Sound, what we're doing is it's, it's an analog to close reading, right? It's, uh, I'll talk more about this later, but many people 
uh, everyone in this room, in fact, is very good at analyzing a printed poem. You all could say, why is this word in italics? Or why did the poet break the line in this place? And so forth. But at least in the American university system, very few people teach, pe teach the students how to analyze the sound of a poem, how to say, what does it mean when a poet pauses? What does it mean when there's inflection on a word? Right? And we've heard some incredible poetry recording uh, poet, poems performed over the course of today um, by Tommaso, by, by Charles, by others, where you can't talk about these poems without that performance. Performance is vital to, what, to what's happening. And so for Italian literature, we have the Pensound Italiana section. This is, um, this is edited by Jennifer Scapatone, many of you probably know. And I just, I pulled out her description of it here, where she says, over the course of this ongoing project, uh, to offer a broad sense of the field, filling in substantive gaps in global access, back to that point of access, to Italian poetry, both as written and sonic te text, even within Italian borders, and expanding awareness of its range of practitioners with an emphasis on marginalized and experimental voices of the 20th and 21st centuries. So that right there is kind of like, you're getting the statement of poetics of Penn Sound's aesthetic circumscription, as, um, as uh, Luigi was talking about before. You're not going to see a lot of um, traditional lyricism here. You're going to see more experimental works. Um, and it's an effort and this is one of my favorite sentences. It's an effort, a unique one in our reckoning, to liberate the spectrum of Italian poetry as far as a broad uh, public as possible through audio and video recordings. And those of you, those of you familiar with Italian modernism, you'll immediately latch onto that word liberate. You'll, you'll think uh, parole and libertà, right? Mar Marinetti, this idea of um, how do we, the word set free. And I'll talk a little bit about Marinetti today um, and specifically about recordings of, of Marinetti. So I just wanted to give you a sense of it, I've pulled out uh, one one poem, and this is, by the way, is, is a huge collection. There, are, there are probably over over a hundred poems in the in this Penn Sound Italiana section, and constantly growing. But this is one of my favorites. Um, th this poem, um, Sal Peter or, or uh, Sal Nitro, by uh, Mili Graffi, and this I'm drawn to this for a number of reasons. Um, let me play a sample of it for you. This was this was recorded. Uh, in 1976 for RAI, and this is from the, uh, the collection we were talking about. Sal Nitro, operetta di poesia sonora di Milli Graffi. I love this for a lot of reasons. I remember the first time I heard this, I said, as before, I, before I knew any of the background, I said, she has to be a big fan of Kurt Schwitters. Kurt Schwitters is one of my favorites. And then I, I found this quote here, uh, this is from Jennifer, um, from uh, Mili Graffi, where she says, I understood what my sound poem could be when I listened to Kurt Schwitters or Sonata, recited by Giuliano Zossi. Half an hour of uninterrupted, pressurized vocalizations, strongly rhythmical and exemplary, for me, it was the path of the first avant-garde, and one that had to depart from there. An absurd tercet of hen, hen decasyllables came to my mind in a flash, and I prepared a rigorous plan of fragmentation defined on every page of the score with tempos and directions for vocal execution. Invited to take part in the audio box broadcast directed by Pinotto Fava, I realized the 18 minutes of saltpeter in the REI studios of Rome in the three days of rehearsal with the technologies of that time. And so, so many interesting things from there. So first, she encounters the poem not by Schwitters, but as a performance of somebody who, um, who knew the Schwitters poem. Now there's a question, I, I don't know the answer to this, did that person ever hear the poem, or were they working from the score? Because for those of you who know, the, the Orsonata is a sprawling score of, of sounds. And um, here we have the opportunity to actually hear um, Kurt Schwitters perform it. I, though, did not pick the Kurt Schwitters reporting. I picked a, his son Ernst performing it, um, because for the longest time, uh, people thought that this was Kurt Schwitters, and there is so much academic debate over, is it Kurt Schwitters, is it not, for, for years and years, and it turned out uh, it was not. But I actually think it's a better performance. So, um, so this, is his, this is his son, Ernst. I'm going I'm to play it alongside. These are not in Urlaut. 
Italian's a little bit rusty. Can anybody translate that from German to Italian for me, please? <laughs> so you see, like one of the things, I, I give this to the students in my class. I love giving this to them. They, they're instantly frustrated by it, and then we talk about it. One of the things happening here is, you know, we're dealing with extra lexical sounds. We're dealing with um, what Charles, what I've learned from Charles is prelingual sounds in a way. We could think about how does this take us back to the moment of language acquisition. And the broader question, can you make up a language? Can you make up sounds? Um, or are you always kind of shaped by the languages that you know? Um, in the Schwitters, you can hear German words kind of coming out of these like primordial speech sounds and so forth. And you get this kind of connection between, between the two pieces. What I want to highlight mostly is that pen sound is a platform, it's a publishing medium. These works, very hard to find a home for these pieces in, um, at least in America, in commercial media. Um, and this is, this is pretty much the primary publishing medium for them. If you want to hear Kurt Schwitters, you have to go to pen sound. That's, that's we have it there. We have the whole collection. So that's a bit about sound poetry and that. Um, oh, sorry, we're going to listen to Kurt again. That's no problem. Um, so that was, talk a little bit about close listening, what we can do with that. Um, I'm going to take you a little bit farther afield. This is a little bit weird now. This is, I apologize for getting weird. So this is, um, this is a technology that I've worked on. Um, if, if you're interested in it, my article is in Digital Humanities Quarterly on this. It's called uh, Machine-Aided Close Listening. And I was really interested in to what degree a machine, uh, technological prostheses, if we will, visualizations, could help us encounter sounded poetry in a new way, it could help us to listen to the poem, could help us to access things that were maybe we missed in our initial readings. Um, so we built this tool, I'll, give you, I'll show you here, I'm going to jump over. Um, which is the, the machine-aided close listening tool. And this is, I don't have any, uh, unfortunately, I don't yet have any Italian poems in this, but I'm going to show you uh, Robert Creeley's I Know a Man, which was actually very influential for some contemporary Italian poets. Um, and I'll just play you this. What we're going to see is an alignment between the text of the poem, um, the, and these red lines are the pitch of Creeley's voice moving up and down, and you can see the waveform, which gives us a sense of intensity or loudness, um, if you will. And then we've got this tempo column here. So, you, so these are how quickly or how slowly are these lines read relative to the rest of the poem. So I'll just play this for you. One other wise, I know a man, as I said to my friend, because I am always talking, John I said, which was not his name, the darkness surrounds us. What can we do against it, or else shall we? And why not buy a goddamn big car? Drive, he said, for Christ's sake, look out where you're going. <laughs> or this, this is one last of these. He's still going. Uh, you hear how he stops at the end of every line? As I said to my friend, because I am always talking. There's a funny story behind that where he's very influenced by the, uh, William Carlos Williams, but he had never heard Williams read, and he assumed that Williams stopped at the end of every line, but Williams actually does not stop at the end of every line. Um, it's, it turns out that Williams' poetry is much more visual than it is um, oral in that way. So Creeley has this reading style that's based on an imagination of what his favorite poet read, the way that they read. So I was interested in that in creating this tool. So. This gives you a sense of these qualities that we were talking about before. You know, on the printed page, we could talk about lineation. We could talk about spacing. Um, with the sounded poem, how can we start to talk about those things? Like, could we say, why is this line read faster than the others? Um, you know, there could be, a, you know, so-called diegetic reasons, right? You could say that, um, you know, he's taking us into the poem quickly. Or there could be uh, non-diegetic reasons. You could say he just got up to the microphone, he's nervous, you start reading a little faster at first before you slow down. But we could talk about it. We could say, why, why is that the case? 
And then the next version of the tool, which I'll just show you slowly or quickly here, is um, this is meant to compare multiple versions of a performance of a poem. Um, one of the pitfalls I think we can get into with audio texts is to treat them as a written text um, in being singular or, fi or, or finite and saying, you know, this is the authoritative version of, of William's reading. But of course, it's not true, right? There are many performances. They're all different. And one of the things that I was interested in with this is, are there commonalities across the performances? Um, are there ways that Williams phrases the poem the same way every time he reads it? And if so, and that's what the shading is here, the, the darker the shading is, he always will carve out this phrase in time. Um, over, or more, more commonly, the darker the shading is. So eventually we'll get to this, which they cannot express. Which they cannot express. Let's see, no, we're going slow. Okay, it's running a little bit slowly, but you get the idea. Um, so we could ask the question of, if Williams always carves out these words in space every time he does it, can we access these sort of oral phrasal units, as I call them, or these these units of the poem that are endemic to the poem that you might not that might not jump out at you on the printed page. And so this is really about that sort of comparative approach to to close listening. Um, so those are those are just some of the tools that um, that I had been working on. And I want to talk just a little bit about these pitch curves that we were talking about. This is. This is leading into some of the work that I'm that I'm working on now, and and have been given some talks. I'm actually headed to Paris right after this to talk about this, which I'm really excited about. Um, but what can you do with these pitch curves? You know, who cares? Who cares that the, the voice goes like this and like whatever? Um, and one of the things that I'm interested in is that these pitch curves connect poets' performances to other kinds of performance. It connects them to. Um, religious sermons. Certain sermons have certain pitch curves to them. It connects them to uh, comedy monologues. Comedy monologues can have a certain look. And so if it connects them in that way, if we can say T.S. Eliot performs these lines like a sermon, we, could, we have a new dimension of sonic form. We could, we could ask the question, what does it mean for these Eliotic lines to be sermonic? That's something that you're not going to get on the printed page and that is um, is really coming out of the data of this in a lot of ways, treating poetry as data. And I gave a talk at the MLA last year on uh, Marinetti. You know, just, um, have you guys ever heard these recordings of Marinetti before? These are really, they're really something. Um, so this is, this is a recording from um, April 30th, 1924. And an important note here, by the way, is that this is the same year that radio starts to become introduced um, to Italy. So um, when you, this is actually a little bit before that. And he reads a, a very strange poem called uh, Definizione di Futurismo, which is, ends up being like an amalgam. I, to the best of my knowledge, I haven't seen it printed the way he performs it in this way anywhere. Um, he pulls from the Futurist Manifesto, which I, here, uh, obviously the front page of Le Figaro, 1909. Um, he pulls from other works and he makes this sort of, this thing. I'll play it for you. Il futurismo è un grande movimento antifilosofico e anticulturale idee, intuiti, stinti, pugni, calci, zappi, specchiatori, purificatori, innovatori e velocizzatori creato il 20 febbraio 1909 da un gruppo di poeti e artisti italiani geniali. Tra le tante definizioni io predico quella data dai giovani. So I played this recording in my class for my students. Now, none of my students speak Italian, so that was the point, right? So I just played this, said, what do you guys think of this? Right? So they listened and they thought about it for a while. Of course, they couldn't get the semantics of it. And one of the students raised his hand. I never forget this. I use, like in all, I use this in my writing all the time. I just think about it. And he said, um, so after that listen, listening to that recording, I have no idea what that guy said but I agree with him. <laughs> and I was very, like, I, I mean, so, like, very funny, but very powerful, right? Like, how many times in life do we, you know, political speeches and so forth, you know, is there a situation happening where most people are saying, I have no idea what that guy freaking said, but I agree with him, right? And so, like, that to me became a powerful idea, and I started to think, you know what? Marinetti is performing in the mode 
of a kind of political speech here. It's, this is, of course, manifesto political speech that kind of go together, but it's specific. It's not just any political speech. Um, the, these are early fascist era balcony speeches, right? And that's why I say the radio, because like this, these, these speeches would later be broadcast over the radio, but the sound of them is shaped by trying to boom over a crowd, right? Like the way I'm speaking to you now, I have a microphone. I don't have to talk that loud. You know, I can speak quietly. You guys can hear me. We can have a very intimate conversation. These are not that, right? These are these kind of, these booming sounds, and it's shaped by the space. And um, so I went on to write about this a bit, and you can actually see it. We don't actually have to, like, go through the, the math of it, but you can see it in the pitch curves. I'll play you later. <laughs> All right, so he's, he's going, he's, he's enumerating everything he's against there, um, muse museums, uh, archives, and the worst, professors. Looking at you guys. Um, so, as he, so as he goes through, so you can actually see that connection to these kinds of recorded <laughs> speeches. And as... Um, as the radio becomes a dominant mode of propaganda at the time, this, I don't know if you've ever seen one of these, this is a, a Radio Rurale, which was um, used in uh, the south of Italy, of, of Italy, Calabria, Puglia, and so forth, because it was difficult to reach these areas with other kinds of propaganda, the thought being you could go over the air. Um, there was also a radio station uh, run out of Bari in Puglia called uh, Radio Bari, which was um, propaganda for colon colonized northern Italy. It was actually used in many ways to try to um, churn up uh, to try to aggravate Italy's enemies and so forth in the area. So the radio becomes, as you know, this, I'm not saying anything groundbreaking here, the, the radio becomes a mode of uh, a, a wartime mode, the technology. But we start to see the bridge out to poetry and how poetry, especially problematic poetry like Marinetti's, um, technologically and in their very performance are sitting on this line. So um, these are just a couple of you know, a couple of bullet points, so much more to say about them. But they're all possible because of Penn Sound, because Penn Sound acts as a kind of infrastructure to give us access to these recordings, to either listen to them closely, to do machine-aided close listening, to do um, full-on machine listening. And, um, you know, we have many programs that use Penn Sound in various ways. Jack Two magazines, our magazine of poetry criticism, maybe you've seen, uh, Poem Talk, our podcast, and so forth. And we hope you guys will uh, check out Penn Sound, that you use it in your classes, um, tell your students about it, and so forth. So uh, that's what I have to say about it. I don't know if you guys have any questions or you want to talk about any of this. Anyway. I would guess, do you think like a dozen, Charles? Yeah, I mean, it's primarily English language, so. Primarily, mm-hmm. You, you might mention what you're doing in France, as that other people are interested in these archives for themselves, including Italy, right? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, like, more more archives are coming around in, in this way. The conference I'm going to is um, called uh, uh, Le, uh, Le Archive. Uh, Le Archives Sonore de la Poésie, uh, sa sound, uh, sound Archives of Poetry. And um, people are coming from different, this is, I've gone to this conference a bunch of times, it's really fantastic. So um, I'm on a panel with um, uh, Valentina Colonna, I don't know if any of you know her, she's a really fantastic Italian scholar. She's, uh, I think, at Torino, um, and she works on the, the overlap between uh, phonetics and poetic performance, uh, which is a bit of what I work on as well. So a lot of work happening there in France, in, in Germany. Um, I've given talks on this in, in uh, Berlin at the Freie Universität, Max Planck. Yeah. Yes, got a question. Uh, uh, yes, um, I um, ask myself if uh, I think it's not uh, for uh, every poem in the archive, but uh, you have f f uh, from for uh, a certain amount of poetry the possibility to uh, read the text mm -hmm. that score and uh, uh, to hear the sound in the at, at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it oh, you, oh, you mean like the the machine edited close listing that we were looking at? Yeah, yeah. So that that was um, that was a project I worked on with my research assistant. It was very laborious to do that. Like there there are ways to do it. Uh, I think that with more automated artificial intelligence ways. But at the time, like we wanted to get it exactly right. So we didn't. We wanted to have it aligned perfectly. We wanted to have everything work. So like um, I I can't articulate how many of uh, 
my research assistance hours went into yeah. <laughs> kind of <laughs> set that up. Yeah. yeah, but but in but in the end, it's very interesting to kind of see that that alignment. It's wonderful this uh, machine aided uh, close listening. It's wonderful machine. Uh, it's an old an old dream of mine. Uh, when I when I made the uh, radio um, radio in uh, the beginning of, <laughs> of the century, mm -hmm. uh, I noted that uh, the the I made a series of uh, transmission in Italy or AI uh, with the voices of ancient poems, oh, ancient poets, ancient uh, of the, the beginning of the century. Mm -hmm commentated by the new poets. The new poets were Sanguinetti, Zanzotto, Giudici, <laughs> Pagliarani, etc. But uh, the, the, the interesting was to, to make the editing because uh, mm -hmm. they used a machine with the curves mm -hmm. of the voice, mm -hmm. the portrait, the, the form of the voice. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time you uh, make a, a portrait of the voice of the poet. Yeah. That's a, a, a wonderful, uh, a wonderful landscape for research, but also for appreciating aesthetically this yes. this one. It's it's, it's wonderful. It's it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. No, absolutely. And that was actually going back to the early 20th century, as you know. This was a um, this was a sort of obsession of many scientists, which was to graphically vi visualize the poem. So I, I mentioned the Apollinaire recordings before. Uh, those came from the Sorbonne in 1913, and they were made by uh, Labbé Jean-Pierre Rousselot, and who ran it. One of he was he's called the father of experimental phonetics. And his machine, he actually brought Pound into Ezra Pound into his speech lab. And he put like a tube up Pound's nose and he like taped something to his neck or something. And he had Pound read his poems. And it etched them to this smoke blackened paper. And it made these like beautiful visualizations, but they can't be played back. They're just, they're just pictures of it. Um, and you know, the, the why of it was always so interesting. Like he, he wanted to, he wanted to prove that um, you could see the musicality of poetry, and here's how you would do it. And Pound wanted to prove, you guys know this phrase maybe from Pound, compose not in the sequence of the metronome, compose, compose in the musical phrase. Pound wanted to show that you could have music outside of you know, traditional metrical forms and so forth. So you get this weird collaboration where the end is just this beautiful visualization of the poem. Uh, and I noted, per, for example, to, to, to make an example in Italian contemporary poetry, uh, in, the, in, the, in the histories of literature, uh, Caproni and Bertolucci were on the same side. But if you study the curves of the voice, yeah. they were in the opposite yeah. sides, because uh, Caproni was a musician, mm -hmm. musician by formation, and uh, it's all staccato. Every every word is every syllable is staccato, and Bortolucci is yeah. Bo -bo 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 -bo. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the. I didn't show it today, but like in the um, one of the machine aided close listenings is um, is Robert Frost. I did here. And, you know, Frost, Frost couldn't be ostensibly farther afield from what we're talking about today, which is you know kind of experimental forms. Except eh, it's not working. Oh well. Oh, I think I fell off the internet. Anyway, but the point is, with, with Frost, um, I actually think he's way more modern than he's given credit for in certain poems. If you look at like his writings, they're very conservative. Like he says, like you know, free verse poetry is like playing tennis with the net down. What a, what a terrible thing to say, right? But like, but if you actually look at his poems, he's he's doing the voices the same way that Eliot is. Like his performances are very Eliotic in that sense. So to your point, I think that these sound recordings can totally unsettle the way that people like encounter these poems. Thank you so much for this talk. I'm in love with Penn Sound. I've been for a while and I uh, use it a lot to teach. And I love the fact that basically, especially because there is an Italiana page, like you can really assign poems by Amelia Rosselli to students who don't read Italian, mm -hmm. who are able to read, uh, mm -hmm. even if they don't know the language. And they make points that are actually scholarly mm -hmm. about the poems without being able to, to understand the language. Right? Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, um, this is a bit of a boring question, but uh, a lot of times my students uh, really get obsessed with this kind of, of analysis. And they, 
um, and they do papers and they do stuff that is very intuitive in a way. And then they see that on the English side there are this kind of actually like very um, sophisticated um, tools of analysis. Um, what can I advise them to do? Like um, there is a, you know, there's a lot of scholarship, for instance, about Amelia Rosselli and sound, and it's very intuitive, and it's not, you, you, don't, you don't see people doing analysis of actual pitch mm -hmm. or of prosody, which in the case of Rosselli, you know, it's really like inspired by, um, by music, by specific kinds of music, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What is the kind of, like, if I have a student who is interested in this stuff, mm -hmm. or if I want to apply for a grant and, and, and train myself, mm -hmm. um, what should I study? Is this phonetics? Is this, uh, and also like what kind of digital humanities skills one needs uh, to be able to make a point that is actually publishable about this stuff? Because on the intuitive side, it's amazing. On the cultural side, it's amazing. I wonder, I really want to know what yeah. you have to do. That's a, that's a great question. Um, so I want to say that uh, first and foremost, I think your students' intuitive readings are probably right. You know, they're probably more right than anything the machine can do. Yeah, and like I, I always tell people, the most sophisticated machine we have is a human ear. You know, in, in many ways. Um, and and I teach my students the same way. My, like especially in intro poetry class, my favorite question is what does this sound like to you? Um, and I really love when I get, there's a TikTok video, and you know, Elliot sounds like this TikTok video, or, or there's a YouTube, or there's an ad, or whatever. Because then we can have a conversation about like, how does this piece fit into this, this current moment. In terms of the broader skills, we're kind of in like a very strange territory here. Of, there are, very, there are a, few, a few people who work on this, but it's phonetics is, um, and linguistics are the kinds of the pitch analysis stuff. But one of the things that um, is tough is that in the English departments, we, we have such a good view of aesthetics and so forth. And in linguistics, they have the ability to do these empirical moves. But there's not a lot of, there's no aesthetics in linguistics. At, at Penn, linguistics is a natural science. You know, there, it's not there. So my work is very interdisciplinary, trying to kind of put the two together. Um, and so I, a lot of my students who come to work with me are neuroscience majors or linguistics majors, also English majors. And I try to kind of like, my dream is when people like can do both. They, they learn everything. So I would say uh, check out the work of Mark Lieberman. Uh, he's, a great, um, he's a great linguist at Penn. Um, his work is fantastic. Uh, Mart MacArthur, uh, she developed a tool to do this, which you can just use online. It's called uh, Drift. Um, and you can upload files, and it'll draw the pitch curves for you. And so you don't need to do, like, get it this level of stuff. Um, and I would just say just get in there and just, you know, just kind of empirical impressionism, if you will. Like, get in there, look at the pitch curves, see what it looks like to you. Um, and, you know, and, and go from there. Um, my, my new book that I'm working on is called... Um, doing voices, modernism, sonic genres, and it's, each chapter is dedicated to um, poets performing in the modes of, I say, a comic monologue or a political radio speech or other things, and just trying to call the question of, can we resituate modernism, not through thematically or not through the printed text, but through the ear? What, what does modernism sound like? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Presentations. Um, it's very important to uh, realize that uh, often poets talk to poets and critics talk to critics, and the critic is someone who critics or criticizes the critics. But um, we'd like to assume that poetry is a language that needs to be uh, approached uh, in all kinds of by, by all kinds of readers. Uh, they, of course, should be equipped and should be trained. You know, you can't just dive into a poem, and especially if it's irrelational, irreverential, and hopefully find a meaning to it. Uh, so my idea was to see how people can relate to poetry that are not necessarily poets themselves. And I have invited philosophers and uh, who have expressed interest in poetry. And therefore, uh, unfortunately, one of them came down with COVID, but so did we all, I suppose. And the four have become three. I don't know whether we'll be able to connect with uh, Franca D'Agostini, who um, actually was the source of my curiosity when she came to Casa 
to, to Associazione di Poesia a Milano, and she presented a paper about the logics of and in poetry and uh, debunked the notion that we all have grown up with, that is to say, the irrationality of it, et cetera, et cetera. But as I said, there are very many approaches. Oh, there she is. Ah, oh, fantastic. Maybe, scusa, Tom, can you move just a little? Uh, we managed. How are you feeling? Are you OK? Yeah. Uh, OK, good. OK, so I won't. Um, not so. Any further ado, I'll. I'll uh, not, uh, I'm not uh, perfectly well, but any kind. Good enough, uh, good enough to read. Um, OK. I'm here. I'm here for now. Okay. All right, so I think you'll speak first then, uh, because I know it's late in Italy and uh, you want oh, to... Oh, well, uh, in fact, uh, I'd like to, to listen to other people, but, uh, uh, but uh, in fact, uh, I'm not so well, so it is better I conclude very briefly my, my presentation of... Uh, uh, very few things uh, that I'd like uh, to say, uh, and that's all. If it's good for you, yeah, okay? it's okay. It's okay with us. I think you should uh, do just that. Okay. And, and, uh, okay. Uh, so I want to summarize uh, what I write. I wrote for you in the paper uh, about logic and politics and uh, poetry. And uh, the title, uh, possibly uh, you remember, is uh, uh, <coughs> Recapture, okay? Uh, preliminary for an inquiry about uh, logic and poetry. And uh, in the text, I have presented uh, a very simple argument. Uh, and now I want to summarize it. Uh, in uh, six uh, simple points. Uh, the first point uh, is that language has power. In fact, we are used to thinking that language is uh, power, but in fact, language has power, and it has uh, two uh, basic form. Uh, well, it has power in the two basic forms of power. That is uh, uh, power to, uh, which is disposition, and uh, power over, uh, that is domination. Okay. Um, language, uh, very put very simply, uh, language makes... Uh, um, helps uh, us uh, think uh, in a certain way and not in others, in certain ways and not in others. Uh, it, it makes us uh, think uh, certain things and not others, and which means uh, it has uh, the two typical forms of powers dominion and disposition. Now, um, the second point is that logic, second point regards uh, the conception of logic, uh, which uh, can be useful for uh, dealing with the poetry, in my view. Uh, and it is uh, the idea that logic deals uh, with the, the second form of power of language. Uh, that is, uh, mm, uh, and more specifically, it deals uh, with uh, the semantic constraint uh, uh, in the two sense, again, <laughs> again, in the two senses of semantics uh, as uh, uh, intended, uh, well, the constant coming from meaning from the simple meaning of a reference meaning and uh, or more specifically what I've called aboutness of the words uh, of language uh, and uh, the 
um, constraint uh, coming from uh, um, from truth. Uh, they are different, uh, even if of religiously deeply connected. Well, the third point uh, regards poetry. Um, poetry uh, is not uh, directly concerned by truth and uh, allegedly it is not even concerned with an interested in or submitted to meaning. And so um, poetry, um, it is uh, generally or sort uh, assumed, uh, it's generally assumed that poetry is uh, um, Free anarchic in a sense, while uh, and this uh, it is a deep uh, uh, and there is so a deep difference uh, with respect to logic, which is uh, indicatively or ideally normative uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, forced within the limits of validity. Okay, that is not exact. Uh, uh, especially for what concern uh, contemporary logic. Um, um, logic in general is not so uh, um, uniformly normative, uh, or rather there is pluralism in logic, there are non-classical, paraconsistent, subclassical logics, uh, and and which means that there is a variety of logic, of normativity uh, identified in logic. And the, the second aspect uh, that I wanted to stress is that uh, poetry is not uh, so anarchic in a certain respect, uh, because uh, poets, uh, uh, just like uh, any uh, artist, uh, are submitted uh, to rules, uh, the rules and constraints uh, of uh, their own language uh, and of language in general. Well, this is the third point. Uh, the, um, the fourth point is that so given the challenge is to discover the logics of poetry or rather to see what happens uh, to poetry when we look at it uh, with the eyes of logic, uh, with the point of view of uh, logicians uh, or uh, from the perspective, from the logical perspective. And now uh, mm, we see uh, that this means uh, to find the the universal rules. This is a bit uh, demanding requirement, but uh, I think it is the only thing that we can say. We need to find, if you want to really uh, speak uh, of logics of poetry, uh, we should uh, identify the universal rules uh, um, that poets, all poets, are forced to respect whether they like it or not. Um, well, the fifth idea or proposal is uh, that uh, this challenge, uh, uh, well, should be addressed, should be tackled. Uh, but uh, um, I, I say, I think that you may accept my point uh, in the paper and, um, uh, and the idea is that poetry is especially submitted to um, the mechanism that I call a recapture which is simply, very simply, uh, the fact that, re, um, that meaning and truth uh, survive the, the, any attempt 
to destroy them one and or the other and so language is some in some sense uh, uh, an, ex, an indefinitely extensible uh, object uh, as uh, Michael Dammert once put it and um, mm, if you want and in a sense uh, there is a sort uh, of a thrown away key uh, um, in the sense that when you uh, when you uh, have a word, uh, when you create a word, uh, the thing disappear. You lost the, the you lose the thing. And uh, when uh, you try to cancel the world word uh, to regain the thing, um, you have another word. Again, so the mechanism uh, is uh, again uh, the same. Uh, there is the recapture, the re and this is the recapture of language. Well, uh, um, the sixth point, and uh, it is my conclusion, is uh, that poetry, in a sense, can be defined as one of uh, the languages. Um, located at the border of language. The borders of language in the sense, uh, in this uh, recapturing sense. Um, in as far as I can say, <clears throat> poetry is what continually plays uh, with the, the mechanism of uh, overcoming the overcoming, uh, which is uh, typical of uh, uh, of uh, um, of the language, of our relationship with the language, um, and the poetry uh, deals with it in a variety of ways. Sometimes confirming the power of language and uh, reviving it, uh, reviving the constraints of the meaning and truth. Some other times uh, destroying meaning and truth, but at the same time, uh, re, uh, uh, be uh, exposed to, uh, to face uh, the, the return of meaning and truth in other forms. And uh, <clears throat> um, sometimes uh, I also want to say the, the game is played uh, by an apparent refusal um, of language, uh, of meaning and truth, and say uh, by using mere sound. Uh, but uh, the simple fact is that this is intendedly a po poetry reproposed uh, the mechanism. Um, in a word, the recapture, as I can see it, uh, is uh, a distinctive and a universal logic of poetry without plural. You have uh, you wrote logics of poetry. I think there is one logic. Logic uh, is, uh, in my view, I'm not so pluralistic about logic. And in, in fact, I'm not so pluralistic about logic. And in my view, especially as far as we uh, speak uh, um, of uh, uh, applied logic, uh, we should be very monistic, uh, in a sense. Um, well, the logic of poetry is thus the indefinite survival of um, meaning and truth, even when uh, idly 
supposedly both are destroyed and forgotten and uh, uh, omitted and uh, or uh, refused. That's all. I, I, I don't know if all this can be useful and sorry for because I'm not at the best of my of my expressive possibilities. Sorry. That's okay. Anyway, uh, I think we, I want I appreciate uh, the I effort. promised uh, Luigi to be um, with you and so I wanted to to be present in a way. We appreciate the effort, Franca. Thank you so much. Oh, oh sorry. Okay. I, ju I just wanted to thank you for the effort you made, and uh, we look forward to better times when uh, COVID uh, will stop raising its ugly head, and uh, we can all be together and uh, continue the conversation. But now, thank you again. And we'll talk soon. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. We can resume our work. If you gentlemen don't mind coming back here. Intentional gap. <laughs> okay. You can turn the light down. Oh, I'm sorry. The light. Okay. Okay. La luce del is too much. Make any difference, or you, Paul, you may want to start. <coughs> like everyone else here, I have to begin by thanking Luigi Ballerini, uh, who has really worked harder than he should have had to to seduce me to be here. So I'm very grateful that he put that effort into it. I've learned a great deal and benefited a great deal from hearing so much language, even though my training in my mother's Italian has faded away. Um, most significantly, though, to make a point, I am not a philosopher. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, <laughs> which I think matters here. Uh, the reason some seduction was necessary was because I first saw the paper the abstract of which, or the summary of which we've just heard from Franca D'Agostini, and I said to Luigi, I have nothing to say in this context no. um, for various reasons. So uh, since I'm not trained as a philosopher, and since I have recently written about the inappropriate relationship or attempt by philosophy to appropriate poetry, I'm going to step away from your agreed topic or announced topic and with Luigi's permission, talk about some of the things I've been doing with poetry, including recently in the, uh, the new book uh, from Harvard, Love's Shadow. This doesn't really have a title. It is uh, part of my reflections on, a, on another set of books. One of my long thought questions in my career has been to understand what is the critic. But in this case, I've tried to understand it in relation to what is the poet. So I begin this way. The critic is always in a secondary position to the poet. But this secondary, this is a, for the philosophers in the crowd, a lesson in humility. The critic is always in a secondary position to the poet, but this secondariness is not an inferior position. The proper critical service to poetry and poetry, poetics 
obligates the critic to a version of imaginative intellect different from but closely related to the graceful poiesis of the poet. The critic serves without derogation the mix, mixing of intellect and imagination in poetry to overmaster the poet, poetry and poiesis, is sinful betrayal that condemns the fallen critic to the hell of conversation. I will say a little about three terms, obligates, graceful poiesis, and overmaster. The first and third of these should help with sinful betrayal and conversation. Hell asks for little attention. Altogether, we might catch a glimpse of imaginative intellect. Obligates stands there asking for a theoretician or a philologist, even perhaps for a comedian's riff. Worse, it might lure them and us, and so us, into the law and theological, philosophical, or conventional morals. To escape, let us look at or listen to obligation. It's a quotation I think you will all recognize. What's most radical about Vereznikov's testimony, I'm now quoting Charles Bernstein, is the kind of reading his method makes possible. Testimony is numbing, but this experience of being numbed is the place not where aesthetic experience ends, but where it begins. He does not turn away from aesthetics, but rather shifts the aesthetic frame from the content, that words in quotations, content to the reading experience itself. That's the essay, the pic picture intentionally left blank. Moralists, by contrast, will insist on the content or content not the practice or the art. They will insist, the moralists, on the obligation not to turn away from content. But the poet critic can read, think, and write, whereas the moralists are naive instruments, products of the forces that appear as content, which they think aesthetics can store in a sort of nicety. The content of testimony is the elision of linguistic excess endlessly regenerated by the unstoppable machine of legal diagnosis and assignment, the bureaucratic record of criminal inscription. The persons caught, the, the society that catches the language routinized in repetitive torrents of incarceration, all these irredeemable invite mourning and so cries or indifferent silence. Redemption and aesthetic transformation are off the table. Commodification is the normal well-paved path, the one versified by the same forces that create the irredeemable. Stories of redemption, which palliate guilt or amuse indifference, which alert emotions otherwise inert before content or before content without commodity, these are what we normally find. Wallace Stevens, under whose sign we meet today, says that a poem is not a success until others accept the poet's imagination as an alternative to the real. This is in The Noble Writer. Poiesis does not confuse content for the real. For poetry, the real includes the forces that makes the content, and those forces extensions as the normalities, the habituations, the cultures that keep them in place, visible in the frames that make them familiar and readable. To keep with Stevens, then, poetic Poetic obligation is to create alternatives to the real, to the forces that obscure both art and the real, that safely turn us to content, content, so we can obligingly lie in the language of conversation. Bernstein says Reznikov's conceptual use of sound, found language forces a change in our reading or leaves us with history unreadable. Reznikov here is a name for poesis, that turns us toward what Stevens calls a new knowledge of reality. If Reznikov delivers Stevensian success, his art is an aversion to the pressures that create horror or indifference and induce silence or conversation. The poet is obligate to the real as the source of alternatives to it. This is the way it must be. The poet is, found, is bound. Poiesis is not permissive, no matter how fertile the poet's various faculties. Oasis does not enact. The poet's obligation is not legal, moral, or dependent. Poetry and poems are not transactional. They are not profitable, and we might debate if they are valuable. I leave the question of logic aside. Poets persist within the biometrics of the real. 
and as poet critics express the invention of their own technical achievements, especially denying the value and possibility of invention, especially vis-a-vis -vis the particular barbaric real in our histories or their histories. Reznikov's testimony works because its irredeemable content is within reach of the poet's technique, which an attempted repetition becomes a barrier to poesis that must discard it. I quote again, Holocaust, this is Bernstein once more, Holocaust overwhelms the techniques. He cannot get, an, that is Reznikov, cannot get an effective or legitimate distance from the content in writing. He needs to change voice from world embracing to anger, defiance, and comic glee, from writing to sound, voiced contempt liberates. This is what it means to be obligate, inseparable from the real, but particular in nature and function as its alternative. The critic can explain the success and failure of technique, but the critic must exposit art as the alternative to the real from which it cannot secede. The critic is not obligate like the poet, the critic is rather in the real to which the poet is obligate. Whatever the critic it is, is, it is by inescapable attention to the situation poiesis occupies. Criticism is an after effect, or if you prefer, in honor of Charles's new book, it's an echo of poiesis, a secondary quality of making, a quality inevitably responsive not only to alternatives, but the entire cosmos so created within and against the real. Alert, we might say, alert, we might say, to how this process produces the reality which we know as history. If we can secularize the word, we can say the critic is an effect of grace. Now, St. Augustine prays to God, and I quote Augustine now in English, guard me with the power of your grace here and in all places. Augustine also has a Stevensian image for grace. This again is uh, Augustine from this time the Confessions. Will is to grace as the horse is to the rider. Now religion might make this moralism. Theology would debate free will and determinism. Note, however, that Augustine does not ask for the grace of God as a gift. He asks God to guard him with the power of his grace. Also from Augustine, the last quotation, grace alone brings about every good work in us. For this moment, a simple equation will do. The critic is an after effect of poiesis and grace. Scholars have said that art is a secularized form of religion. Meyer Abrams, Mario Prats, and others made books of this idea. What if, however, grace is a trope of poiesis, an appropriation of the human making of good works by the powers of religious thinking and institutional power? Along these lines of reestablishing priority, the poet is the location where grace resides, that is, where poiesis does its essential work of creating the real and its alternatives. The crit critic's secondariness lies within the project of grace. I am trying to approach fundamentals of force and will. Just, in just as Reznikov changes the pitch in reading Holocaust so that by the grace of sound he creates contempt and liberates us from horrible silence, so Bernstein separates grace from will, echoing Augustine, and now I quote Charles again, we don't earn it, but it is forever ever there for us, language. It doesn't matter, that's the end of the quote, it doesn't matter, says the critic, what the poet chooses to say is ever there. It doesn't matter what the poet chooses to say is ever there. Grace, language, sound. What matters is the poet's existence as the embodied agent of poiesis, as the place in the species where the imaginative intellect lives and works. Tradition knows the echoing permanence of poetic grace. Consider the founding myth, Orpheus, shielded by the grace of gods to descend to hell, charming death, but as always failing at redemption, yet always left singing, a head, a brain, a voice, a mouth, song, and according to the myth, others save the essential, this essential fragment of Orpheus, even when the Maenads tear him apart or Zeus blasts him, these others are critics. Conversation and sinful betrayal uh, are close friends. I want to thank uh, Marco, whom I have not really properly met for his performance earlier today because it convinced me of some of this again. Conversation and sinful betrayal are close friends. 
Sound is grace, Bernstein wrote, imagining new works and new media. We can hear a saving grace in Bernstein here, since we know full well corporate and state power dominate the new media, but he knows voice will sing even adrift on the current of those forces. But ever the comedian, once again we're in the shadow of Stevens, Bernstein says how the head came to sing alone, just as a body part on someone else's stream. Sound is grace and forever there plentifully, and I quote again, plentifully, quote, as the social material dimension of human language, end quote. The utopianism of such high tone speech, the social material dimension of human language, the utopianism of such high tone speech deserves the mockery that comes with a change in the pitch, the sail, the tone, and the turn. Next line, quote, its fleece was white as snow, end quote. So how innocent of us to believe in this plentitude's permanent presence? It's been said before, and we have the horrors. So the mockery of white snow makes us realize our conversational assurances with their comforting packaging of concept and category. The mockery, the mock, makes us feel the instability of the statement or belief that it's always there. For the poet is also always there, even in the most basic and long-standing forms, to remind us that there are alternatives even to the assurances on offer, even as the mockeries that decry our desires for surety. Quote, we don't earn it. The grace is out there doing all this, the promise and mockery, which is itself the originality of music within the whole. Content, content, as packaged, given and taken away, with the assurance the poet sings and laughs, bitterly, but with original innocence. For just a moment, the poet become critic seems to have joined the conversation. But it was all the trick of art. Call it comedy. The essay's theater turning the readers and the work back toward the world, hopefully now resident in the mind. To see what happens when poet takes on conversation, see Bernstein's peacefully entitled The Pataquarial Imagination in which, among other things, an echo of Beckett's trilogy, a mountainous entanglement of conversations about poetry, language, politics, theory, and so on, run not loose, but into victories and words that hold their, their space. So in the, critic of this, in the spirit of this critic's ghost, let me cite one exemplary instance of victory over conversation. This is typical, Charles. This is a multiple set of quotations within quotations. So we begin with a triple quotation. Dickinson's, and now another quotation, meaning, comma, triple quotes, close, single quotes, says Michaels, meaning Walter Ben Michaels, is aligned with triple quotes again, grace rather than word, works, end of that quotation, which doesn't sound, this is now Bernstein, which doesn't sound kosher to me, but then we've seen these, seen the problem these textual wild beasts have caused before. Michaels, Walter Ben Michaels, is nothing if not dogged in his distrust of midrashic antinomianism. And like an American Sancho Panza, he makes a habit of charging at chimeras. This is the price of being an aesthetic, an aesthetic colon dash, quote, show me I'm from Missouri, close quote, dash, nativist, period, close quotes. Well, that's Charles. Now this sounds like critique, among other things, but do not be misled. This is puppeteering at the highest level of comic reduction and performance. Pound could cite the Adams family, yeah, my small joke, when getting his Americanism on in the cantos. Bernstein cannot do the pound shtick because the world's changed. And Walter Ben Michaels is what's become of the American aesthetic now as an enforcement mechanism in the dark shade of American prejudice. There is trivial difference that has little use except as an example of how the Americans' leaders do not even try to see the real, of which they are a symptom. The puppeteering is art alongside the blind, that noisy, blind but noisy real. For Stevens, the poet's pitch plants his imagination and the reader where the real held the ground. So then there can be new knowledge of, of reality. Poets sell their goods in unusual ways, and no matter how elegant or high they sound, their line is a spiel or patter. The critic knows the differences matter and how to buy and resell some judged right or better. 
The critic knows the differences matter and how to buy, I'm sorry, the critic's job of work, forgive me, I skipped the line. The critic's job of work is to buy and resell as saying which promotion is the name and work of graceful poesis pointing to itself. Quote again, the poetics of disfluency and disability is the horizon for a clerical poetics of de-arrangement, end quote. This sentence opens a movement that sounds the poet's imagination as a field of interest turned away from conversation, here called, quote, narratives of social cultural identities or disabilities, end quote, toward the responsibility of poetry and poetics, new poems, new readers, or finds a horizon that creates a field on which the, quote, in italics, the otherwise intelligible, end quote, as it calls its task and creations emerge and stand out as different from the unreliable junk bonds of normal conversation. Within the horizon, slanted or bent in a certain way, the otherwise intelligible is averse to conversation, to the community of forced converts turned together. And what does conversation demand now? The mellowing of the bent, tamed into pity full objectification, <coughs> ending work, process, emergence, and grace. Can a critic make a mistake? If so, it would take the form of misreading, of miscognition, mais connaissance. It would mean not seeing the poet naming the emerging alternative to the real, bound as it is to the real. The poet keeping open the field to where the alternative emerges, now seeing the poet at work. The critic's job of work, and I'm bor borrowing from R.P. Blackmer, the, the critic's job of work cannot take the form of a mistake. Criticism is a function, found, active, distributed irregularly across the spectrum of obligation where the real and its alternatives converge and avert. If the critic is, is a quality, an emanation of poiesis, then Augustine and Stephen's idiom obliges that the critic's will serve grace or accept its guidance. To assert will against the grace is an old story that in this case betrays poiesis, guilty betrayal. How is this sinful? Because it rushes to join the conversation, to convert, to become one of the voluntary converso from desire or conviction rather than coercion. In The Rape of Lucrece, to pivot, in The Rape of Lucrece, Shakespeare makes evil, consensus, and limited sight, indeed confidence, the nature of sin. Quote, they think not but that every eye can see the same disgrace which they themselves behold, and therefore would they still in darkness be to have their unseen sin remain untold. So it does not matter which conversation the ersatz critic joins or adds to, the sin lies in thinking that all eyes see only the same disgrace they see, and which one way or the other motivates their will to move along a well-versed path. Safe within the conversation, they trust their common sin will remain unseen. Consensus, not only to consent, and there is the act of will, but to feel at home in agreement, to remain in accord, the sensuality of concession, to remain in accord, to join a harmony, not to hear the bend in their own pitch that holds them close, or to want to feel the new, feel the new pitch, the new slant when it comes. Indeed, it might then feel like robbery, taking away home and accord. Shakespeare's Lucrece is again useful. O oh, comfort killing night, image of hell, dim register and notary of shame, vast sin concealing chaos. The sinful see only the same as they believe all others see. What they produce together is the vast sin concealing chaos, which to most still is home and still is invisible to more. All of this together is the image of hell. It is the dark counterpart to poetic work obligate to the real. Poems speak evidence that poiesis stands against all this, seeing the inevitable apocalypse and continuing in Orphean confidence. Here's not an Italian, but an American poem by the Jamaican-American poet Claude McKay, 1921, first appearing in the political magazine, The Liberator. This is McKay. Although she feeds me of bitterness and sinks into my throat her tiger's tooth, stealing my breath of life, I will confess I love this cultured hell that tests my youth. 
Her vigor flows like tides into my blood, giving me strength erect against her hate. Her bigness sweeps my being like a flood. Yet as a rebel fronts a king in state, I stand within her walls with not a shred of terror, malice, not a word of jeer. Darkly I gaze into the days ahead and see her might and granite wonders there beneath the touch of time's unerring hand like priceless treasures sinking in the hand. This is a Shakespearean sonnet entitled America, written to America, which the poem calls this cultured hell. A poem that strengthens the poet to survive in its very bitterness. But the poet stands against it as always and without fear or malice, no false critic here, but with prophetic certainty resulting from that obligate existence, knows it will sink in the sand. But tellingly without regret, for it offers no more than wonders that are best this simulacra of priceless treasures. Whatever America is, it is not a field open to the appearance and survival of priceless treasures. What comes, even if without sneer, that is, seeing it whole and calling it by its right name, what comes is the truth that was ever there is still. And in work like this, it gives itself yet another name. So, thank you. Yes, yes. Then we'll wrap it up at the end. <clears throat> Good evening. Thank you, Luigi. Um, I'd like to take up the opportunity of having assembled here the particular mix of poets and literary theorists to return to the 1957 essay by Theodore Adorno entitled On Lyric Poetry and Society in order to see if we might together make something still more interesting from it. Now, though Adorno does in fact quote two specific lyric poems for a somewhat close analysis, Eduard Mörike's Auf eine Wanderung, On a Walking Tour, and one of the songs from Stefan Georgas, Seventh Ring, he has far more to say about the aesthetic form of the lyric. Now, what's of particular interest to him in the form of lyric poetry is that he takes it to be, and this in good Hegelian fashion, he takes it to be the historical expression of the individual. Of course, it goes without saying that the individual itself is a thoroughly historical product, and we might even hazard that the ontogeny of the individual, so to speak, and even each and every individual, indeed the form of the individual, recapitulates the phylogeny of individualism having come into being. And yet, we should also acknowledge that the project of individualism, according to what Schopenhauer and then Nietzsche called the principle of individuation, remains an incomplete achievement or perhaps an unfinished ongoing disaster, depending on your individual points of view. We'll set aside for some future academic conference the question of the success or failure of the form of the individual. And we'll turn instead to Adorno's more particular concern with the meaning of how the form of the individual comes to specific historical expression in the aesthetic form of lyric poetry. Adorno acknowledges at the very start of his essay the peculiar difficulty of even approaching lyric poetry given that lyric poetry is, quote, the most delicate, the most fragile thing that exists, unquote, and that any attempt to analyze it, let alone to speak on its behalf, might succeed at best only in affixing a label of one sort or another to it, but can, could in no way penetrate or inhabit it. This very difficulty, or indeed prohibition, nonetheless offers an initial indication of how lyric poetry came to exist precisely in opposition to what Adorno calls the bustle and commotion of the modern world. The examination of lyric poetry threatens to turn it into its opposite, insofar as it came to be as a, quote, sphere of expression whose very essence lies in either not acknowledging the power of socialization or overcoming it through the pathos of detachment." Unquote. Baudelaire is then named as a premier example of the lyric poet, and, and one wants, following this, 
to envision the relation of society to the individual as akin to the operation of a stranglehold around the throat of the individual, and that the peculiar voice of the lyric poet is not so much an expression by the individual, and it is rather the sound of the grip on the individual. What we hear in the lyric poem is the increase in the vice of the social. What then might we say about the vaunted autonomy of the individual, an autonomy that we believe comes to some of its fullest expression in the lyric poem? I'd like to suggest a roundabout path toward an understanding of autonomy, rather than weigh the possibility or measure the degree of the autonomy of the individual, I instead propose that we find our way toward it by measuring the extent of the autonomy of the social, of just that which stands opposed to the individual. I believe that at the point of the individual, at the place of individual experience, we regularly feel the totality of the social, even when, or perhaps especially when, the social totality appears to us disjointed, uncoordinated, fragmented, and confused. It's a mistake, I believe, to imagine that the whole of the social appears to us holistically. The totality of the social whole, if it even exists at all, remains opaque to us. And it is by dint of the opacity of the social totality that we arrive at the opacity of the lyric poem. The task then, in trying to discern what takes place in the particular poem, in a particular poem, is to quote, discover how the entirety of a society, conceived as an internally contradictory unity, is manifested in the work of art, in what way the work of art remains subject to society, and in what way it transcends it." Unquote. This quest is central to Adorno's overall aesthetic theorizing, the attempt to understand the relations between those artifacts which are, so to speak, merely mechanical repetitions of a society, and those things, those works of art, which, also by mimetically reproducing the social totality, somehow thereby transcend it. Those artworks do not begin as autonomous, but rather achieve their autonomy in just the way that the social totality achieves its autonomy from the people who compose it. Modernism in this light is defined for Adorno in part as the making which no longer expects its products to be comprehensive or expects that its objects might best reproduce a whole which no longer congeals as such. It's easy enough to find in Adorno seemingly straightforward characterizations of the role of art in society. For example, when he writes, quote, the greatness of works of art, however, consists solely in the fact that they give voice to what ideology hides, unquote. This sounds like a rather conventional, even traditional formulation to the effect that art unveils some hidden truth. But this understanding is incomplete, for it fails to include Adorno's insistence on the complexity and contradiction within ideology. For him, ideology is not simply false consciousness and untruth, even if sometimes it seems only to amount to that, but rather the concept of ideology is also, quote, intended to unmask spirit that is specifically false and at the same time to grasp it in its necessity, unquote, or to put necessity differently to capture the truth of ideology. A short digression here in the midst of election ballot counting to illustrate this complex character of ideology by means of this current political situ sorry, situation in the U.S., what has properly been labeled as white grievance and the MAGA, the Make America Great Again phenomenon that is meant to ameliorate it, are not simply delusions or misdirected nostalgia, but rather contain within their ideology the truth, however unclear, that the social whole 
is more opaque than ever. And the increasing frustration with that opacity is what fuels the reemergence of white supremacy. What would give legitimacy to these regressive tendencies is to acknowledge their necessity without recognizing the moment of untruth in their ideology. It helps here perhaps to recall Marx's suggestion that religion, though it falsely projects an idealized human life, is thereby one of the most thorough and truthful critiques of the ongoing inadequacy of the status quo to be properly human. Returning then to lyric poetry with this understanding of ideology, and especially with the distinction between what we might call better and worse directed critique, we note that Adorno indeed describes lyric poetry as a protest, one that is directed, quote, against a social situation that every individual experiences as hostile, alien, cold, oppressive, and that in its protest, the poem expresses the dream of a world in which things would be different, unquote. We might well ask, what makes the dream and the projection of the lyric poem more privileged than any other dream, fantasy, or projection? Two answers present themselves to Adorno's essay. One has to do with suffering, the other with language. In regard to suffering, it's helpful to remind ourselves of just how central suffering figures in Adorno's aesthetic theory. For him, suffering is the only candidate worthy of expression in works of art, by works of art. And here we need not imagine that it is the suffering of others, of victims, that is the substance of art, but rather it is the suffering not only of all the past pain of human beings, but so too the suffering at the heart of human existence in an inhumane world. Suffering is what is expressed by every genuine work of art and thereby an attempt to reconcile and do justice to it. Recalling the earlier distinction between artifacts that mimetically repeat the actuality of the world and those that succeed in transcending it, we might imagine suffering as the experience that art expresses in its attempt to transcend it. This, by the way, is a good spot to appreciate Adorno's criticism of all so-called light entertainment, which proceeds not so much just by making light of things as rather by an ideological commitment to the forgetting of suffering. This is the injustice of kitsch and all the products of what Adorno and Horkheimer labeled the culture industry. It's an injustice toward the dead and the history of human suffering. There is no proper justice for suffering, and especially not for unnecessary suffering. The work of art for Adorno in expressing suffering thereby attempts to transcend it. Marx's comment comes to mind here when he suggests that a truly humane future would be one in which all the unanswered hopes of previous human beings would be fulfilled. And we could imagine that as indeed a fitting justice to past human suffering. The natural condition of suffering is that it expresses itself. Adorno describes this as the cry of pain common to most animals. Human society, however, has somehow developed itself such that human suffering is no longer automatically accompanied by the expression which is its natural complement. This denial of suffering, that we have been developed to suffer our suffering, that we are alienated not only from ourselves, but so too from our suffering, is the condition that gives rise to the necessity of the work of art as the displaced locale where suffering comes to expression. This is what for Adorno accounts for the thorough falseness of the artwork. The semblance character of all art arises not from its being an imitation, but rather from its expression of suffering not being its own. Its semblance character is meant to announce this, and further, it accounts for why the expression of the work of art, especially that of the lyric poem, is opaque. It expresses the suffering of something other than itself. 
One of the most perplexing features of suffering has to do with our ambivalence toward it. We are often inclined to too readily rationalize it, to accord it a place in a well-ordered world in which nearly all suffering potentially comes to be meaningful or redemptive. Some even embrace it as salutary. I'm reminded of the resistance to the use of anesthesia by many surgeons in the 19th century as they had convinced themselves that the pain of surgery was a necessary component of the recovery from surgery. That is a very peculiar homeopathy. Nietzsche, of course, saw Christianity as precisely an abomination in its worshiping of the figure of sacrifice unto death. In this light, we might consider the work of art's relation to suffering as an attempt to derationalize it, to return it to its irrational meaninglessness, and in that way return it to its natural condition as the complement to its expression. And just here we can appreciate Adorno's debt to Walter Benjamin's characterization of mimesis as a wholly automatic unfolding of the continuities inherent to nature. Expression, we might say, is the mimetic completion of suffering. And that completion, one hopes, somehow brings a closure to the suffering. This helps explain why Adorno thought that all didactic art was destined to failure. It was not the failure of its message, regardless how true or helpful, but rather that its having a message interfered with the artwork's more genuine mission to give expression to suffering. Adorno's critique of didactic art provides a bridge from one answer to the next as to the question of what makes the dream world of lyric poetry more poignant than other forms of expression. That is, from the first key element of lyric poetry, suffering, to the second, language. In order best to approach the shape and role of language in lyric poetry, it helps first to return briefly to the earlier characterization of the rela relation between the subjective fabrication of lyric poetry and the objective character of society. It seemed earlier as if Adorno had suggested that the lyric poem is a kind of reverse image of society, or a kind of seismograph that writ small the upheavals and vacillations within the social. But this image of the relation between subject and object would restrict the lyric poem to being but the trace or the echo of the social. Adorno introduces a further complication into this schema, indeed what we might call its most robust dialectical moment. He writes, quote, I'm not trying to deduce lyric poetry from society. Its social substance is precisely what is spontaneous in it, what does not simply follow from the existing conditions at the time, unquote. What strikes me as especially dialectical here is the reversal of the place where and the be means by which spontaneity occurs. Spontaneity is not so much a feature of the individual, of the subject breaking with any and all determinations, as it is rather, curiously, an objective thing and indeed a central plank in the foundation as well as in the ongoing existence of society. It's a funny thought, right, that society is spontaneous at, at times, but for Adorno that is the source of the spontaneity of the individual as well. Spontaneity belongs exclusively neither to the social nor to the individual. Adorno has it as the product of the manner in which the individual and the social both determine as well as liberate themselves from one another. So society spontaneously, spontaneously becomes something other than the sum of individuals, and likewise the individual achieves spontaneity only through its interchange with the social. Language, in the case of lyric poetry, is taken up as the means by which the individual encounters and engages with what is objective, with what is other than it and which exceeds it. Or perhaps we might instead say, the individual engages with what eludes it. And with the thought of what is objective and what eludes the subject, we are not so very far from Wallace Stevens' line that poetry is a pheasant disappearing in the brush. The lyric poem aligns the objectivity of language with the subjectivity of the individual. 
as both somehow momentarily overcome their mutual opacity. For me, here comes to mind the opening stanza of Stevens' The Idea of Order at Key West. She sang beyond the genius of the sea, the water never formed to mind or voice, like a body, holy body, fluttering its empty sleeves, and yet its mimic motion made constant cry, caused constantly a cry that was not ours, although we understood, inhuman of the veritable ocean. The lyric is the modern medium in which the subject becomes more than subject. Or in the words of Adorno's explicit formulation of this dynamic, quote, my thesis is that the lyric work is always the subjective expression of a social antagonism. But since the objective world that produces the lyric is an inherently antagonistic world, the concept of the lyric is not simply that of the expression of a subjectivity to which language grants objectivity, unquote. The thing that can't be eluded here is not the antagonism of the social, but the character of the inherency of the antagonism. That inherency of social antagonism is for Adorno the correlate within the lyric of its subjective universality, or we might say of its truth. However, as Adorno noted at the beginning of his essay, we cannot really approach that truth, let alone speak it. What we might instead approach, especially in the case of the lyric, is the nature of the opacity that it both confronts and makes. Well, even if not explicit, at least more prominent, in this light, or perhaps here it's better to say in this twilight, we can find no better resource than Nietzsche's provocative celebration of the darkness reflected by the most probing works of art. In his justly renowned The Birth of Tragedy, Out of the Spirit of Music, he reminds us of the pointedly non-illuminating character of art. Nietzsche tells us that, quote, the eye of the lyric poet sounds out from the deepest abyss of being. His subjectivity, as this concept is used by modern aestheticians, is imaginary, unquote. Note that it is sound rather than image that arises from the innermost recesses of the lyric poet. Recall Nietzsche's schema in which tragedy comes into its historical being precisely as the imagistic relief from the too penetrating force of music. Images hover at a safe distance. Music instead threatened to undo us. Tragedy is birthed in order to place a mediating presence between the suffering of the world and how it resonates in us. We are granted the whole realm of aesthetic images as protection from experiences of music, or you could say of suffering, that would otherwise melt and disassemble us. But here we ought not too readily put Nietzsche on the side of enlightenment and thereby imagine that for him, aesthetic images illuminate something or other about the world or ourselves. He instead offers a rather homeopathic figuration of the healing work of art. He explains that just as our eyes, after looking too directly at the light of the sun, produce dark spots, images he calls them, in order to heal themselves, so too then uh, does opacity, the dark imagery of the aesthetic, arise homeopathically in response to our having looked too directly into the suffering and darkness of existence. In both cases, the dark spots in our vision are not the illumination or revelation of anything in the world, but rather only illusion in service of restoring our health. And it is as illusion, illusion, Nietzsche calls it semblance, shine in German, that it also shows itself to be merely illusion. In conclusion, I want to try to knit together, however briefly, this Nietzschean insight regarding the necessity, though not truth, of illusion with Adorno's specification of the necessary objectivity of the form of lyric poetry. And with that, to surmise how in lyric poetry we might come to see, but not hear, 
the limits of language. In other words, and returning to Stevens, by means of poetry, we might well be able to see the disappearance of the pheasant in the brush, but we cannot hear what disappears. Poetry, then, is the visualization of what we cannot hear. Thank you. It's my turn now, right? Your turn. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Buonasera a tutti. Um, um, again, thank you, Luigi, for the opportunity. And I'm sorry Franca D'Agostini isn't here tonight because uh, my approach to the topic is in many ways um, similar to hers. I, I find the official title of the session, The Logic of Poetry, to be as fascinating as, as challenging. And um, I'm going to say right away that I find it very difficult to offer a contribution that is just more than a few thoughts. Uh, uh, but then again, I think that that's the spirit of um, a round table, even a table-less round table, uh, such as this one. Um, and I think I'm going to confine myself to just four uh, very simple thoughts. Uh, the first three <coughs> concern not so much the logic of poetry, which is the official title uh, of the uh, round table, but more generally the relationship between logic and poetry. <clears throat> and that's one important sense in which I'm very sorry Franca D'Agostini isn't here because, of course, she also spoke about that part of the story. So first of all, um, I want to say that in my opinion, logic and poetry have, in fact, a lot in common, much more than one might initially think. Second, and more specifically, I want to say that a certain rather popular way of distinguishing the domains and goals of um, logic from those of poetry is, in my opinion, on the wrong track. It's ill-advised and misleading, if not downright uh, mistaken. And third, I'd like to point out that there is, of course, however, a, a, not, a very important difference between the two, between logic and poetry. There are plenty of differences, of course, but there is one in particular that I want to focus on. And then, that being said, I will try to conclude very briefly with a uh, suggestion that deals precisely with the official title, uh, The Logic of uh, Poetry. Um, by which, by the way, let me anticipate, I don't mean some putative set of formal laws um, or principles that govern uh, poetry in general. Uh, Franca spoke of universal rules um, and has a very powerful suggestion in that respect. Um, that's really not um, the sense in which I will uh, attach a meaning to the phrase logic of poetry. Um, I'm rather interested in the criteria that seem to lie behind uh, the reasons that guide us in writing individual poems, the reasons that we can offer to explain why a particular poem ends up being the poem it is and not something else. <clears throat> All right, so four thoughts. Thought number one, um, I said logic and poetry have much more in common than one might initially think. This is, of course, a very personal opinion and it reflects my personal way of thinking about these two domains. And let me add immediately that <coughs> they do not occupy the same position uh, in my life. You know, I'm a logician, that's what I do. I write about logic and I teach logic. I've been teaching logic for my entire academic career. Whereas poetry is only a passion, let me put it that way, a passion I have, almost a secret passion about which I don't like to theorize, let alone dare theorize. Um, still, <laughs> I have been uh, doing poetry and I've been very interested in uh, that world. And um, in both cases, I, so logic and poetry, I find myself driven by the same thought. 
which is perhaps best summarized in the title of an early chapter, I think chapter number four, in Robert Musil's uh, The Man Without Qualities, which you all know. If there is a sense of reality, there is also a sense, so there must also be a sense of possibility. You may be surprised, but that's preci it's precisely this passage uh, by Musil that brought me to the study of logic when I was a teenager. For what science do we have, I thought, if not logic, that cares about all possibilities? You know, history, sociology. I was actually uh, initially trying to major in sociology. <clears throat> history, sociology, physics, biology, what have you, they all focus on this world of ours as it happens to be. Logic is different. Logic is concerned not only with how things are, but also with the many ways in which it is conceivable that they could be. After all, you know, to say that A logically implies B, which is the fundamental notion in any logical theory, to say that A logically implies B is to say that it is not possible for B to be false when A is true. That in every possible circumstance, in every possible, in every conceivable situation, <clears throat> when A is true, B must also be true. And so to assess the notion of logical implication, the fundamental notion of any logical theory, you have to survey the space of all possibilities. And as such, logic becomes, at bottom, a science of possibilities. It isn't just a tool for rational argumentation, an organon, as Aristotle uh, put it. Of course it is a tool. But the point is that at bottom, in order for that tool to actually make some sense, you really have to develop um, what I call a science of the possible. And in a way, I think poetry is also uh, about, the, about possibility. Perhaps, I, you know, I shouldn't say that poetry is a science of possibility, but it deals with possibilities. It, it deals with possibilities even if, uh, of course, um, uh, it cares a lot about the real, <laughs> sorry, about the real, even if it is bound uh, by, by the real, as um, it was put uh, earlier. Um, it deals with possibilities. It triggers possibilities. It takes us beyond the narrow horizons of the world as uh, it is and as we are otherwise inclined to see it. It takes us beyond a certain narrow way of perhaps describing uh, the way things are and uh, how we feel about uh, those things. Both logic and poetry have, I'd like to say, a unique potential to display horizons that have never been uh, dreamt of, horizons um, that uh, indicate uh, spaces that we haven't yet visited. Both logic and poetry have the power to direct our thoughts along directions that we might otherwise ignore, um, directions that we never considered before, directions we never thought existed. Poetry doesn't censor any perspective, it is often said, well, ditto for logic. Logic doesn't censor any possibility, no matter how far-fetched and unlikely certain scenarios may seem to us. Everything is possible, short of contradictions, and even contradictions uh, are negotiable. I mean, after all, I'm speaking of logic not as a theory, a particular theory, but as what logicians do, just like poetry isn't a theory, it's what poets uh, do. So, as such, as what logicians do, logic has been entertaining every uh, sort of different perspective, including perspectives according to which the space of possibilities includes contradictory situations. Uh, Franco D'Agostini mentioned something called paraconsistent logics. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that thing. Paraconsistent logics are logics which, unlike 
classical logic tolerate contradictions. And I remember when Graham Priest, who teaches at the Gret Center here in New York City, uh, um, CUNY, when he came for the first time uh, to New York, I think, 2002, uh, to give a lecture, it might have been his job talk, I don't know, eventually he joined the department, but at that time he was in Australia. To give a lecture, it was precisely a lecture on paraconsistent logic, a grand priest is in fact one of the main figures in that field, and the title of the lecture was <clears throat> To Be and Not To Be, that's the answer. And uh, that's precisely the sense in which uh, logicians entertain a broad sense of possibility. So that's the first point. Logic and philosophy uh, and poetry, I think, are um, deeply invested, both of them, in the exploration of the land of possibilities, in triggering our sense of possibility. And that is why I think both are important, because, of course, everything, absolutely everything, I think, depends on the range of possibilities that we're able to discern, beginning with our hopes and our projects. Now, that doesn't mean, however, obviously, that there are no differences between logic and poetry. I think it would be absurd to say so. So that takes me to the second point that I want to make. And the next point is that there are differences, but a certain popular way of characterizing the, uh, the difference is, as I said, on the wrong track, uh, ill-advised, uh, misleading, if not downright mistaken. Um, to illustrate this, uh, in order not to make a story too long, um, I want to quote a famous line from um, the Marquis uh, de Sade in uh, Histoire de Juliette, where he says, it is only in that instant when the laws are silent that great actions erupt. Now, Desade was, Desade, um, uh, was uh, talking about anarchy here in the political sense of the term, uh, contrasting it to all forms of government that rely on the enforcement of various kinds of laws. But the point is that the passage, the line that I've just read, it's only in, the, in that instant when the laws are silent that great actions erupt. Well, that passage is often been, and it surely can be read, uh, metaphorically um, in some broad sense. Creativity, and poetic creativity above all, manifests its best in the absence of restricting laws, uh, when the laws are silent. Since logic is by definition about laws, laws of rational inference, well, then logic would be exactly the opposite. So that's the obvious difference between the two, often put in terms of rational versus irrational, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, well, I think this is deeply uh, wrong for more than one reason. Uh, for one thing, <coughs> poetry, as far as I can tell, doesn't only shine in the absence of laws. Sometimes it shines precisely because uh, it obeys a number of very strict, perhaps very inventive, very imaginative, uh, but nonetheless strict laws. Uh, what Franca D'Agostini herself mentioned, the laws of language to begin with, and um, Tom ended the pres presentation um, with this point about the limits of language. So those are very strict uh, constraints. But never mind, there are, of course, lots and lots of other uh, laws that... Uh, Good poetry may want to obey and nonetheless shine. No, laws of meter, laws of rhyme, structural laws, as in a sonnet versus a limerick versus, I don't know, a poem in, in, the, in the syllabic uh, terza rima, and, and so on and so forth. Think of lipograms. Think of um, uh, Willy Po style poetry, where you know they invent artificial uh, laws almost. Uh, uh, laws of the game and uh, work under such constraints. Univocalic poems, for example. Uh, Giuseppe Varaldo even wrote univocalic sonnets. Think of the amount of constraints that you have there. And you know, uh, even 
the most radical forms of experimental poetry may involve uh, very strict laws uh, in the text itself, in the display, in the performance, in the pitch, you know, uh, you name it. So that's one sense in which I think this opposition between laws versus freedom from the laws is just not the right way to think about it. That being said, of course, it's true that poetry often shines uh, precisely when it disobeys the laws, uh, perhaps even more so. Uh, um, what Whitman, uh, in the uh, 1855 preface to Leaves of Grass, a uh, very uh, important uh, text, famously wrote, and I'm going to quote, the poetic quality is not marshaled in rhyme or uniformity. The profit of rhyme is that it drops seeds of a sweeter a more luxuriant rhyme, and of uniformity that it conveys itself into its own roots in the ground out of sight. The rhyme and uniformity of perfect poems show the free growth of metrical laws and bud from them as unerringly and as loosely as lilacs or roses on a bush. Yes, often, end of quote, um, often poetry shines when it takes us beyond the constraints of rhyme or uniformity, be beyond the routinized, the reassuring, the predictable. But so does logic then, if that's what uh, you worry about. So does logic. Logic doesn't shine in a basic syllogistic inference. Textbook example, um, all humans are animal, all animals are moral, therefore all humans are moral. Logic doesn't shine in an inference of this sort any more than poetry shines in a cheap and cheesy verse. Logic shines at the limits of thought. It shines where it takes us beyond common sense, where the laws of common sense are silent. The paradoxes. That's where you have fun. Gödel's theorem. That's why you're surprised. Think of the beauty of a proof whose conclusion is the exact opposite of what you expected. That's where logic shines, at the limits of thought, in the absence, if you like, of the laws of common sense, not in the absence of its own laws. In fact, this is just another way of saying that both poetry and logic deal with our sense of possibility, pushing it to the limits. And both shine the most when they make us see possibilities that were not previously entertained. <coughs> that one is strictly governed by rules of inference while the other isn't, well, that's not where they differ. So what is the difference? That's my third point, and I'm going to be quicker now. Well, of course, there are plenty of differences. Um, but here I just want to put my finger on a simple but I think very important difference between uh, logic and poetry. And this also connects to what uh, Franco D'Agostini uh, said earlier. Let me put it this way. Logic is all about propositions. Poetry, by contrast, cares about sentences. Now, I'm putting it in terms of sentences and more generally of words, as you will see in a minute. Um, because I'm going to focus for the purpose of making the point on, let's say, written poetry of a familiar sort. But um, the point I'm about to make can easily be generalized to a notion of sentence that's not strictly linguistic. Okay, um, what do I mean by a sentence? I, I just mean uh, a sequence of symbols, a sequence perhaps of images. Uh, in the strict linguistic sense, a sequence of words. Every sentence expresses a proposition. That's why sentences are produced, to express something, to convey an idea, to express a proposition. But the relationship between sentences and propositions is not one-to-one. -one. Different sentences in the same language may express one and the same proposition. For example, the show begins at 5.30 and the show starts at 5.30, are two different sentences, but because they involve, the only difference lies in two words which are synonymous, 
begins and starts, uh, they end up expressing the same proposition. One is true if and only if the other is true. Similarly, just, I'm sorry for this sort of almost um, logic 101 uh, uh, qualification, but um, take, for instance, Dante loves Beatrice versus Beatrice is loved by Dante. Clearly, those are two different sentences. One is in the active voice and the other is in the passive voice, but they clearly express the same proposition. We may also express that very same proposition in different languages, of course. I could say Dante ama Beatrice, and I used an Italian sentence, different from the previous two English sentences, but I'm expressing the same proposition. In each of these cases, we have sentences that express the same proposition insofar as they stand or fall together. The range of possibilities that make one true, one sentence true, is exactly the same as the range of possibilities that makes the other sentences true. Dante loves Beatrice, Beatrice is loved by Dante, Dante ama Beatrice, they are made true in exactly the same possible situations. Since um, logic is about, as I said earlier, about you know, the logical relation of logical implication, it's about the conditions under which a certain truth implies another, all such grammatical differences at the level of the sentence are completely irrelevant from a logical perspective. In logic, you only care about the proposition that's being expressed. That's what I mean when I say that logic is about propositions. Poetry, of course, is different, completely different in this regard. This is true about most literature, but I think of poetry in particular. Precisely because it's not about what follows from what, the fact that two sentences express the same proposition doesn't mean that they are equally good. On the contrary, most of the work is precise about choosing the right sentence to express a given proposition, which is to say that, you know, this sounds trivial. Poetry is not just about content, it's also about form. Because I cannot find non-trivial ways of putting it, let me quote a beautiful passage from uh, Coleridge, um, uh, from, from the uh, literary biography of um, Coleridge, Biographia Literaria, <coughs> quote, at school, and this was uh, Christ Hospital College, at school, Coleridge says, I enjoyed the inestimable, inestimable advantage of a very sensible, though at the same time, a very severe master. And that would have been the Reverend James Boyer, who uh, some of you may know was in fact a, tyr a tyrannic headmaster, a really nasty person, but at the same time very, very um, smart. Colliery says, I learned from him that poetry, even that of the loftiest and seemingly that of the wildest odes, poetry had a logic of its own, as severe as that of science, and more difficult, because more subtle, more complex, and dependent on more and more fugitive causes. In the truly great poets, this is still part of the quotation, he, the master, would say that there's a reason, there's a reason assignable, not only for every word, but for the position of every word. And I well remember that availing himself on the synonyms to the Homer of um, Didymus, he made us attempt to show, with regard to each, why it would not have answered the same purpose, and wherein consisted the peculiar fitness of the word in the original text. It's just right, isn't it? That's exactly the kind of logic that we um, may uncover in the work of at least most uh, people who do poetry. This is why translating poetry is so difficult, so hard. It's not enough to translate every original sentence by means of a sentence that has the same meaning, i.e. that expresses the same proposition. A sentence that's true in exactly the same situation, that's not a good way of translating poetry. It may be a good way to translate, I don't know, a philosophy paper or a history book, 
not poetry. The translation of a poem must do, ju just, must do justice to the fact that the poet used those sentences rather than others, those words in that order rather than sentences with the same meaning, expressing the same proposition, but different. That's the challenge, to do justice to that. Those who translated Dante into English, or those who are familiar with the many translation of Dante into English, know exactly the kind of disappointment that the reader may have in occasionally seeing that um, Dante's choices of this sort have not been properly, perhaps, um, captured. Anyway, so logic doesn't care about such distinctions. Logic, uh, poetry is all about such distinctions. Logic is all about content. Poetry is about content and form. That's the bottom line. So finally, to come to my last point and the title of this roundtable, what is the logic of poetry? Well, I'm, sure, I'm not sure I can hope to answer the question. I'm not even sure that uh, it is possible to answer it or that it makes sense to speak of the logic of poetry in the singular, but surely, to the extent that we can speak of a logic of poetry, it's not logic in the standard sense. Even if standard logic and poetry have a lot in common, they don't quite interact. The logic of poetry isn't logic applied to poetry. It is that complex set of decisional processes that lie behind the writing of poetry. The reasons that guide us in writing individual poems, the reasons we can offer to explain why a particular poem ends up being the poem it is and not something else. And each word, each comma counts. Such processes, such criteria are highly specific insofar as they operate at the level of words and sentences, not propositions. Whether you write rule-governed poetry as in a sonnet or a poem in Tetzerim or free poetry, it doesn't matter. In both cases, in all cases, you have to decide what to say, what not to say, what to include and what to omit, but also which words to use and how to arrange those words into sentences. Lots and lots of decisions. We don't do this arbitrarily. The decisions is the result of, well, some kind of reasoning. I'm sorry, I, I, when I put it that way. And that kind of reasoning is and counts as logic. So that's the logic of poetry. It's a very special logic, the logic of content and form. It is so special and personal and so idiosyncratic that it resists, perhaps, regimentation. It resists codification. I suspect there will never be a textbook called The Logic of Poetry that tells you how to make those decisions. I hope, God forbid, there will never be such a textbook. But then at the same time, to tell you the truth, if I had the skills, I'd love, well, first of all, I'd love to read such a textbook, and I'd love to write my own version of it, if I had the skills. Maybe with Franca D'Agostini together, too bad she's not here. But anyway, very difficult, very difficult. But that's what I think the logical poetry is about. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> and I think our panelist lectures. I was wondering whether we could suggest the logic of betrayal. <laughs> that is to say, a betrayal of the premises. Since the sentence seems to be the uh, focal point and the order of words, and uh, sometimes you start out with a sentence, and by reorganizing this sequence of words, you start with a topic and you end up with another. So when I'm saying betrayal of the premises, I mean simply that no poet knows what he's going to write about, but the words that he has chosen in the beginning will determine where the poet goes, where the poem goes. And so, you know, it's not like saying that the, you don't see the forest because the trees are in the way, but quite the opposite. You see many forests because the trees are in the way. And, and that's uh, the challenge, and, and that's why I said 
betraying the premises or start, you may start thinking that you are going to write about something, but you end up writing about something else, which you yourself don't know, but the, the language which you used uh, would propose to you. As a matter of fact, Charles probably remembers, um, or Peter Kizzi remembers uh, a, po a, a set of poems uh, by an American poet whose title was, uh, This is What the Dictionary Told Me. You know, uh, With thanks to the dictionary, Louis Zukowski. Excuse me? With thanks to the dictionary, Louis Zukowski. Okay, now, do you know by any chance that there is a madman here? I think he's here someplace that has decided to turn Zukowski into Italian, and uh, and uh, I don't know, that'll be quite, some t quite a challenge. But in any case, I want to thank you because we approached this issue from many different angles, and uh, I don't know if there are questions. Otherwise, I suggest that uh, if, with your permission, we will uh, use your text, and if you don't mind, uh, if you care, um, share them, and, and perhaps when we try the proceedings, you may decide to comment on, on or not. I mean, it's up to you, okay? Thank you very much again, and we'll see you outside if it isn't raining, okay? Thank you again. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>